In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green, with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. A door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for many miles round called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes of these had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms. All were on the same floor, and indeed on the same path. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side going in, for these were the only ones to have windows, deep-set round windows looking over his garden, and meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, and the people considered them very respectable not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on a question without the bother of asking him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbor's respect, but he gained, well, you will see whether he gained anything in the The mother of our particular hobbit. What is a hobbit? I suppose hobbits need some description nowadays, since they have become rare and shy of the big people as they call us. They are a whir a little people, about half our height, and smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits have no beards. There is little or no magic about them, except the ordinary everyday sort which helps them to disappear quietly and quickly, when large stupid folk like you and me come blundering along making noise like elephants which they can hear a mile awe, they are inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colors chiefly green and yellow, wear no shoes, because their feet grow natural leathery soles and thick warm brown hair like the stuff on their heads, which is curly, have long clever brown fingers, good-natured faces, and deep fruity laughs, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can get it. Now you know enough to go on with. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, of Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the fabulous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who lived across the water, the small river that ran at the foot of the hill. It was often said in other families that long ago one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely hobbit-like about them. And once in a while members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. They discreetly disappeared, and the family hushed it up. But the fact remained that the Tooks were not as respectable as the Bagginses, though they were undoubtedly richer. It is probable that Bilbo, although he looked and behaved exactly like a second edition of his solid and comfortable father, got something a bit queer in his makeup from the Took side, something that only waited for a chance to come out. The chance never arrived, until Bilbo Baggins was grown up, being about fifty years old or so, and living in the beautiful hobbit hole built by his father, which I have just described for you, until he had in fact apparently settled down and moved away. By some curious chance one morning long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, and Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly, toes neatly brushed. Gandalf came by. Gandalf, if you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. All that the unsuspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff, 
He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which a white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean? he said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo, and a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry, we have all the day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs, and blew out a beautiful gray ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. Very pretty, said Gandalf, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I am looking for someone to share in. An adventure that I am arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so. In these parts, we are plain quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them, said our Miss Wagons, and stuck one thumb behind his braces, and blew out another even bigger smoke ring. Then he took out his morning letters, and began to read, pretending to take no more notice of the old man. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for, said Gandalf. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good till I move off? Not at all, not at all, my dear sir. Let me see, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir. Hmm. And I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins, and you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. To think that I should have lived to be good morninged by Belladonna took son, as if I was selling buttons at the door. Gandalf, Gandalf, good gracious me, not the wandering wizard that gave old took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never came undone till ordered. Not the man that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. I remember those. Old Took used to have them on Midsummer's Eve. Splendid. They used to go up like great lilies and snapdragons and laburnums of fire and hang in the twilight all evening. You will notice already that Mr. Baggins was not quite so prosy as he liked to believe. Also that he was very fond of flowers. Dear me, he went on. Not the Gandalf who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures. I mean, you used to upset things badly in these parts once upon a time. I beg your pardon, but I had no idea you were still in business. Where else should I be? said the wizard. All the same, I am pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly at any rate, and that is not without hope. Indeed, for your old grandfather took sake, and for the sake of poor Belladonna, I will give you what you asked for. I beg your pardon? I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon. I give it you. In fact, I will go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me, very good for you, and profitable too. Very likely, if you ever get over it. Sorry. I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today. Good morning. But please come to tea. Any time you like. Why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Good. With that the hobbit turned and scuttled inside his round green door, and shut it as quickly as he dared, not to seem rude. Wizards after all are wizard. What on earth did I ask him to tea for? He said to himself, as he went to the pantry. He had only just had breakfast, but he thought a cake or two and a drink of something would do him good after his fright. Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up and with the spike of his staff scratched a queer sign on the hobbit's beautiful green front door. Then he strode away, 
just about the time when Bilbo was finishing his second cake and beginning to think that he had escaped adventures very well. The next day he had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He did not remember things very well, unless he put them down on his engagement tablet like this, Gandalf T. Wednesday. Yesterday he had been too flustered to do anything of the kind. Just before tea time there came a tremendous ring on the front door bell, and then he remembered. He rushed and put on the kettle, and put out another cup and saucer, and extra cake or two, and ran to the door. I am sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say, when he saw that it was not Gandalf at all. It was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt, and very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as the door opened, he pushed inside, just as if he had been expected. He hung his hooded cloak on the nearest peg, and Dwalin at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins at yours, said the hobbit, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, I am just about to take tea. Pray come and have some with me. A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came and hung his things up in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at table long. In fact, they had hardly reached the third cake, when there came another even louder ring at the bell. Excuse me, said the hobbit, and off he went to the door. So you have got here at last was what he was going to say to Gandalf this time. But it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf on the step with a white beard and a scarlet hood, and he too hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he had been invited. I see they have begun to arrive already, he said when he caught sight of Dwalin's green hood hanging up. He hung his red one next to it, and Balin at your service, he said with his hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they had begun to arrive had flustered him badly. Come along in, and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. A little beer would suit me better if it is all the same to you. My good sir, said Balin with the white beard, but I don't mind some cake, seed cake if you have any. Lots. Bilbo found himself answering, to his own surprise, and he found himself scuttling off too, to the cellar to fill a pint beer mug, and to the pantry to fetch two beautiful round seed cakes which he had baked that afternoon for his after-supper morsel. When he got back Balin and Dwalin were talking at the table like old friends as a matter of fact, they were brothers. Bilbo plumped down the beer and the cake in front of them, when loud came a ring at the bell again and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought as he puffed along the passage. But it was not. It was two more dwarves, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade, and they hopped. As soon as the door began to open, Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. What can I do for you, my dwarves? he said. Keely at your service, said the one and Philly, added the other, and they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. At yours and your family's, replied Bilbo, remembering his manners this time. Dwalin and Balin here already? I see, said Keeley. Let us join the throng. Throng, thought Mr. Baggins. I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits, and have a drink. He had only just had a sip in the corner, while the four dwarves sat round the table and talked about mines and gold and troubles with the goblins, and the depredations of dragons, and lots of other things which he did not understand, and did not want to, for they sounded much too adventurous, when, ding, dong a ling dang, his bell rang again, as if some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle off. Someone at the door, he said, blinking. Some four, I should say by sound, said Feely. Besides, we saw them coming along behind us in the distance. The poor little hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands, and wondered what had happened, and what was going to happen, and whether they would all stay to supper. 
Then the bell rang again louder than ever, and he had to run to the door. It was not four after all. It was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside, bowing and saying at your service one after another, Dori Nori, Ori Ori Owen, and Gloin were their names. And very soon two purple hoods, a gray hood, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on the pegs, and off they marched with their broad hands stuck in their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already it had almost become a throng. Some called for ale, and some for porter, and one for coffee, and all of them for cakes. So the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. A big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth. The seed cakes were gone, and the dwarves were starting on a round of butter scones, when there came a loud knock. Not a ring, but a rat, tat on the hobbit's beautiful green door. Somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage very angry and altogether bewildered and bewildered. This was the most awkward Wednesday he ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they all fell in, one on top of the other, more dwarves, four more. And there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff and laughing. He had made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he had put there the morning before. Carefully. Carefully, he said, it is not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a pop gun. Let me introduce Bifur, Bofur, Bomber, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Bifur, Bofur, and Bomber standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods and a pale green one, and also a sky blue one with a long silver tassel. This last belonged to Thorin an enormously important dwarf, in fact no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Bifur, Bofur, and Bomber on top of him. For one thing Bomber was immensely fat and heavy. Thorin indeed was very haughty, and said nothing about service, but poor Mr. Baggins said he was sorry so many times, that at last he grunted pray don't mention it, and stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. I hope there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that, tea? No, thank you. A little red wine, I think, for me. And for me, said Thorin. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Biffer. And mince pies and cheese, said Beaufort. And pork pie and salad, said Bumber. And more cakes, and ale, and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves through the door. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him, as the hobbits stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles, Seems to know as much about the inside of my larders as I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. Confusticate and bathar these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Wallen at the door of the kitchen, and Philly and Keely behind them, and before he could say knife they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set out everything afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party with the thirteen dwarves all around, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside. Nibbling at a biscuit, his epitopite was quite taken away, and trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary, and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked, and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back, and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you will all stay to supper, he said in his politest unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin. And after, 
We shan't get through the business till late, and we must have some music first. Now to clear up. There upon the twelve dwarves, not Thorin, he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet and made piles of all things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on the top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them almost squeaking with frag. Please, be careful, and please, don't trouble, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Chip the glasses and crack the plates. Blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and tread on the fat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat. Splash the wine on every door. Dump the crocks in a boiling bowl. Pound them up with a thumping pole. And when you've finished, if any are whole, send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. So, carefully, carefully with the plates. And of course they did none of these dreadful things, and everything was cleaned and put away safe as quick as lightning, while the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing. Then they went back and found Thorin with his feet on the fender smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and wherever he told one to go, it went up the chimney, or behind the clock on the mantelpiece, or under the table, or round and round the ceiling. But wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of Thorin's, then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had quite a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light it made him look strange and sorceress. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings, and then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent up the wind over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorin, bring out the instruments. Keely and Feely rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Beefer and Bofer went out too, and came back with clarinets that they had left among walking sticks. Pwallen and Balin so. Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. They came back with vials as big as themselves, and with Thorin's harp wrapped in a green cloth. It was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorin struck it the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else, and was swept away into dark lands under strange moons, far over the water and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost. And still they played on, and suddenly first one, and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes, and this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without their music, far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away or break of day, to seek the pale enchanted gold. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him, a fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something Tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains and hear the pine trees and waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He shuddered. And very quickly he was plain Mr. Baggins of Bag End, under Hill again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to and go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly he found that the music and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him with eyes shining in the dark. What about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said the dwarves. Dark for dark business. 
there are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shovel with a crush. Hush, said Gandalf, let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf, dwarves and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. He paused for breath and for a polite remark from the hobbit, but the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious and worst of all fellow conspirator. Though no noise came out, he was so flummoxed, so Thorin went on. We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon before the break of day start on our long journey, a journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us except our friend and counselor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Object is, I take it, well known to us all, to the estimable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves the... I think I should be right in naming Keeley and Feely. For instance, the exact situation at the moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thorin's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath, without telling anyone there anything that was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At May never return he began to feel a shriek coming up inside, and very soon it burst out like the whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic stuff, and in its firework glare the poor little hobbit could be seen kneeling on the hearth rue, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept on calling out struck by lightning, struck by lightning over and over again, and that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on the drawing-room sofa with a drink at his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf, as they sat down again. Gets funny, queer fits, but he is one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you have ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit, even to old Took's great-granduncle Bullroarer, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Green Fields, and knocked their king, Golfimble's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way, the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment. In the meantime, however, Bullroar Rear's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing-room. After a while and a drink he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard, glowing, speaking. Hum, for some snored more or less like that. Will he do, do you think? It is all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives, and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I should have been sure we had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped eyes on the little fellow bobbing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The took side had won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards, the Baggins part regretted what he did now, and he said to himself, Bilbo, you were a fool. You walked right in and put your foot in it. Pardon me, he said, if I have overheard words that you were saying. I don't pretend to understand what you are talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called being on his dignity, that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts. 
but treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert, I had a great-great-great-granduncle once, Bull Roarer took. Yes, yes, but that was long ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you, and I assure you there is a mark on this door, the usual one in the trade, or used to be. Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement and reasonable reward. That's how it is usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday tea time. Of course there is a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself, for very good reasons. You asked me to find the fourteenth man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at thirteen and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily at Gloin that the dwarf huddled back in his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy eyebrows, till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right, said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be when the time comes, there is a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more than he has any idea of himself. You may possibly all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a little light on this. On the table, in light of a big lamp with a red shade, he spread a piece of parchment, rather like a map. This was made by Thor, your grandfather Thorin, he said in answer to the dwarves' excited questions. It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands about it, and I know where Mirkwood is, and the withered heath where the great dragons bred. Um. There is a dragon marked red on the mountain, said Balin, but it will be easy enough to find him without that, if ever we arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. You see that run on the west side and the hand pointing to it from the other runes that marks a hidden passage to the lower halls? It may have been secret once, said Thorin, but how do we know it is secret any longer? Old Smog has lived there long enough now to find out anything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high the door and three may walk abreast, say the runes. But Smog could not creep into a hole that size. Not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me squeaked Bilbo. How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside, apart from the dragon? In lots of ways, said Gandalf. But in what way this one has been hidden we don't know without going to see. From what it says on the map I should guess, there is a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarf's method. I, I think that is right, isn't it? Re Quite right said Thorin. Also, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map went a key, a small and curious key. Here it is, he said and handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards, made of silver, keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it upon a fine chain that hung about his neck and now things begin to look more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far we have had no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the long lake. After that the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandhi. We might go from there up along the river running, went on Thorin taking no notice, and so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. 
but we none of us like the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it through the great cliff at the south of the mountain, and out of it comes the dragon, too, far too often, unless he has changed. That would be no good, said the wizard, not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, the chosen and selected burglar. So now let's get on and make some plans. Very well, then, said Thorin, supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock Politerius to Bilbo. First, I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside, but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I mean about the gold and the dragon and all that and how it got there and who it belongs to and so on and further? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago in my grandfather Thror's time our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to the mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Thrain the Old, but now they mined and they tunneled and they made huger halls and greater workshops. And in addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels, too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived to the south, and were gradually spreading up the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in those days. Kings used to send for our smiths, and reward even the least skillful most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices, and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Altogether those were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend, and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak of the most marvelous and magical toys, the like of which is not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cups, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the north. Undoubtedly that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever, unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. In they hardly know a good bit of work from a bad though they usually have a good notion of the current market value, and they can't make a thing for themselves, hot even mend a little loose scale of the armor. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction that dragons make going from bad to worse. There was a most specially greedy, strong, and wicked worm called Smog. One day he flew up into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside was one, luckily, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and it saved my life that day. Well, from a good way off we saw the dragon settle on our mountain in a spout of flip. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time all the bells were ringing in Dale and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam, and a fog fell on Dale, and in the fog the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story, it was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all the halls and lanes and tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions, and passages. After that there were no dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for him. Probably, for that is the dragon's was way, he has piled it all up in a great heap far inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Later he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat, until Dale was ruined and all the people dead or gone. What goes on there now, I don't know for certain, 
but I don't suppose anyone lives nearer to the mountain than the far edge of the long lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding and cursed smog, and there we were unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they got away, they told me to hold my tongue and said that one day in the proper time I should know. After that we went away, and we have had to earn our livings as best we could up and down the lands, often enough sinking as low as blacksmith work or even coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure. And even now, when I will allow that we have a good bit laid by and are not so badly off, here Thorin stroked the gold chain round his neck, we still mean to get it back and to bring our curses home to Smaug, if we can. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you, said the wizard slowly and grimly. Here, here, said Bilbo and accidentally said it aloud. Here what? They all said turning suddenly towards him, and he was so flustered that he answered, Hear what I have got to say. What's that? they asked. Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look around. After all, there is the side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And well, don't you know, I think we have talked long enough for one night, if you see what I mean. What about bed and an early start and all that? I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorin, aren't you the burglar? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job? Not to speak of getting inside the door, but I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham, when starting on a journey, fried not poached, and mind you, after all the others had ordered their breakfasts without so much as a please which annoyed Bilbo very much, they all got up. The hobbit had to find room for them all, and filled all his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas, before he got them all stowed and went to his own little bed, very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did make up his mind about was not to bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The tookishness was wearing off and he was not now quite so sure that he was going on any journey in the morning. Chapter 2 A short rest. It was long after the break of day when he woke up. Up jumped Bilbo, and putting on his dressing gown went into the dining room. There he saw nobody but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room, and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe the party of the night before had not been part of his bad dreams, as he had rather hoped. Indeed, he was really relieved after all to think that they had all gone without him, and without bothering to wake him up with never thank you. He thought, and yet in a way, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed. The feeling surprised him. Don't be a fool, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself, thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age. So he put on an apron, lit fires, boiled water and washed up. Then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before turning out the dining room. By that time the sun was shining, and the front door was open, letting in a warm spring breeze. Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the open window, when in walked Gandalf. My dear fellow, said he, whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? And here you are having breakfast, or whatever you call it, at half past ten. They left you the message because they could not wait. What message? said poor Mr. Baggins, all in a fluster. Great, elephants, said Gandalf. You are not at all yourself this morning. You have never dusted the mantelpiece. What's that got to do with it? I have had enough to do washing up for fourteen. If you had dusted the mantelpiece, you would have found this under the clock, said Gandalf, handing Bilbo a note written, of course, on his own notepaper. This is what he read. Thorin and company to Burglar Bilbo greeting. For your hospitality, 
our sincerest thanks and for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms, cash on delivery, up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits of EFE. All travelling expenses guaranteed in event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives, if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for. Thinking it unnecessary to disturb your esteemed repose, we have proceeded in advance to make requisite preparations and shall await your respected person at the Green Dragon Inn, Bywater, at 11 a.m. Sharp, trusting that you will be punctual. We have the honour to remain yours deeply. Thorin and company. That leaves you just ten minutes. You will have to run, said Gandalf. But, said Bilbo. No time for it, said the wizard. But, said Bilbo again. No time for that, either. Off you go. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside, without a hat, walking stick, or any money, or anything that he usually took when he went out, leaving his second breakfast unfinished and quite unwashed up, pushing the keys into Gandalf's hands, and running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill, across the water, and then on for a whole mile or more. Very puffed he was, when he got to Bywater just on the stroke of eleven, and found he had come without a pocket handkerchief. Bravo, said Balin, who was standing at the inn door, looking out for him. Just then all the others came round the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies, and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggages, packages, parcels, and paraphernalia. There was a very small pony, apparently, for Bilbo. Up you two get, and off we go, said Thorin. I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I have come without my hat, and I have left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money. I didn't get your note until after 10.45 to be precise. Don't be precise, said Dwalin, and don't worry. You will have to manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I have got a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May on laden ponies, and Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood, a little weather stained, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. What his father would have thought of him, I daren't think. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. They had not been riding very long, when up came Gandalf very splendid on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs and Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So, after that, the party went along very merrily, and they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day, except, of course, when they stopped for meals. These didn't come quite as often as Bilbo would have liked them, but still he began to feel the adventures were not so bad after all. At first they passed through Hobbitlands, a wild, respectable country inhabited by decent folk, with good roads, an inn or two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer ambling by on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely, and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before. Now they had gone on far into the lone lands, where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills, rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a nasty turn. Mostly it had been as good as may can be, even in merry tales, but now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands they had to camp when they could, but at least it had been dry. To think it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo, as he splashed along behind the others in a very muddy track. Still the dwarves juggled on, never turning round or taking any notice of the hobbit. They did not sing or tell stories that day, even though the weather improved. Nor the next day, nor the day after. They had begun to feel that danger was not far away. They camped under the stars, and their horses had more to eat than they had for there was plenty of grass, but there was not much left in their bags. 
One morning they forded a river at a wide, shallow place full of the noise of stones and foam. The far bank was steep and slippery. When they got to the top of it, leading their ponies, they saw that the great mountains had marched down very near to them. Already they seemed only a day's easy journey from the feet of the nearest. Dark and drear it looked, though there were patches of sunlight on its sides, and behind its shoulders the tips of snow peaks gleamed. Is that the mountain? asked Bilbo in a solemn voice, looking at it with round eyes. He had never seen a thing that looked so big before. Of course not, said Balin. This is only the beginning of the Misty Mountains, and we have got to get through, or over or under those somehow, before we can come into Wilderland beyond. And it is a deal of a way, even from the other side of them to the lonely mountain in the east, where Smog lies on our treasure. Oh, said Bilbo, and just at that moment he felt more tired than he ever remembered feeling before. He was thinking once again of his comfortable chair before the fire in his favourite sitting room in his hobbit hole, and of the kettle singing, not for the last time. Now Gandalf led the way. We must not miss the road, or we shall be done for. We need food for one thing, and rest in reasonable safety. Also, it is very necessary to tackle the misty mountains by the proper path, or else you will get lost in them and have to come back and start at the beginning if you ever get back at all. You were come where he was making for, and he answers. You are come to the very edge of the wild, as some of you may know. Hidden somewhere ahead of us is the fair valley of Rivendell, where Elrond lives in the last homely house. I sent a message by my friends, and we are expected. That sounded nice and comforting, but they had not got there yet and it was not so easy as it sounds to find the last homely house west of the mountains. There seemed to be no trees and no valleys and no hills to break the ground in front of them, only one vast slope going slowly up and up to meet the feet of the nearest mountain, a wide land the colour of heather and crumbling rock, with patches and slashes of grass green and moss green, where water might be. It was indeed a much wider land from the ford to the mountains than ever you would have guessed. Bilbo was astonished. The only path was marked with white stones, some of which were small, and others were half covered with moss or heather. Altogether, it was a very slow business following the track, even guided by Gandalf, who seemed to know his way about pretty well. They came to the edge of a steep fall in the ground, so suddenly that Gandalf's horse nearly slipped down the slope. Here it is at last. He called and the others gathered round him and looked over the edge. They saw a valley far below. They could hear the voice of hurrying water in a rocky bed at the bottom. The scent of trees was in the air and there was a light on the valley side across the water. Bilbo never forgot the way they slithered and slipped in the dusk down the steep zigzag path into the secret valley of Rivendell. The air grew warmer as they got lower, and the smell of the pine trees made him drowsy, so that every now and again he nodded and nearly fell off, or bumped his nose on the pony's neck. Their spirits rose as they went down and down. Hmm, it smells like elves, thought Bilbo, and he looked up at the stars. They were burning bright and blue. Just then there came a burst of song like laughter in the trees. What are you doing? And where are you going? Your ponies need shoeing. The river is flowing. Oh, tra la la lally. Here down in the valley. Oh, where are you going? With the beards all a wagging. No knowing, no knowing. What brings Mr. Baggins and Balin and Dwellin down into the valley in June? Ha! So they laughed and sang in the trees. And pretty fair nonsense, I dare say you think it. Not that they would care. They would only laugh all the more if you told them so. They were elves, of course. Soon Bilbo caught glimpses of them as the darkness deepened. He loved elves, though he seldom met them. But he was a little frightened of them too. Dwarves don't get on well with them. 
Even decent enough dwarves like Thorin and his friends think them foolish, which is a very foolish thing to think, or get a... For some, elves tease them and laugh at them, and most of all at their beards. Well, well, said a voice, just look. Bilbo the Hobbit on a pony, my dear. Isn't it delicious? Then off they went into another song, as ridiculous as the one I have written down in full. At last one, a tall young fellow, came out from the trees and bowed to Gandalf and to Thorin. Welcome to the valley, he said. Thank you, said Thorin a bit gruffly. But Gandalf was already off his horse and among the elves, talking merrily with them. You are a little out of your way, said the elf. That is, if you are making for the only path across the water and to the house beyond. We will set you right but you had best get on foot until you are over the bridge. Are you going to stay a bit and sing with us, or will you go straight on? Supper is preparing over there, he said. I can smell the wood fires for the cooking. But the dwarves were all for supper as soon as possible just then, and would not stay. On they all went, leading their ponies, till they were brought to a good path, and so at last to the very brink of the river. It was flowing fast and noisily, as mountain streams do of a summer evening, when sun has been all day on the snow, far up above. There was only a narrow bridge of stone without a parapet, as narrow as a pony could well walk on. And over that they had to go, slow and careful, one by one, each leading his pony by the bridle. The elves had brought bright lanterns to the shore, and they sang a merry song as the party went across. And so at last, they all came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. The master of the house was an elf friend, one of those people whose fathers came into the strange stories before the beginning of history, the wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. In those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the north for ancestors, and Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. He comes into many tales, but his part in the story of Bilbo's great adventure is only a small one, though important, as you will see, if we ever get to the end of it. His house was perfect, whether you liked food or sleep or work or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Evil things did not come into that valley. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales, or one or two of the songs that they heard in that house. All of them, the ponies as well, grew refreshed and strong in a few days there. Their clothes were mended as well as their bruises, their tempers and their hopes. Their bags were filled with food and provisions light to carry, but strong to bring them over the mountain passes. Their plans were improved with the best advice. So the time came to Midsummer Eve, and they were to go on again with the early sun on Midsummer morning. Elrond gave Gandalf and Thorin each a sword, and Bilbo got a knife in a leather sheath. It would have made only a pocket knife for a man, but it was as good as a short sword for the hobbit. They are old swords, said Elrond, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin wars. This Thorin is named Orchrist, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin. It was a famous blade. This Gandalf was glamdering, faux hammer that the king of Gondolin once wore. Keep them well. Thorin pondered these words. I will keep this sword in honour, he said. May it soon cleave goblins once again. A wish that is likely to be granted soon enough in the mountains, said Elrond. But show me now your map. He held up the map and the white moonlight shone through it. What is this? he said. There are moon letters here, beside the plain runes which say five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? asked the hobbit full of excitement. He loved maps, and he also liked runes and letters and cunning handwriting, though when he wrote himself it was a bit thin and spidery. Moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, said Elrond, not when you look straight at them. 
they can only be seen when the moon shines behind them, and what is more, with the more cunning sort, it must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. The dwarves invented them and wrote them with silver pens, as friends could tell you. These must have been written on a midsummer's eve in a crescent moon a long while ago. What do they say? asked Gandalf and Thorin together, a bit vexed, perhaps, that even Elrond should have found this out first, though really there had not been a chance before, and there would not have been another until goodness knows when. Stand by the great stone when the thrush knocks, read Elrond, and the setting sun, with the last light of Durin's day, will shine upon the keyhole. Durin, Durin, said Thorin. He was the father of the fathers of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, and my first ancestor. I am his he Then, what is Durin's day? asked Elrond. The first day of the dwarves' new year, said Thorin, is as all should know, the first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. We still call it Durin's day, when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together. But this will not help us much, I fear, for it passes our skill in these days to guess when time will come again. That remains to be seen, said Gandalf. Is there any more writing? None to be seen by this moon, said Elrond, and he gave the map back to Thorin. And then they went down to the water to see the elves dance and sing upon the midsummer's eve. The next morning was a midsummer's morning as fair and fresh as could be dream. Blue sky and never a cloud and the sun dancing on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with a knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the land beyond. Chapter 3 Over hill and under hill, there were many paths that led up into those mountains, and many passes over them, but most of the paths were cheats and deceptions, and led nowhere or to bad ends, and most of the passes were infested by evil things and dreadful dangers. The dwarves and the hobbit, helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right pass. Gandalf knew that something unexpected might happen, and he hardly dared to hope that they would pass without fearful adventure over those great tall mountains with lonely peaks and valleys where no king ruled. They did not. All was well, until one day they met a thunderstorm. More than a thunderstorm. A thunder battle. Bilbo had never seen or imagined anything of the kind. They were high up in a narrow place, with a dreadful fall into a dim valley at one side of them. There they were sheltering under a hanging rock for the night, and he lay beneath a blanket and shook. When he peeped out in the lightning flashes, he saw that across the valley, the stone giants were out, and were hurling rocks at one another for a game, and catching them, and tossing them down into the darkness where they smashed among the trees far below, or splintered into little bits, bang, then came a wind and a rain, and the wind whipped the rain and the hail about in every direction, so that an overhanging rock was no protection at all. Soon they were getting drenched, and their ponies were standing with their heads down and their tails between their legs and some of them were whinnying with fright. They could hear that the giants guffawing and shouting all over the mountainsides. This won't do at all, said Thorin. If we don't get blown off or drowned or struck by lightning, we shall be picked up by some giant and kicked sky high for a football. Well, if you know of anything better, take us there, said Gandalf, who was feeling very grumpy and was far from happy about the giants himself. The end of their argument was that they sent Philly and Keeley to look for a better shelter. They had very sharp eyes, and being the youngest of the dwarves by some fifty years, they usually got these sort of jobs. There is nothing like looking if you want to find something, or so Thorin said to the young dwarves. You certainly usually find something, if you look, but it is not always quite the something you were after. So it proved on this occasion. Soon Philly and Killy came crawling back holding on to the rocks in the wind. We have found a dry cave, they said, not far round the next corner, and ponies and all could get inside. Have you thoroughly explored it? said the wizard, who knew that caves up in the mountains were seldom unoccupied. Yes, yes, they said. 
though everybody knew they could not have been long about it. They had come back too quick. It isn't all that big, and it does not go far back. So they all got up and prepared to move. The wind was howling and the thunder still growling, and they had a business getting themselves and their ponies along. Still, it was not very far to go, and before long they came to a big rock standing out into the... If you step behind, you found a low arch in the side of the mountain. There was just room to get the ponies through with a squeeze when they had been unpacked and unsaddled as they passed under the arch. It was good to hear the wind and the rain outside instead of all about them, and to feel safe from the giants and their rocks. But the wizard was taking no risks. He lit up his wand, as he did that day in Bilbo's dining room, that seemed so long ago, if you remember, and by its light they explored the cave from end to end. It seemed quite a fair size, but not too large and mysterious. It had a dry floor and some comfortable nooks. At one end there was room for the ponies, and there they stood mighty glad of the change steaming and champing in their nose bag. Oin and Gloin wanted to light a fire at the door to dry their clothes, but Gandalf would not hear. So they spread out their wet things on the floor and dry ones out of their bundles. Then they made their blankets comfortable, got out their pipes and blue smoke rings, which Gandalf turned into different colors and set dancing up by the roof to amuse them. They talked and talked, and forgot about the storm, and discussed what each would do with his share of the treasure, when they got it, which at the moment did not seem impossible, and so they dropped off to sleep one by one, and that was the last time that they used the ponies, packages, baggages, tools, and paraphernalia that they had brought with them. It turned out a good thing that night that they had brought little Bilbo with them, after all, for somehow... He could not go to sleep for a long while, and when he did sleep, he had very nasty dreams. He dreamed that a crack in the wall at the back of the cave got bigger and bigger, and opened wider and wider, and he was very afraid, but could not call out or do anything but lie and look. Then he dreamed that the floor of the cave was giving way, and he was slipping, beginning to fall down, down, goodness knows where to. At that he woke up with a horrible start and found that part of his dream was true. A crack had opened at the back of the cave, and was already a wide passage. He was just in time to see the last of the pony's tails disappearing into... Of course he gave a very loud yell, as loud a yell as a hobbit can give, which is surprising for their size. Out jumped the goblins, big goblins, great ugly-looking goblins, lots of goblins, before you could say rocks and blocks. There were six to each dwarf, at least, and two even for Bilbo, and they were all grabbed and carried through the crack, before you could say Tinder and Flint, best but not Gandalf. Bilbo's yell had done that much good. It had wakened him up wide in a splintered second, and when goblins came to grab him, there was a terrific flash like lightning in the cave, a smell like gunpowder, and several of them fell dead. The crack closed with a snap and Bilbo and the dwarves were on the wrong side of it. Where was Gandalf? Of that neither they nor the goblins had any idea, and the goblins did not wait to find out. They seized Bilbo and the dwarves and hurried them along. It was deep, deep, dark, such as only goblins that have taken to living in the heart of the mountains can see through. The passages there were crossed and tangled in all directions, but the goblins knew their way as well as you do to the nearest post office. And the goblins were very rough, and pinched unmercifully, and chuckled and laughed in their horrible stony voices. And Bilbo was most unhappy. He wished again and again for his nice bright hobbit hole. Not for the last time. Now there came a glimmer of a red light before them, and they stumbled into a big cavern. It was lit by a great red fire in the middle, and by torches along the walls and it was full of goblins. They all laughed and stamped and clapped their hands when the dwarves came running in, while the goblin drivers hooped and cracked their whips behind. The ponies were already there, huddled in a corner, and there were all the baggages and packages lying broken open, and being rummaged by goblins, and smelt by goblins, and fingered by goblins, and quarreled over by goblins. The goblins chained the prisoners' hands behind their backs, 
and linked them all together in a line and dragged them to the far end of the cavern, with little Bilbo tugging at the end of the row. There in the shadows on a large flat stone sat a tremendous goblin with a huge head, and armed goblins were standing round him carrying the axes and the bent swords that they use. Now goblins are cruel, wicked, and bad-hearted. They make no beautiful things, but they make many clever ones. They can tunnel and mine as well as any but the most skilled wharves when they take the trouble, though they are usually untidy and dirty. Hammers, axes, swords, daggers, pickaxes, tongs, and also instruments of torture. They make very well, or get other people to make to their design. Prisoners and slaves that have to work till they die for want of errands. It is not unlikely that they invented some of the machines that have since troubled the world especially the ingenious devices for killing large numbers of people at once, for wheels and engines and explosions always delighted them, and also not working with their help. But in those days and those wild parts they had not advanced as it is called so far. They did not hate dwarves especially, no more than they hated everybody and everything, and particularly the orderly and prosperous. In some parts wicked dwarves had even made alliances with them, but they had a special grudge against Thorin's people because of the war which you have heard mentioned, but which does not come into this tale. And anyway, goblins don't care who they catch, as long as it is done smart and secret, and the prisoners are not able to defend themselves. Who are these miserable persons? said the great goblin. Dwarves, and this? said one of the drivers, pulling at Bilbo's chain so that he fell forward. We found them sheltering in our front porch. What do you mean by it? said the great goblin, turning to Thorin. Up to no good. I'll warrant. Spying on the private business of my people, I guess. Thieves. I shouldn't be surprised to learn. Murderers and friends of elves. Not unlikely. Come, what have you got to say? Thorin the dwarf at your service, he replied. It was merely a polite nothing into the things which you suspect and imagine we had no idea at all. We sheltered from a storm in what seemed a convenient cave and unused. Nothing was further from our thoughts than inconveniencing goblins in any way, whatever. That was true enough. Um, said the great goblin, so you say. Might I ask what were you doing up in the mountains at all and where you were coming from and where you were going to? In fact, I should like to know all about you. Not that it will do you much good, Thorin Oakenshield. I know too much about your folk already. But let's have truth, or I will prepare something particularly uncomfortable for you. Yeah. We were on a journey to visit our relatives, our nephews and nieces, and first, second, and third cousins, and the other descendants of our grandfathers, who live on the east side of these truly hospitable mountains, said Thorin, not quite knowing what to say all at once in a moment, when obviously the exact truth would not do at all. He is a liar, oh truly tremendous one, said one of the drivers. Several of our people were struck by lightning in the cave when we invited these creatures to come below, and they are as dead as stones. Also he has not explained this. He pointed to the sword which Thorin was wearing. The great goblin gave a truly awful howl of rage when he looked at it, and all his soldiers gnashed their teeth, clashed their shields, and stamped. They knew the sword at once. It had killed hundreds of goblins in its time, when the fair elves of Gondolin hunted them in the hills, or did battle before their walls. They had called it Orchrist, Goblin Cleaver, but the goblins called it simply Biter. They hated it, and hated worse anyone that carried it. Murderers and elf friends, the great goblin shouted, slash them, beat them, bite them. Genash them. Take them away to dark holes full of snakes and never let them see the light again. He was in such a rage that he jumped off his seat and himself rushed at Thorin with his mouth open. Just at that moment all the lights in the cavern went out, and the great fire went off poof, into a tower of blue glowing smoke, right up to the roof, that scattered piercing white sparks all among the goblins. The yells and yammering, croaking, Gibbering and jabbering, howls, growls and curses, shrieking and scriking, that followed were beyond description. 
Several hundred wildcats and wolves being roasted slowly alive together would not have compared with it. The sparks were burning holes in the goblins, and the smoke that now fell from the roof made the air too thick for even their eyes to see through. Soon they were falling over one another and rolling in heaps on the floor, biting and kicking and fighting as if they had all gone mad. Suddenly a sword flashed in its own light. Bilbo saw it go right through the great goblin as he stood dumbfounded in the middle of his rage. He fell dead, and the goblin soldiers fled before the sword shrieking into the darkness. The sword went back into its sheath. Follow me quick, said a voice fierce and quiet, and before Bilbo understood what had happened he was trotting along again, as fast as he could trot, at the end of the line down more dark passages with the yells of the goblin hall growing fainter behind him. A pale light was leading them on. Quicker, quicker, said the voice. The torches will soon be relit. Half a minute, said Dory, who was at the back next to Bilbo and a decent fellow. He made the hobbit scramble on his shoulders as best he could with his tied hands, and then off they all went at a run, with a clink clink of chains and many a stumble since they had no hands to steady themselves with. Not for a long while did they stop, and by that time they must have been right down in the very mountain's heart. Then Gandalf lit up his wand. Of course it was Gandalf, but just then they were too busy to ask how he got there. He took out his sword again, and again it flashed in the dark by itself. Are we all here? said he. One? That's Thorin. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Where are Feely and Killy? Here they are. Twelve, thirteen. And here's Mr. Baggins. Fourteen. Well, well. It might be worse. And then again it might be a good deal better. No ponies and no food. Knowing quite where we are. And hordes of angry goblins just behind. On we go. On they went. Gandalf was quite right. They began to hear goblin noises and horrible cries far behind in the passages they had come through that sent them on faster than ever, and as poor Bilbo could not possibly go half as fast, for dwarves can roll along at a tremendous pace, I can tell you, when they have to, they took it in turn to carry him on their backs. Still goblins go faster than dwarves, and these goblins knew the way better they had made the paths themselves, and were madly angry. So that do what they could, the dwarves heard the cries and howls getting closer and closer. Soon they could hear even the flap of the goblin feet. Many, many feet which seemed only just round the last corner. The blink of red torches could be seen behind them in the tunnel they were following, and they were getting deadly tired. Why? Oh, why did I ever leave my hobbit hole? said poor Mr. Baggins, bumping up and down on Bomber's back. Why? Oh, why did I ever bring a wretched little hobbit on a treasure hunt? said poor Bomber, who was fat and staggered along with the sweat dripping down his nose in his heat and terror. At this point Gandalf fell behind, and Thorin with him. They turned a sharp corner. About turn, he shouted. Draw your sword. Thor there was nothing else to be done, and the goblins did not like it. They came scurrying round the corner in full cry and found Goblin Cleaver, and Foe Hammer a core beater, as they called it, shining cold and bright right in their astonished eyes. The ones in front dropped their torches and gave one yell before they were killed. The ones behind yelled still more, and leaped back, knocking over those that were running after them. Biter and beater, they shrieked, and soon they were all in confusion, and most of them were hustling back the way they had come. It was quite a long while before any of them dared to turn the corner. By that time the dwarves had gone on again, a long, long way on into the dark tunnels of the goblin's realm. When the goblins discovered that, they put out their torches and they slipped on soft shoes, and they chose out their very quickest runners with the sharpest ears and eyes. These ran forward, as swift as weasels in the dark, and with hardly any more noise than bath. That is why neither Bilbo nor the dwarves nor even Gandalf heard them coming, nor did they see them, but they were seen by the goblins that ran silently up behind, for Gandalf was letting his wand give out a faint light to help the dwarves as they went along. Quite suddenly Dory, now at the back again carrying Bilbo, 
was grabbed from behind in the dark. He shouted and fell, and the hobbit rolled off his shoulders into the blackness, bumped his head on hard rock, and remembered nothing more. Chapter 4 Riddles in the Dark When Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he had, for it was just as dark as with them shut. No one was anywhere near him. Just imagine his fright. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone of the floor. Very slowly, he got up and groped about on all fours, till he touched the wall of the tunnel. But neither up nor down it could he find anything, nothing at all. No signs of goblins, no signs of dwarves. His head was swimming, and he was far from certain even of the direction they had been going in when he had his fall. He guessed as well as he could, and crawled along for a good way, till suddenly his hand met what he felt, like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring in his pocket almost without thinking. Certainly it did not seem of any particular use at the moment. He did not go much further, but sat down on the cold floor and gave himself up to complete miserableness. For a long while, he thought of himself frying bacon and eggs in his own kitchen at home, for he could feel inside that it was high time for some meal or other, but that only made him miserabler. He could not think what to do, nor could he think what had happened, or why he had been left behind, or why, if he had been left behind, the goblins had not caught him, or even why his head was so sore. The truth was he had been lying quiet, out of sight and out of mind, in a very dark After some time he felt for his pipe. It was not broken, and that was something. Then he felt for his pouch, and there was some tobacco in it, and that was something more. Then he felt for matches, and he could not find any at all, and that shattered his hopes completely, just as well for him, as he agreed when he came to his senses. Goodness knows what the striking of matches and the smell of tobacco would have brought on him out of dark holes in that horrible place. Still at the moment he was very crushed, but in slapping all his pockets and feeling all round himself for matches his hand came on the hilt of his little sword that he had quite forgotten. Nor do the goblins seem to have noticed it as he wore it inside his breeches. Now he drew it out. It shone pale and dim before his eyes. So it is an elvish blade, too, he thought, and goblins are not very near, and yet... But somehow he was comforted. Go back, he thought. No good at all. Go sideways. Impossible. Go forward. Only thing to do. On we go. So up he got, and trotted along with his little sword held in front of him, and one hand feeling the wall, and his heart all of a patter and a pitter. Now certainly Bilbo was in what is called a tight place. The tunnel seemed to have no end. All he knew was that it was still going down pretty steadily, and keeping in the same direction in spite of a twist and a turn or two. There were passages leading off to the side every now and then, as he knew by the glimmer of his sword, or could feel with his hand on the wall. Of these he took no notice, except to hurry past for fear of goblins or half-imagined dark things coming out. On and on he went and down and down, and still he heard no sound of anything except the occasional whir of a bat by his ears, which startled him at first, till it became too frequent to bother about. Suddenly, without any warning, he trotted splash into water. Ugh, it was icy cold, that pulled him up sharp and short. He did not know whether it was just a pool in the path, or the edge of an underground stream that crossed the passage, or the brink of a deep, dark, subterranean lake. The sword was hardly shining at all. He stopped, and he could hear, when he listened hard, drops drip-drip dripping from an unseen roof into the water below, but there seemed no other sort of sound. So it is a pool or a lake, and not an underground river, he thought. Still, he did not dare to wade out into the darkness. He could not swim, and he thought, too, of nasty, slimy things with big bulging blind eyes wriggling in the water. Even in the tunnels and caves, the goblins have made for themselves. There are other things living unbeknown to them that have sneaked in from outside to lie up in the dark. Some of these caves, too, go back in their beginnings to ages before the goblins, who only widened them and joined them with passages, 
and the original owners are still there in odd corners, slinking and nosing around. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big round pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat and he rowed about quite quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make, not he. He was looking out of his pale lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat too. Goblin he thought good, when he could get it. But he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind. If they came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about, they very seldom did for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake, when they were tunneling down long ago, and they found they could go no further. So there their road ended in that direction, and there was no reason to go that way, unless the great goblin sent. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island, while Bilbo was sitting on the brink altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way and his wits. Suddenly up came Gollum and whispered and hissed. Bless us and splash us, my preciouses. I guess it's a choice feast. At least a tasty morsel to make us Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a terrible swallowing noise in his throat. That is how he got his name, though he always called himself my precious. The hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who are you? he said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. What is he, my precious? whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself through never having anyone else to speak to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious, otherwise he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I have lost the dwarves, and I have lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know if only I can get away. What's he got in his handsies? said Gollum, looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. A sword, a blade which came out of Gondolin, Cesses, said Gollum, and became quite polite. Perhaps he sits here and chats with it a bitsy, my preciouses. It likes riddles, perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly, at any rate for the moment, and until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone really whether he was good to eat and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. Asking them, and sometimes guessing them, had been the only game he had ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago, before he lost all his friends and was driven away, alone, and crept down, down, into the dark under the mountains. Very well said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree until he found out more about the creature, whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblins. You ask first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hiss, what has roots as nobody sees, is taller than trees. Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bilbo. Mountain, I suppose. Does it guess easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious? If precious asks, and it doesn't answer, we eats it, my preciouses. If it asks us, and we doesn't answer, then we does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes. All right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ. Then they stamp. Then they stand still. 
That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was rather an old one, too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my preciouses. But we has only six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless it cries. Wingless flutters. Toothless bites. Mouthless mutters. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind, wind, of course, he said, and he was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. This'll puzzle the nasty little underground creature. He thought an eye and a blue face, saw an eye and a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. S -s 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 -s, said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before, when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by a river. See, 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 my son on the daisies, it means. It does. But these ordinary, above-ground, everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. So this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking. All in mail, never clinking. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure to himself. Is it nice, my Priuses? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? He began to peer at Bilbo out of the darkness. Half a moment said the hobbit, shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. It must make haste. Haste, said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get a bilbo. But when he put his long webby foot in the water, a fish jumped out in a fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. Uh, he said. It is cold and clammy. Hmm. And so he guessed. Gollum was dreadfully disappointed but Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as ever he could, so that Gollum had to get back into his boat and think. No legs lay on one leg, two legs sat near on three legs, four legs got some. It was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it, if he had asked it at another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs was not so very difficult. Fish on a little table, man at table, sitting on a stool. The cat has the bones. That, of course, is the answer, and Gollum soon gave it. Then he thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he says. This thing all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers. Gnaws iron, bites steel. Grinds hard stones to meal. Slays king. Ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Poor Bilbo sat in the dark thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard told of in tales, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different and that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, Give me more time. Give me time. But all that came out with a sudden squeal. Time. Time. Bilbo was saved by pure luck. For that, of course, was the answer. Gollum was disappointed once more. And now he was getting angry and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time he did not go back to the boat. He
he sat down in the dark by Bilbo, that made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious yes, 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 yes. Just one more question to guess. Yes, yes, said Gollum. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty wet cold thing sitting next to him and pawing and poking him. He scratched himself. He pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us. Ask us, said Gollum. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with his other hand. There he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. What have I got in my pocket? He said aloud. He was talking to himself, but Gollum thought it was a riddle and he was frightfully upset. Not fair. Not fair, he hissed. It isn't fair, my precious, is it, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pockets is? Bilbo, seeing what had happened and having nothing better to ask, stuck to his question. What have I got in my pocket? He said louder. S, 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 hissed Gollum. It must give us three guesses, my preciouses. Very well, guess away, said Bilbo. Pansies, said Gollum. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had luckily just taken his hand out again. S, 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 said Gollum, more upset than ever. He thought of all the little things he kept in his own pockets. Fish bones, goblins' teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, a sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on, and other nasty things. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. Knife, he said at last. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had lost his some time ago. Last guess. Now Gollum was in a much worse state than when Bilbo had asked him the sun question. He hissed and spluttered and rocked himself backwards and forwards and slapped his feet on the floor and wriggled and squirmed, but still he did not dare to waste his last guess. Come on, said Bilbo. I'm waiting. He tried to sound bold and cheerful, but he did not feel at all sure how the game was going to end, whether Gollum guessed right or not. Time's up, he said. String or nothing, shrieked Gollum, which was not quite fair, working in two guesses at once. Both wrong, cried Bilbo very much relieved, and he jumped at once to his feet, put his back to the nearest wall, and held out his little sword. He felt he could not trust this slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. Any excuse would do for him to slide out of it. And after all, that last question had not been a genuine riddle. But at any rate, Gollum did not at once attack him. He could see the sword in Bilbo's hand. He sat still, shivering and whispering. At last, Bilbo could wait no longer. Well, he said, what about your promise? I want to go. You must show me Cross it is, impatient, precious, hissed Gollum. But it must wait, yes, it must. We can't go up the tunnel so hasty. We must go and get some things first. Yes, things to help us. Well, hurry up, said Bilbo, relieved to think of Gollum going away. He thought he was just making an excuse and did not mean to come back. What was Gollum talking about? What useful thing could he keep out on the dark lake? But he was wrong. Gollum did mean to come back. He was angry now and hungry, and he was a miserable, wicked creature, and already he had a plan. Not far away was his island, of which Bilbo knew nothing, and there in his hiding place he kept a few wretched oddments, and one very beautiful thing, very beautiful, very wonderful. He had a ring, a golden ring, a precious ring. My birthday present he whispered to himself as he had often done in the endless dark days. That's what we want now, yes? We want it. He wanted it because it was a ring of power, and if you slipped that ring on your finger you were invisible. Only in the full sunlight could you be seen, and then only by your shadow, and that would be shaky and faint. My birthday present. It came to me on my birthday, my precious, so he had always said to himself, but who knows how Gollum came by that present? 
ages ago in the old days when such rings were still at large in the world. Perhaps even the master who had ruled them could not have said. Gollum used to wear it at first, till it tired him, and then he kept it in a pouch next his skin, till it galled him. And now usually he hid it in a hole in the rock on his island, and was always going back to look at it, and still sometimes he put it on, when he could not bear to be parted from it any longer, or when he was very, very hungry and tired of fish. Then he would creep along dark passages looking for stray goblins. He might even venture into places where the torches were lit and made his eyes blink and smart. For he would be safe. Oh yes, quite safe. No one would see him, no one would notice him, till he had his fingers on their throat. Only a few hours ago he had worn it and caught a small goblin imp, himp. How he squeaked. He still had a bone or two left to gnaw, but he wanted something softer. That is what was in his wicked little mind, as he slipped suddenly from Bilbo's side, and flapped back to his boat, and went off into the dark. Bilbo thought that he had heard the last of him. Still he waited a while, for he had no idea how to find his way out alone. Suddenly he heard a screech. It sent a shiver down his back. Gollum was cursing and wailing away in the gloom not very far off by the sound of it. He was on his island, scrabbling here and there, searching and seeking in vain. Where is it? Where is this it? Bilbo heard him crying. Lost it is, my precious lost, lost. Curse us and crush us, my precious is lost. What's the matter? Bilbo called. What have you lost? Come along. No, not yet, precious, Gollum answered. We must search for it. But you never guessed my last question. And you promised, said Bilbo. Never guessed, said Gollum. Then suddenly out of the gloom came a sharp hiss. What has it got in its pockets is? Tell us that. It must tell first. The sound came hissing louder and sharper, and as he looked towards it, to his alarm Bilbo now saw two small points of light peering at him, as suspicion grew in Gollum's mind. The light of his eyes burned with a pale flame. What have you lost? Bilbo persisted. But now, the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire, and it was coming swiftly nearer. Gollum was in his boat again, paddling wildly back to the dark shore. And such a rage of loss and suspicion was in his heart that no sword had any more terror for him. Bilbo could not guess what had maddened the wretched creature. But he saw that all was up, and that Gollum meant to murder him at any rate. Just in time he turned and ran blindly back up the dark passage down which he had come, keeping close to the wall and feeling it with his left hand. What has it got in its pockets is, he heard the hiss loud behind him, and the splash as Gollum leaped from his boat. What have I, I wonder, he said to himself, as he panted and stumbled along. He put his left hand in his pocket. The ring felt very cold as it quietly slipped onto his groping forefinger. The hiss was close behind him. He turned now and saw Gollum's eyes like small green lamps coming up the slope. Terrified he tried to run faster, but suddenly he struck his toes on a snag in the floor and fell flat with his little sword under In a moment Gollum was on him, but before Bilbo could do anything, Recover his breath, pick himself up, or wave his sword, Gollum passed by, taking no notice of him, cursing and whispering as he ran. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark. Bilbo could see the light of his eyes palely shining even from behind. Painfully he got up and sheathed his sword, which was now glowing faintly again. Then very cautiously he followed. There seemed nothing else to do. It was no good crawling back down to Gollum's water. Perhaps if he followed him, Gollum might lead him to some way of escape without meaning to. Curse it! Curse it! Curse it! hissed Gollum. Curse the Baggins! It's gone! What has it got in its pockets is? Oh, we guess, we guess, my precious. He's found it, yes, he must have. My birthday present. Bilbo pricked up his ears. He was at last beginning to guess himself. Suddenly Gollum sat down and began to weep, a whistling and gurgling sound horrible to listen to. Bilbo halted and flattened himself against the tunnel wall. After a while Gollum stopped weeping and began to talk. He seemed to be having an argument with him. 
It's no good going back there to search. No, we doesn't remember all the places we visited, and it's no use. The Baggins has got it in its pockets is. The nasty noser has found it, we says. We guesses, precious only guesses. We can't know till he find the nasty creature and squeezes it. But it doesn't know what the present can do, does it? It'll just keep it in its pockets is. It doesn't know, and it can't go far. It's lost itself, the nasty nosy thing. It doesn't know the way out. It said so. It said so, yes. But it's tricksy. It doesn't say what it means. It won't say what it's got in its pockets is. It knows. It knows a way in, it must know a way out, yes. It's off to the back door. To the back door, that's... The goblin says we'll catch it then. It can't get out that way, precious. S is ses s golem. Goblins is. Yes, but if it's got the present, our precious present, then goblinses will get it. Gollum. They'll find it, they'll find out what it does. We shan't ever be safe again. Never, Gollum. One of the goblinses will put it on, and then no one will see him. He'll be but not seen. Not even our clever eyeses will notice him. And he'll come creepsy and tricksy and catch us, Gollum. Gollum. Then let's slop talking, precious, and make haste. If a Baggins has gone that way, we must go quick and see. Go. Not far now. Make haste. With a spring, Gollum got up and started shambling off at a great pace. Bilbo hurried after him, still cautiously, though his chief fear now was of tripping on another snag and falling with a noise. His head was in a whirl of hope and wonder. It seemed that the ring he had was a magic ring. It made you invisible. He had heard of such things, of course, in old, old tales. But it was hard to believe that he really had found one. By still there at one, with his bright eyes had passed him by, only a yard to one side. On they went, Gollum flip-flapping ahead, hissing and cursing, Bilbo behind going as softly as a hobbit can. Soon they came to places where, as Bilbo had noticed on the way down, Side passages opened, this way and that. Gollum began at once to count. One left, yes. One right, yes. Two right, yes, yes. Two left, yes, yes. And as the count grew, he slowed down, and he began to get shaky and weepy, for he was leaving the water further and further behind, and he was getting afraid. Goblins might be about, and he had lost his ring. At last he stopped by a low opening, on the left as they went up. Seven right, yes. Six left, yes. He whispered, This is it. This is the way to the back door, yes. Here's the passage. He peered in and shrank back. But we durstn't go in? Precious. No, we durstn't. Goblinses are there. Lots of goblinses. We smell them. What shall we do? Curse them and crush them. We must wait here. Precious. Wait a bit and see. So they came to a dead stop. Gollum had brought Bilbo to the way out after all, but Bilbo could not get in. There was Gollum sitting humped up right in the opening, and his eyes gleamed cold in his head as he swayed it from side to side between his knees. A sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. A glimpse of endless unmarked days without light or hope of betterment, hard stone, cold fish, sneaking and whispering. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. He trembled. And then quite suddenly in another flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he leaped. No great leap for a man, but a leap in the dark. Straight over Gollum's head he jumped, seven feet forward and three in the air. Indeed, had he known it? He only just missed cracking his skull on the low arch of the passage. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him, but too late. His hands snapped on thin air and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped off down the new tunnel. He did not turn to see what Gollum was doing. There was a hissing and cursing almost at his heels at first, then it stopped. All at once there came a blood-curdling shriek. Filled with hatred and despair, Gollum was defeated. He dared go no further. He had lost his prey and lost too. 
the only thing he had ever cared for, his precious. The cry brought Bilbo's heart to his month, but still he held on, now faint as an echo, but menacing. Thief, 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 Baggins. We hates it, we hates it, we hates it forever. Then there was a silence, but that too seemed menacing to Bilbo. If the goblins are so near that he smelt them, he thought, then they'll have heard his shrieking and cursing. Careful now, or this way will lead you to worse things. The passage was low and roughly made. It was not too difficult for the hobbit, except when, in spite of all care, he stubbed his poor toes again, several times, on nasty jagged stones in the floor. A bit low for goblins, at least for the big ones, thought Bilbo, not knowing that even the big ones go along at a great speed, stooping low with their hands almost on the ground. Soon the passage that had been sloping down began to go up again, and after a while it climbed steeply. That slowed Bilbo down. But at last the slope stopped. The passage turned a corner and dipped down again. And there, at the bottom of a short incline, he saw, filtering round another corner, a glimpse of light. Not red light, as a fire or lantern, but a pale out-of-doors sort of light. Then Bilbo began to run. Cuddling as fast as his legs would carry him, he turned to the last corner and came suddenly right into an open space, where the light, after all of that time in the dark, seemed dizzingly bright. Really, it was only a leak of sunshine in through a doorway, where a great door, a stone door, was left standing open. Gobo blinked, and then suddenly he saw the goblins. Goblins in full armor with drawn swords sitting just inside the door and watching it with wide eyes and watching the passage that led to it. They were aroused, alert, ready for anything. They saw him sooner than he saw them. Yes, they saw him. Whether it was an accident or a last trick of the ring before it took a new master, it was not on his finger. With yells of delight, the goblins rushed upon him. A pang of fear and loss, like an echo of Gollum's misery, smote Bilbo, and, forgetting even to draw his sword, he struck his hands into his pockets. And there was the ring still in his left pocket, and it slipped on his finger. The goblins stopped short. They could not see a sign of him. He had vanished. They yelled twice as loud as before, but not so delightedly. Where is it? Go back up the passage, some shouted. This way, some yelled. That way, others yelled. Look out for the door, bellowed the captain. Whistles blew, armor clashed, swords rattled, goblins cursed and swore and ran hither and thither, falling over one another and getting very angry. There was a terrible outcry to do and disturbance. Bilbo was dreadfully frightened, but he had the sense to understand what had happened and to sneak behind a big barrel which held drink for the goblin guards and so get out of the way and avoid being bumped into, trampled to death, or caught by feel. I must get to the door. I must get to the door. He kept on saying to himself, but it was a long time before he ventured to try. Then it was like a horrible game of blind man's buff. The place was full of goblins running about, and the poor little hobbit dodged this way and that, was knocked over by a goblin who could not make out what he had bumped into, scrambled away on all fours, slipped between the legs of the captain just in time, got up, and ran for the door. It was still ajar, but a goblin had pushed it nearly too. Bilbo struggled, but he could not move it. He tried to squeeze through the crack. He squeezed and squeezed and he stuck. It was awful. His buttons had got wedged on the edge of the door and the door post. He could see outside into the open air. There were a few steps running down into a narrow valley between tall mountains. The sun came out from behind a cloud and shone bright on the outside of the door, but he could not get through. There's only one of the goblins inside shouters. There's a shadow by the door. Something is outside. Bilbo's heart jumped into his mouth. He gave a terrific squirm. Buttons burst off in all directions. He was through, with a torn coat and waistcoat, leaping down the steps like a goat, while bewildered goblins were still picking up his nice brass buttons on the doorstep. 
Of course they soon came down after him, hooting and hallooing, and hunting among the trees. But they don't like the sun. It makes their legs wobble and their heads giddy. They could not find Bilbo with the ring on, slipping in and out of the shadow of the trees, running quick and quiet, and keeping out of the sun. So soon they went back grumbling and cursing to guard the door. Bilbo had escaped. Chapter 6 Queer Lodgings The next morning Bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes. He jumped up to look at the time and to go and put his kettle on, and found he was not home at all. So he sat down and wished in vain for a wash and a brush. He did not get either, nor tea, nor toast, nor bacon for his breakfast, only cold mutton and rabbit. And after that, he had to get ready for a fresh star. This time, he was allowed to climb on to an eagle's back and cling between his wings. The air rushed over him, and he shut his eyes. The dwarves were crying farewells, and promising to repay the lord of the eagles if ever they could, as off rose fifteen great birds from the mountain side. After a good while, the eagles must have seen the point they were making for, even from their great height for they began to go down circling round in great spirals. The earth was getting nearer, and below them were trees that looked like oaks and elms, and wide grasslands, and a river running through it all, horses but cropping out of the ground. Right in the path of the stream which looped itself about it was a great rock, almost a hill of stone, like a last outpost of the distant mountains. Quickly now to the top of this rock, the eagles swooped one by one and set down their passengers. Farewell, they cried, wherever you fare, till your eyries receive you at the journey's end. That is the polite thing to say among eagles. May the wind under your wings bear you where the sun sails and the moon walks, answered Gandalf, who knew the correct reply. And so they parted. There was a flat space on the top of the hill of stone, and a well-worn path with many steps leading down it to the river, across which a ford of huge flat stones led to the grassland beyond the stream. There was a little cave, wholesome one with a pebbly floor, at the foot of the steps and near the end of the stony ford. Here the party gathered and discussed what was to be done. I always meant to see you all safe, if possible, over the mountains, said the wizard, and now, by good management and good luck, I have done it. Indeed we are now a good deal further east than I ever meant to come with you, for after all this is not my adventure. I may look in on it again before it is all over, but in the meanwhile I have some other pressing business to attend to. The dwarves groaned and looked most distressed, and Bilbo wept. They had begun to think Gandalf was going to come all the way and would always be there to help them out of difficulties. I'm not going to disappear this very instant, said he. I can give you a day or two more. Probably I can help you out of your present plight, and I need a little help myself. We have no food and no baggage and no ponies to ride, and you don't know where you are. Now I can tell you that. You are still some miles north of the path which we should have been following if we had not left the mountain pass in a hurry. Very few people live in these parts, unless they've come here since I was last down this way, which is some years ago. But there is somebody that I know of who lives not far away that somebody made the steps on the great rock. Karak, I believe he calls it. We must go and find him. And if all goes well at our meeting, I think I shall be off and wish you like the eagles farewell wherever you fare. Then they took off their clothes and bathed in the river, which was shallow and clear and stony at the ford. When they had dried in the sun, which was now strong and warm, they were refreshed, if still sore and a little hungry. Soon they crossed the ford carrying the hobbit, and then began to march through the long green grass and down the lines of the wide-armed oaks and the tall elms. And why is it called the Karak? asked Bilbo as he went along at the wizard's side. He called it the Karak, because Karak is his word for it. He calls things like that Karaks, and this one is the Karak, because it is the only one near his home, and he knows it well. Who calls it? Who knows it? The somebody I spoke of? A very great person. You aid us all be very polite when I introduce you. I shall introduce you slowly, two by two, I think. And you must be careful not to annoy him, or heaven knows what will happen. He can be appalling when he is angry, though he is kind enough, humored, 
Still, I warn you, he gets angry easily. The dwarves all gathered round when they heard the wizard talking like this to Bilbo. Is that the person you are taking us to now? They asked. Couldn't you find someone more easy-tempered? Hadn't you better explain it all a bit clearer? And so on. Yes, it certainly is. No, I could not. And I was explaining very carefully, answered the wizard crossly. If you must know more, his name is Bjorn. He is very strong, and he is a skin changer. Sometimes he is a huge black bear. Sometimes he is a great strong black-haired man with huge arms and a great beard. I cannot tell you much more. He is not the sort of person to ask questions of. He lives in an oak wood and has a great wooden house. And as a man he keeps cattle and horses which are nearly as marvelous as himself. They work for him and talk to him. He does not eat them. Neither does he hunt or eat wild animals. He keeps hives and hives of great fierce bees, and lives most on cream and honey. As a bear he ranges far and wide. I once saw him sitting all alone on the top of the Karak at night watching the moon sinking towards the misty mountains. Bilbo and the dwarves had now plenty to think about, and they asked no more questions. They still had a long way to walk before them. It was the middle of the afternoon before they noticed that great patches of flowers had begun to spring up, all the same kinds growing together as if they had been planted, especially there was clover, waving patches of coxcomb clover and purple clover and wide stretches of short white sweet honey-smelling clover. There was a buzzing and a whirring and a droning in the air. Bees were busy everywhere. We are getting near, said Gandalf. We are on the edge of his bee pastures. After a while they came to a belt of tall and very ancient oaks, and beyond these to a high thorn hedge through which you could neither see nor scramble. You had better wait here, said the wizard to the dwarves, and when I call or whistle begin to come after me, you will see the way I go, but only in pairs, mind, about five minutes between each pair of you. Bomber is fattest and will do for two. He had better come alone and last. Come on, Mr. Baggins. There is somewhere around this way. And with that he went off along the hedge, taking the frightened hobbit with him. They soon came to a wooden gate, high and broad, beyond which they could see gardens and a cluster of low wooden buildings, some thatched and made of unshaped logs, barns, stables, sheds, and a low wooden house. Inside on the southward side of the great hedge were rows and rows of hives with bell-shaped tops made of straw. The noise of the giant bees flying to and fro and crawling in and out filled all the air. Soon they reached a courtyard, three walls of which were formed by the wooden house and its two long wings. In the middle there was lying a great oak trunk with many lopped branches beside it. Standing near was a huge man with a thick black beard and hair, and great bare arms and legs with knotted muscles. He was clothed in a tunic of wool down to his knees, and was leaning on a large axe. Who are you, and what do you want? He asked gruffly, standing in front of them and towering tall above Gandalf. As for Bilbo, he could easily have trotted through his legs without ducking his head to miss the fringe of the man's brown tunic. I am Gandalf, said the wizard. Never heard of him, growled the man. And what's this little fellow? He said stooping down to frown at the hobbit with his bushy eyebrows. That is Mr. Baggins, a hobbit of good family and unimpeachable reputation, said Gandalf. Bilbo bowed. He had no hat to take off, and was painfully conscious of his many missing buttons. I am a wizard, continued Gandalf. I have heard of you, if you have not heard of me. But perhaps you have heard of my good cousin Radagast, who lives near the southern borders of Mirkwood? Yes. Not a bad fellow as wizards go, I believe. I used to see him now and again, said Bjorn. Well, now I know who you are, or who you say you are. What to tell you the truth? We have lost our luggage and nearly lost our way, and we are rather in need of help, or at least of advice. I may say we have had rather a bad time with goblins in the mountains. Goblins? said the big man less gruffly. Oh, ho! So you've been having trouble with them, have you? What did you go near them for? We did not mean to. They surprised us at night in a pass which we had to cross, 
We were coming out of the lands over west into these countries. It is a long tale. Then you had better come inside and tell me some of it, if it won't take all day, said the man leading the way through a dark door that opened out of the courtyard into the house. Following him they found themselves in a wide hall with a fireplace in the middle. Though it was summer, there was a wood fire burning, and the smoke was rising to the blackened rafters in search of the way out, through an opening in the roof. They passed through this dim hall, lit only by the fire and the hole above it, and came through another smaller door into a sort of veranda propped on wooden posts made of single tree trunks. It faced south and was still warm, and filled with the light of the westering sun which slanted into it, and fell golden on the garden full of flowers that came right up to the steps. Here they sat on wooden benches while Gandalf began his tale, and Bilbo swung his dangling legs and looked at the flowers in the garden, wondering what their names could be, as he had never seen half of them before. I was coming over the mountains with a friend or two, said the wizard, or two. I can only see one, and a little one at that, said Bjorn. Well, to tell you the truth, I did not like to bother you with a lot of us until I found out if you were busy. I will give a call. If I go on, call away. So Gandalf gave a long, shrill whistle, and presently Thorin and Dory came round the house by the garden path and stood bowing low before them. One or three you meant, I see, said Bjorn. But these aren't hobbits, Thorin Oakenshield. At your service. Dory at your service, said the two dwarves bowing again. I don't need your service. Thank you, said Bjorn, but I expect you need mine. I am not over fond of dwarves, but if it is true you are Thorin son of Thrain, son of Thror, I believe, and that your companion is respectable, and that you are enemies of goblins and are not up to any mischief in my lands, what are you up to, by the way? They are on their way to visit the land of their fathers, away east beyond Mirkwood, put in Gandalf, and it is entirely an accident that we are in your lands at all. We were crossing by the high pass that should have brought us to the road that lies to the south of your country, when we were attacked by the evil goblins, as I was about to tell you. Go on telling, then, said Bjorn, who was never very polite. There was a terrible storm. The stone giants were out hurling rocks, and at the head of the pass we took refuge in a cave, the hobbit and I and several of our companions. Do you call two several? Well, no. As a matter of fact, there were more than two. Where are they? Killed, eaten, gone home. Well, no. They don't seem all to have come when I whistled. Shy, I expect. You see, we are very much afraid that we are rather a lot for you to entertain me. Go on, whistle again. I am in for a party, it seems, and one or two more won't make much difference, growled Bjorn. Gandalf whistled again. But Nori and Ori were there almost before he had stopped, for, if you remember, Gandalf had told them to come in pairs every five minutes. Hello, said Bjorn. You came pretty quick. Where were you hiding? Come on, my jack-in-the-boxes. Nori, at your service. Oriat. They began. But Bjorn interrupted them. Thank you. When I want your help, I will ask for it. Sit down, and let's get on with this tale or it will be supper time before it is ended. As soon as we were asleep, went on Gandalf, a crack at the back of the cave opened. Goblins came out and grabbed the hobbit and the dwarves and our troop of ponies. Troop of ponies. What are you, a traveling circus? Or were you carrying lots of goods? Or do you always call six a troop? Oh no. As a matter of fact, there were more than six ponies, for there were more than six of us. And well... Here are two more. Just at that moment Balin and Dwalin appeared and bowed so low that their beards swept the stone floor. The big man was frowning at first, but they did their very best to be frightfully polite and kept on nodding and bending and bowing and waving their hoods before their knees in proper dwarf fashion till he stopped frowning and burst into a chuckling laugh. They looked so comical. Balin and Dwalin at your service, they said not daring to be offended and sat flop on the floor looking rather surprised. Now go on again, said Bjorn to the wizard. Where was I? Oh yes, 
I was not grabbed. I killed a goblin or two with a flash. Good, growled Bjorn. It is some good being a wizard, then, he, and slipped inside the crack before it closed. I followed down into the main hall, which was crowded with goblins. I thought to myself, even if they were not all chained together, what can a dozen do against so many? A dozen. That's the first time I've heard eight called a dozen. Or have you still got some more jacks that haven't yet come out of boxes? Well, yes. There seem to be a couple more here now. Feely and Keely, I believe, said Gandalf, as these two now appeared and stood smiling and bowing. That's enough, said Bjorn. Sit down and be quiet. Now go on, Gand. So Gandalf went on with the tale, until he came to the fight in the dark, the discovery of the lower gate and their horror when they found that Mr. Baggins had been mislaid. We counted ourselves and found that there was no hobbit. There were only fourteen of us left. Fourteen. That's the first time I've heard one from ten leave fourteen. You mean nine? Or else you haven't told me yet all the names of your party. Well, of course you haven't seen Owen and Gloin yet. And, bless me, here they are. I hope you will forgive them for bothering you. Oh, let them all come. Hurry up. Come along, you two, and sit down, but look here, Gandalf. Even now, we have only got yourself and ten dwarves, and the hobbit that was lost, that only makes eleven plus one mislaid, and not fourteen, unless wizards count differently to other people. But now please go on with the tale. Bjorn did not show it more than he could help, but really he had begun to get very interested when Gandalf came to their climbing into trees with the wolves all underneath. He got up and strode about and muttered, I wish I had been there. I would have given them more than firework. Well, said Gandalf, very glad to see that his tale was making a good impression. I did the best I could. There we were, with the wolves going mad underneath us, and the forest beginning to blaze in places, when the goblins came down from the hills and discovered us. They yelled with delight at seeing their fifteen enemies. Good heavens, growled Bjorn. Don't pretend that goblins can't count. They can. Twelve isn't fifteen, and they know it. And so do I. There were Befur and Beaufur as well. I haven't ventured to introduce them before. But here they are. In came Bifur and Beaufur. And me. Gas Bomber puffing up behind. He was fat and also angry at being left to last. He refused to wait five minutes, and followed immediately after the other two. Well, now there are fifteen of you. Perhaps we can finish this story without any more interruptions. Mr. Baggins saw then how clever Gandalf had... The interruptions had really made Bjorn more interested in the story, and the story had kept him from sending the dwarves off at once like suspicious beggars. He never invited people into his house if he could help it. He had very few friends, and they lived a good way away and he never invited more than a couple of these to his house at a time. Now he had got fifteen strangers sitting in his porch. By the time the wizard had finished his tale, and had told of Eagle's rescue, and of how they had all been brought to the Karak, the sun had fallen behind the peaks of the misty mountains, and the shadows were long in Bjorn's garden. A very good tale, said he, the best I have heard for a long while. If all beggars could tell such a good one, they might find me kinder. You may be making it all up, of course, but you deserve a supper for the story all the same. Yes, please. They all said together, thank you very much. They had a supper or a dinner, such as they had not had, since they left the last homely house in the west and said goodbye to Elrond. The light of the torches and the fire flickered about them, and on the table were two tall red bees' wax candles. All the time they ate, Bjorn, in his deep rolling voice, told tales of the wild lands on this side of the mountains, and especially of the dark and dangerous wood that lay outstretched far to north and south a day's ride before them, barring their way to the east, the terrible forest of Mirkwood. The dwarves listened and shook their beards, for they knew that they must soon venture into that forest, and that after the mountains it was the worst of the perils they had to pass before they came to the dragon's stronghold. They sat long at the table with their wooden drinking bowls filled with mead. The dark night came on outside, 
The fires in the middle of the hall were built with fresh logs, and the torches were put out, and still they sat in the light of the dancing flames, with pillars of the house standing tall behind them, and dark at the top like trees of the forest. Whether it was magic or not, it seemed to Bilbo that he heard a sound like wind in the branches stirring in the rafters, and the hoot of owls. Soon he began to nod with sleep, and the voices seemed to grow far away. The great door had creaked and slammed. Bjorn was gone. Next morning they were all wakened by Bjorn himself. So here you are still, he said. He picked up the hobbit and laughed. Not eaten up by wargs or goblins, yet I see. And he poked Mr. Baggins' waistcoat most disrespect. Little Bunny is getting nice and fat again and on bread and honey, he chuckled. Come and have some more. So they all went to breakfast with him. Bjorn was most jolly for a change. Indeed, he seemed to be in a splendidly good humor and set them all laughing with his funny stories. Nor did they have to wonder long where he had been or why he was so nice to them, for he told them himself. He had been over the river and right back up into the mountains, from which you can guess that he could travel quickly, in bare shape at any rate. From the burnt wolf glade he had soon found out that part of their story was true. But he had found more than that. He had caught a warg and a goblin wandering in the woods. The goblin patrols were still hunting with wargs for the dwarves, and they were fiercely angry because of the death of the great goblin, and also because of the burning of the chief wolf's nose, and the death from the wizard's fire of many of his chief servants. It was a good story. That of yours, said Bjorn. But I like it still better now. I am sure it is true. You must forgive my not taking your word. If you lived near the edge of Mirkwood, you would take the word of no one that you did not know as well as your brother or better. As it is, I can only say that I have hurried home as fast I could to see that you were safe, and to offer you any help that I can. I shall think more kindly of dwarves after this. Kill the great goblin. Kill the great goblin. He chuckled fiercely to himself. Bjorn promised that he would provide ponies for each of them, and a horse for Gandalf, for their journey to the forest, and he would lay them with food to last them for weeks with care, and packed so as to be as easy as possible to carry nuts, flour, sealed jars of dried fruits, earthenware pots of honey and twice-baked cakes that would keep good a long time, and on a little of which they could march far. Water, he said, they would not need to carry this side of the forest, for there were streams and springs along the road. But your way through Mirkwood is dark, dangerous and difficult, he said. Water is not easy to find there, nor food. I will provide you with skits for carrying water, and I will give you some bows and arrows. But I doubt very much whether anything you find in Mirkwood will be wholesome to eat or to drink. There is one stream there I know black and strong which crosses the path, that you should neither drink of, nor bathe in, for I have heard that it carries enchantment and a great drowsiness and forgetfulness, and in the dim shadows of that place I don't think you will shoot anything, wholesome or unwholesome, without straying from the path, must not do. For any reason, that is all the advice I can give you. Beyond the edge of the forest I cannot help you much. You must depend on your luck and your courage and the food I send with you. At the gate of the forest I must ask you to send back my horse and my ponies, but I wish you all speed, and my house is open to you if ever you come back this way again. They thanked him, of course, with many bows and sweepings of their hoods, and with many Anne at your service, O master of the wide wooden halls. But their spirits sank at his grave words and they all felt that the adventure was far more dangerous than they had thought, while all the time, even if they passed all the perils of the road, the dragon was waiting at the end. As soon as they left Bjorn's high hedges at the east of his fenced lands, they turned north and then bore to the northwest. By his advice, they were no longer making for the main forest road to the south of his land. Bjorn had warned them that that way was now often used by the goblins, while the forest road itself he had heard, was overgrown and disused at the eastern end, and led to impassable marches where the paths had long been lost. North of the Carrock, the edge of Mirkwood drew closer to the borders of the great river, and though here the mountains too drew down nearer, 
Bjorn advised them to take this way, for at a place a few days' ride due north of the Carrock was the gate of a little-known pathway through Mirkwood, led almost straight towards the lonely mountain. The goblins, Bjorn had said, will not dare to cross the great river for a hundred miles north of the Carrack, but I should ride fast, for if they make their raid soon they will cross the river to the south and scour all the edge of the forest so as to cut you off, and wargs run swifter than ponies. That is why they were now riding in silence, galloping wherever the ground was grassy and smooth, with the mountains dark on their left and in the distance the line of the river with its trees drawing ever closer. The sun had only just turned west when they started, until evening it lay golden on the land about them. It was difficult to think of pursuing goblins behind, and when they had put many miles between them and Bjorn's house they began to talk and to sing again, and to forget the dark forest path that lay in front. But in the evening when the dusk came on and the peaks of the mountains glowered against the sunset, they made a camp and set a guard, and most of them slept uneasily with dreams, in which there came the howl of hunting wolves and the cries of goblins. Next day they started before dawn, though their night had been short. As soon as it was light, they could see the forest coming as it were to meet them, or waiting for them like a black and frowning wall before them. The land began to slope up and up and it seemed to the hobbit that a silence began to draw in upon them. Birds began to sing less. There were no more deer. Not even rabbits were to be seen. By the afternoon they had reached the eaves of Mirkwood, and were resting almost beneath the great overhanging boughs of its outer trees. Their trunks were huge and gnarled, their branches twisted, their leaves were dark and long. Ivy grew on them, and trailed along the ground. Well. Here is Mirkwood, said Gandalf, the greatest of the forests of the northern world. I hope you like the look of it. Now you must send back these excellent ponies you have borrowed. The dwarves were inclined to grumble at this, but the wizard told them they were fools. You had better keep your promises, for Bjorn is a bad enemy. He may be your friend, but he loves his animals as his children. You do not guess what kindness he has shown you in letting dwarves ride them so far and so fast, nor what would happen to you if you tried to take them into the forest. What about the horse, then? said Thorin. You don't mention sending that back. I don't, because I am not sending it. What about your promise, then? I will look after that. I am not sending the horse back. I am riding it. Then they knew that Gandalf was going to leave them at the very edge of Mirkwood and they were in despair. But nothing they could say would change his mind. Now, we had this all out before. When we landed on the Karak, he it is no use arguing. I have, as I told you, some pressing business away south, and I am already late through bothering with you people. We may meet again before all is over, and then again, of course, we may not. That depends on your luck and on your courage and sense. And I am sending Mr. Baggins with you. I have told you before that he has more about him than you guess, and you will find that out before long. So cheer up, Bilbo, and don't look so glum. Cheer up, Thorin and company. This is your expedition after all. Think of the treasure at the end, and forget the forest and the dragon. Any rate, until tomorrow morning. When tomorrow morning came, he still said the same. So now there was nothing left to do but to fill their water skins at a clear spring they found close to the forest gate and unpack the ponies. They distributed the packages as fairly as they could, and they said goodbye to the ponies and turned their heads for home. Off they trotted gaily, seeming very glad to put their tails towards the shadow of Mirkwood. Now Gandalf, too, said farewell. Bilbo sat on the ground feeling very unhappy and wishing he was beside the wizard on his tall horse. Goodbye said Gandalf to Thorin, and goodbye to you all, goodbye. Straight through the forest is your way now. Don't stray off the track. If you do, it is a thousand to one you will never find it again and never get out of Mirkwood, and then I don't suppose I or anyone else will ever see you again. Very comforting you are to be sure, growled Thorin. Goodbye. If you won't come with us, you had better get off without any more talk. Goodbye, then. And really goodbye, said Gandalf, and he turned his horse and rode down into the west, 
but he could not resist the temptation to have the last word. Before he had passed quite out of hearing, he turned and put his hands to his mouth and could heard his voice come faintly. Goodbye. Be good. Take care of yourselves. Chapter 7 In Mirkwood They walked in single file. The entrance to the path was like a sort of arch leading into a gloomy tunnel made by two great trees that lent together, too old and strangled with ivy and hung with lichen to bear more than a few blackened leaves. The path itself was narrow and wound in and out among the trunks. Soon the light at the gate was like a little bright hole far behind and the quiet was so deep that their feet seemed to thump along while all the trees leaned over them and listened. There were black squirrels in the wood. As Bilbo's sharp, inquisitive eyes got used to seeing things, he could catch glimpses of them whisking off the path and scuttling behind tree trunks. There were queer noises, too, grunts, scufflings, and hurryings in the undergrowth and among the leaves that lay piled endlessly thick in places on the forest floor but what made the noises he could not see. It was not long before they grew to hate the forest as heartily as they had hated the tunnels of the goblins, and it seemed to offer even less hope of any ending. But they had to go on and on, long after they were sick for a sight of the sun and of the sky, and longed for the feel of wind on their faces. There was no movement of air down under the forest roof, and it was everlastingly still and dark and st the nights were the worst. It then became pitch dark, not what you call pitch dark, but really pitch, so black that you really could see nothing. Bilbo tried flapping his hand in front of his nose, but he could not see it at all. Well, perhaps it is not true to say that they could see nothing. They slept all closely huddled together and took it in turns to watch. And when it was Bilbo's turn, he would see gleams in the darkness round them and sometimes pairs of yellow or red or green eyes would stare at him from a little distance, and then slowly fade and disappear and slowly shine out, again in another place. All this went on for what seemed to the hobbit ages upon ages, and he was always hungry, for they were extremely careful with their provisions, even so as days followed days, and still the forest seemed just the same. They began to get anxious. The food would not last for air. And for in fact already beginning to get low, they tried shooting at the squirrels, and they wasted many arrows before they managed to bring one down on the path. But when they roasted it, it proved horrible to taste, and they shot no more squirrels. They were thirsty too, for they had none too much water, and at all time they had seen neither spring nor stream. This was their state when one day they found their path blocked by a running water. It flowed fast and strong, but not very wide right across the way, and it was black, or looked it in the gloom. It was well that Bjorn had warned them against it, or they would have drunk from it, whatever its color, and filled some of their emptied skins at its bank. As it was, they only thought of how to cross it without wetting themselves in its water. Bilbo, kneeling on the brink and peering forward, cried, There is a boat against the far bank. Now why couldn't it have been this side? How far away do you think it is? asked Thorin, for by now they knew Bilbo had the sharpest not at all far. I shouldn't think above twelve yards. Can any of you throw a rope? What's the good of that? The boat is sure to be tied up, even if we could hook it, which I doubt. I don't believe it is tied, said Bilbo, though of course I can't be sure in this light, but it looks to me as if it was just drawn up on the bank, which is low just there where the path goes down into the water, Feely thought he could. So when he had stared a long while to get an idea of the direction, the others brought him a rope. They had several with them, and on the end of the longest they fastened one of the large iron hooks they had used for catching their packs to the straps about their shoulders. Feely took this in his hand, balanced it for a moment, and then flung it across the stream. Steady, said Bilbo. You have thrown it right into the wood on the other side now. Draw it back gently. Feely hauled the rope back slowly and, after a while, Bilbo sass, carefully. It is lying on the boat. It did. The rope went taut, and Feely pulled in vain. Keely came to his help, and then Owen and Gloin. They tugged and tugged, and suddenly they all fell over on their back. Bilbo was on the lookout, however, caught the rope, and with a piece of stick fended off the little black boat 
as it came rushing across the stream. Help, he shouted, and Balin was just in time to seize the boat before it floated off down the current. It was tied after all, said he, looking at the snapped painter that was still dangling from it. That was a good pull, my lads, and a good job that our rope was the stronger. Who will cross first? asked Bilbo. I shall, said Thorin, and you will come with me and Philly and Balin. That's as many as the boat will hold at a time. After that, Killian Owen and Gloin and Dory. Next, Ori and Nori, Bifer and Bofer, and last, Wallen and Bomber. I'm always last, and I don't like it, said Bomber. It's somebody else's turn today. You should not be so fat. As you are, you must be with the last and lightest boatload. Don't start grumbling against orders or something bad will happen to you. They were all soon on the far bank safe across the enchanted stream. Dwalin had just scrambled out, and Bomber, still grumbling, was getting ready to follow. When something bad did happen, he stumbled, thrusting the boat away from the bank, and then toppled back into the dark water, his hands slipping off the slimy roots at the edge. While the boat span slowly off and disappeared, they could still see his hood above the water when they ran to the bank. Quickly they flung a rope with a hook towards him. His hand caught it, and they pulled him to the shore. He was drenched from hair to boots, of course, but that was not the worst. When they laid him on the bank, he was already fast asleep, and fast asleep he remained in spite of all they could do. They stood over him, cursing their ill luck, while Bomber slept on with a smile on his fat face, as if he no longer cared for all the troubles that vexed They were a gloomy party that night, and the gloom gathered still deeper on them in the following days. They had crossed the enchanted stream, but beyond it the path seemed to straggle on just as before, and in the forest they could see no change. Besides, they were burdened with the heavy body of Bomber, which they had to carry along with them as best they could, taking the wearisome task in turns of four each, while the others shared their pack. If these had not become all too light in the last few days, they would never have managed it. But a slumbering and smiling bomber was a poor exchange for packs filled with food however heavy. In a few days a time came when there was practically nothing left to eat or to drink. Nothing wholesome could they see growing in the woods. Only funguses and herbs with pale leaves and unpleasant smell. About four days from the enchanted stream they came to a part where most of the trees were beeches. They were at first inclined to be cheered by the change, for here there was no undergrowth and the shadow was not so deep. There was a greenish light about them, and in places they could see some distance to either side of the path, yet the light only showed them endless lines of straight grey trunks like the pillars of some huge twilight hall. Still Bomber slept, and they grew very weary. At times they heard disquieting laughter. Sometimes there was singing in the distance, too. The laughter was the laughter of fair voices, not of goblins. And the singing was beautiful, but it sounded eerie and strange, and they were not comforted. Rather, they hurried on from those parts with what strength they had left. Two days later, they found their path going downwards, and before long they were in a valley, filled almost entirely with a mighty growth of oak. Is there no end to this accursed forest? said Thorin. It goes on forever and ever and ever in all directions. Whatever shall we do? That night they ate their very last scraps and crumbs of food and next morning when they awoke the first thing they noticed was that they were still gnawingly hungry, and the next thing was that it was raining and that here and there, the drip of it was dropping heavily on the forest floor. That only reminded them that they were also parchingly thirsty, without doing anything to relieve them. You cannot quench a terrible thirst by standing under giant oaks and waiting for a chance drip to fall on your tongue. The only scrap of comfort there was came unexpectedly from Bomber. He woke up suddenly and sat up, scratching his head. When he heard that there was nothing to eat, he sat down and wept, for he felt very weak and wobbly in the legs. Why ever did I wake up? he cried. I was having such beautiful dreams. I dreamed I was walking in a forest rather like this one, only lit with torches on the trees and lamps swinging from the branches and fires burning on the ground. And there was a great feast going on going on forever. A woodland king was there with a crown of leaves, 
and there was a merry singing, and I could not count or describe the things there were to eat and drink. There was nothing now to be done but to tighten the belts round their empty stomachs, and hoist their empty sacks and packs, and trudge along the track without any great hope of ever getting to the end before they lay down and died of starvation. This they did all that day, going very slowly and wearily, while Bomber kept on wailing that his legs would not carry him, and that he wanted to lie down and sleep. Suddenly Balin, who was a little way ahead, called out, What? What was that? I thought I saw a twinkle of light in the forest. They all looked, and a longish way off, it seemed, they saw a red twinkle in the dark. Then another, and another sprang out beside it. Even Bomber got up, and they hurried along then, not caring if it was trolls or goblins. The light was in front of them, and to the left of the path, and when at last they had drawn level with it, it seemed plain that torches and fires were burning under the trees, but a good way off their track. It looks as if my dreams were coming true, gasped Bomber, puffing up behind. He wanted to rush straight off into the wood after the lights, but the others remembered only too well the warnings of the wizard and of Bjorn. A feast would be no good, if we never got back alive from it, said Thorin. But without a feast, we shan't remain alive much longer anyway, said Bomber, and Bilbo heartily agreed with him. They argued about it backwards and forwards for a long while, until they agreed at length to send out a couple of spies, to creep near the lights and find out more about them, but then they could not agree on who was to be sent. No one seemed anxious to run the chance of being lost and never finding his friends again. In the end, in spite of warnings, hunger decided them, because Bomber kept on describing all of the good things that were being eaten, according to his dream, in the woodland feast. So they all left the path and plunged into the forest. After a good deal of creeping and crawling, they peered round the trunks and looked into a clearing where some trees had been felled and the ground leveled. There were many people there, elvish-looking folk, all dressed in green and brown and sitting on sawn rings of the felled trees in a great circle. There was a fire in their midst and there were torches, fastened to some of the trees round about, but most splendid sight of all. They were eating and drinking and laughing merrily. The smell of the roast meat was so enchanting that, without waiting to consult one another, Every one of them got up and scrambled forwards into the ring with the one idea of begging for some food. No sooner had the first stepped into the clearing than all the lights went out as if by magic. Somebody kicked the fire, and it went up in rockets of glittering sparks and vanished. They were lost in a completely lightless dark, and they could not even find one another. Not for a long time, at any rate, after blundering frantically in the gloom, falling over logs bumping crash into trees, and shouting and calling till they must have waked everything in the forest for miles. At last they managed to gather themselves in a bundle and count themselves by touch. By that time they had, of course, quite forgotten in what direction the path lay, and they were all hopelessly lost, at least till morning. There was nothing for it but to settle down for the night where they were. They did not even dare to search on the ground for scraps of food for fear of becoming separated again. But they had not been lying long, and Bilbo was only just getting drowsy, when Dory, whose turn it was to watch first, said in a loud whisper, The lights are coming out again over there, and there are more than ever of them. Up they all jumped. There, sure enough, not far away were scores of twinkling lights, and they heard the voices and the laughter quite plainly. They crept slowly towards them, in a single line, each touching the back of the one in front, when they got near Thorin's sail. No rushing forward this time. No one is to stir from hiding till I say. I shall send Mr. Baggins alone first to talk to them. They won't be frightened of him. What about me of them? thought Bilbo. And anyway I hope they won't do anything nasty to him. When they got to the edge of the circle of lights they pushed Bilbo suddenly from behind. Before he had time to slip on his ring, he stumbled forward into the full blaze of the fire and torches. It was no good. Out went all the lights again, and complete darkness fell. But it was not the last of the lights in the forest. Later, when the night must have been getting old, Keeley, who was watching then, came and roused them all again.
there's a regular blaze of light begun not far away. Hundreds of torches and many fires must have been lit suddenly and by magic, and hark to the singing and the harps. After lying and listening for a while, they found they could not resist the desire to go nearer and try once more to get help. Up they got again, and this time the result was disastrous. The feast that they now saw was greater and more magnificent than before, and at the head of a long line of feasters sat a woodland king with a crown of leaves upon his golden hair, very much as Bomber had described the figure in his dream. The elvish folk were passing bowls from hand to hand and across the fires, and some were harping and many were singing. Their gleaming hair was twined with many flowers. Green and white gems glinted on their collars and their belts, and their faces and their songs were filled with mirth. Loud and clear were those songs, and out stepped Thorin into their midst. Dead silence fell in the middle of a word. Out went all light. The fires leaped up in black smokes. Ashes and cinders were in the eyes of the dwarves, and the wood was filled again with their clamor and their cries. In the morning Dwalin was the first to awake. He opened an eye and looked round. Where is Thorin? he asked. It was a terrible shock. Of course there were only thirteen of them, twelve dwarves and the hobbit. Where indeed was Thorin? They wondered what evil fate had befallen him, magic or dark monsters, and shuddered as they lay lost in the forest. There they dropped off one by one into uncomfortable sleep full of horrible dreams as evening wore to black night, and there we must leave them for the present. Thorin had been caught quite easily. You remember Bilbo stepping into a circle of light? The next time it had been Thorin who stepped forward, and as the lights went out he fell like a stone enchanted. Then the wood elves had come to him, and bound him, and carried him away. The feasting people were wood elves, of course. These are not wicked folk. If they have a fault, it is their distrust of strangers, though their magic was strong. Even in those days they were wary. Still elves they were and remain, and that is in a great cave some miles within the edge of Mirkwood on its eastern side there lived at this time their greatest king. Before his huge doors of stone a river ran out of the heights of the forest and flowed on and out into the marshes at the feet of the high wooded land. This great cave from which countless smaller ones opened out on every side, wound far underground and had many passages and wide halls. But it was lighter and more wholesome than any goblin dwelling, and neither so deep nor so dangerous. In fact, the subjects of the king mostly lived and hunted in the open woods, and had houses or huts on the ground and in the branches. The beeches were their favorite trees. The king's cave was his palace, and the strong place of his treasure and the fortress of his people against their enemies. It was also the dungeon of his prisoners. So to the cave they dragged Thorin, not too gently, for they did not love dwarves, and thought he was an enemy. In ancient days they had had wars with some of the dwarves, whom they accused of stealing their treasure. It is only fair to say that the dwarves gave a different account, and said that they only took what was their due for the elf king had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver, and had afterwards refused to give them their pay. All this was well known to every dwarf, though Thorin's family had nothing to do with the old quarrel I have spoken of. Consequently Thorin was angry at their treatment of him, when they took their spell off him, and he came to his senses, and also he was determined that no word of gold or jewels should be dragged out of him. The king looked sternly on Thorin when he was brought before him and asked him many questions. But Thorin would only say that he was starving. Why did you and your folk three times try to attack my people at their merrymaking? asked the king. We did not attack them, answered Thorin. We came to beg, because we were starving. Where are your friends now, and what are they doing? I don't know, but I expect starving in the forest. What were you doing in the forest, looking for food and drink, because we were starving? But what brought you into the forest at all? asked the king angrily, at that Thorin shut his mouth and would not say another word. Very well, said the king. Take him away and keep him safe, until he feels inclined to tell the truth, even if he waits a hundred years. Then the elves put thongs on him 
and shut him in one of the inmost caves with strong wooden doors, and left him. They gave him food and drink, plenty of both, if not very fine, for wood elves were not goblins, and were reasonably well behaved even to their worst enemies when they captured them. Chapter 8 Barrels Out of Bon That day Bilbo and the dwarves made one last despairing effort to find a way out before they died of hunger and thirst. They got up and staggered on in the direction which eight out of the thirteen of them guessed to be the one in which the path lay, but they never found out if they were right. Such day as there ever was in the forest was fading once more into the blackness of night, when suddenly out sprang the light of many torches all round them, like hundreds of red stars. Out leaped wood elves with their bows and spears and called the dwarves. There was no thought of a fight. Even if the dwarves had not been in such a state that they were actually glad to be captured, their small knives would have been of no use against the arrows of the elves that could hit a bird's eye in the dark. So they simply stopped dead and sat down and waited in wall except Bilbo, who popped on his ring and slipped quickly to one side. That is why, when the elves bound the dwarves in a long line, one behind the other, and counted them, it nor did they hear or feel him trotting along well behind their torchlight as they led off their prisoners into the forest. Each dwarf was blindfold, but that did not make much difference, for even Bilbo with the use of his eyes could not see where they were going, and neither he nor the others knew where they had started from anyway. Bilbo had all he could do to keep up with the torches, for the elves were making. The dwarves go as fast as ever they could, sick and weary as they were. The king had ordered them to make haste. Suddenly the torches stopped, and the hobbit had just time to catch them up before they began to cross the bridge. This was the bridge that led across the river to the king's doors. The water flowed dark and swift and strong beneath, and at the far end were gates before the mouth of a huge cave that ran into the side of a steep slope covered with trees. There the great beaches came right down to the bank, till their feet were in the stream. Across this bridge, the elves thrust their prisoners, but Bilbo hesitated in the room. He did not at all like the look of the cavern mouth, and he only made up his mind not to desert his friends just in time to scuttle over at the heels of the last elves before the great gates of the king closed behind them with a clang. Inside the passages were lit with red torchlight, and the elf guards sang as they marched along the twisting, crossing, and echoing paths. These were not like those of the goblin cities. For they were smaller, yeah, in a great hall with pillars. Hewn out of the living stone sat the elven king on a chair of carven wood. On his head was a crown of berries and red leaves, for the autumn was come again. In the spring he wore a crown of woodland flowers. In his hand he held a carven staff of oak. The prisoners were brought before him, and though he looked grimly at them, he told his men to unbind them, for they were ragged and weary. Besides, they need no ropes in here, said he. There is no escape from my magic doors for those who are once brought inside. Long and searchingly he questioned the dwarves about their doings, and where they were going to and where they were coming from, but he got little more news out of them than out of Thorin. They were surly and angry, and did not even pretend to be polite. What have we done, O king? said Balin, who was the oldest left. Is it a crime to be lost in the forest, to be hungry and thirsty? Such a question, of course, made the king angrier than ever, and he answered, It is a crime to wander in my realm without leave. Do you forget that you were in my kingdom, using the road that my people made? Did you not three times pursue and trouble my people in the forest? After all the disturbance you have made, I have a right to know what brings you here. And if you will not tell me now, I will keep you all in prison until you have learned sense and manners. Then he ordered the dwarves each to be put in a separate cell, and to be given food and drink, but not to be allowed to pass the doors of their little prisons until one at least of them was willing to tell him all he wanted to know, but he did not tell them that Thorin was also a prisoner with him. It was Bilbo who found that out. Poor Mr. Baggins, it was a weary long time that he lived in that place all alone, and always in hiding, never daring to take off his ring, 
hardly daring to sleep, even tucked away in the darkest and remotest corners he could find. He did not wish to desert the dwarves, and indeed he did not know where in the world to go without them. Besides, inside the caves he could pick up a living of some sort by stealing food from store or table when no one was at hand. I am like a burglar that can't get away, but must go on miserably burbling the same house day after day, he thought. Eventually, after a week or two of this sneaking sort of life, by watching and following the guards and taking what chances he could, he managed to find out where each dwarf was kept. He found all their twelve cells in different parts of the palace, and after a time he got to know his way about very well. What was his surprise one day to overhear some of the guards talking, and to learn that there was another dwarf in prison too, in a specially dark place. He guessed at once, of course, that that was Thorin, and after a while he found that his guess was right. At last, after many difficulties, he managed to find the place when no one was about, and to have a word with the chief of the dwarves. Thorin was too wretched to be angry any longer at his misfortunes, and was even beginning to think of telling the king all about his treasure and his quest which shows how low-spirited he had become. When he heard Bilbo's little voice at his keyhole, he could hardly believe his ears. Soon, however, he made up his mind that he could not be mistaken, and he came to the door and had a long whispered talk with the hobbit on the other side. So it was that Bilbo was able to take secretly Thorin's message to each of the other imprisoned dwarves, telling them that Thorin their chief was also in prison close at hand, and that no one was to reveal their errand to the king. Not yet. Not before Thorin gave the word, for Thorin had taken heart again and was determined once more not to ransom himself with promises to the king of Cher and the treasure, until all hope of escaping in any other way had disappeared, until in fact the remarkable Mr. Baggins Invisible, of whom he began to have a very high opinion indeed, had altogether failed to think of something clever. The other dwarves quite agreed when they got the message. Bilbo, however, did not feel nearly so hopeful as they did. He did not like being dependent on by everyone, and he wished he had a wizard at hand, but that was no use. Probably all the dark distance of Mirkwood lay between them. He sat and thought and thought until his head nearly burst, but no bright idea would come. One invisible ring was a very fine thing, but it was not much good among fourteen. But of course, as you have guessed, he did rescue his friends in the end. And this is how it happened. One day, nosing and wandering about, Bilbo discovered a very interesting thing. The great gates were not the only entrance to the caves. A stream flowed under part of the lowest regions of the palace, and joined the forest river some way further to the east, beyond the steep slope out of which the main mouth opened. Where this underground watercourse came forth from the hillside, there, there. The rocky roof came down close to the surface of the stream, and from it a portcullis could be dropped right to the bed of the river to prevent anyone coming in or out that way. But the portcullis was often open, for a good deal of traffic went out, and in by the water gate, if anyone had come in that way, he would have found himself in a dark rough tunnel leading deep into the heart of the hill. But at one point where it passed under the caves, the roof had been cut away and covered with great oaken trapdoors. These opened upwards into the king's cellars. There stood barrels and barrels and barrels for the wood elves, and especially their king were very fond of wine, though no vines grew in those parts. The wine and other goods were brought from far away, from their kinsfolk in the south, or from the vineyards of men in distant lands. Hiding behind one of the largest barrels, Bilbo discovered the trapdoors and their use, and lurking there, listening to the talk of the king's servants, he learned how the wine and other goods came up the rivers or overland to the long lake. It seemed a town of men still throve there, built out on bridges far into the water as a protection against enemies of all sorts, and especially against the dragon of the mountain. From Lake Town the barrels were brought up the forest river. Often they were just tied together like big rafts and pulled or rowed up the stream. Sometimes they were loaded onto flatboats. When the barrels were empty the elves cast them through the trap doors, opened the water gate, and out the barrels floated on the stream, bobbing along, 
until they were carried by the current to a place far down the river where the bank jutted out, near to the very eastern edge of Mirkwood. There they were collected and tied together and floated back to Lake Town, which stood close to the point where the forest river flowed into the long lake. For some time Bilbo sat and thought about this water gate and wondered if it could be used for the escape of his friends, and at last he had the desperate beginnings of a the evening meal had been taken to the prisoners. The guards were tramping away down the passage taking the torchlight with them and leaving everything in darkness. Then Bilbo heard the king's butler bidding the chief of the guards good night. Now come with me, he said, and taste the new wine that has just come in. I shall be hard at work tonight clearing the cellars of the empty wood, so let us have a drink first to help the labor. Very good, laughed the chief of the guards. I'll taste with you, and see if it is fit for the king's table. There is a feast tonight, and it would not do to send up poor stuff. When he heard this Bilbo was all in a flutter, for he saw that luck was with him, and he had a chance at once to try his desperate plan. He followed the two elves, until they entered a small cellar, and sat down at a table on which two large flagons were soon they began to drink and laugh merrily. Luck of an unusual kind was with Bilbo then. It must be potent wine to make a wood elf drowsy, but this wine, it would seem, was very strong. Very soon the chief guard nodded his head, then he laid it on the table and fell fast asleep. The butler went on talking and laughing to himself for a while without seeming to notice, but soon his head too nodded to the table, and he fell asleep and snored beside his friend. Then in crept the hobbit. Very soon the chief guard had no keys, but Bilbo was trotting as fast as he could along the passages towards the cells. First he unlocked Balin's door, and locked it again carefully as soon as the dwarf was outside. Balin was most surprised, as you can imagine, but glad as he was to get out of his wearisome little stone room, he wanted to stop and ask questions, and know what Bilbo was going to do, and all about it. No time now? said the hobbit. You must follow me. We must all keep together and not risk getting separated. All of us must escape or none, and this is our last chance. If this is found out, goodness knows where the king will put you next, with chains on your hands and feet too, I expect. Don't argue. There's a good fellow. Then off he went from door to door, until his following had grown to twelve. None of them any too nimble. What with the dark, and what with their long imprisonment. Bilbo's heart thumped every time one of them bumped into another, or grunted or whimpered in the dark. Drat this dwarvish racket, he said to himself. But all went well, and they met no guards. As a matter of fact, there was a great autumn feast in the woods that night, and in the halls above. Nearly all the king's folks were merrymaking. At last, after much blundering, they came to Thorin's dungeon far down in a deep place, and fortunately not far from the cellars. Upon my word, said Thorin, when Bilbo whispered to him to come out and join his friends, Gandalf spoke true, as usual. A pretty fine burglar you make, it seems, when the time comes. I am sure we are all forever at your service, whatever happens after this. But what comes next? Bilbo saw that the time had come to explain his idea, as far as he could but he did not feel at all sure how the dwarves would take it. His fears were quite justified, for they did not like it a bit, and started grumbling loudly in spite of their danger. We shall be bruised and battered to pieces, and drowned too, for certain, they muttered. We thought you had got some sensible notion when you managed to get hold of the keys. This is a mad idea. Very well, said Bilbo very downcast, and also rather annoyed. Come along back to your nice cells, and I will lock you all in again, and you can sit there comfortably and think of a better plan. But I don't suppose I shall ever get hold of the keys again, even if I feel inclined to try. That was too much for them, and they calmed down. In the end, of course, they had to do just what Bilbo suggested, because it was obviously impossible for them to try and find their way into the upper halls, or to fight their way out of gates that closed by magic and it was no good grumbling in the passages until they were caught again. So following the hobbit, down into the lowest cellars they crept. 
They passed a door through which the chief of guard and the butler could be seen still happily snoring with smiles upon their faces. There would be a different expression on the face of the chief guard next day, even though Bilbo, before they went on, stole in and kind-heartedly put the keys back on his belt. Balin was told off to watch the guard and the butler and give warning if they stirred. The rest went into the adjoining cellar with trapdoors. There was little time to lose, before long, as Bilbo knew. Some elves were under orders to come down and help the butler get the empty barrels through the doors into the stream. These were in fact already standing in rows in the middle of the floor waiting to be pushed off. They soon found thirteen with room enough for a dwarf in each. In fact, some were too roomy, and as they climbed in the dwarves thought anxiously of the shaking and the bumping they would get inside, though Bilbo did his best to find straw and other stuff to pack them in as cosily as could be managed in a short time. At last twelve dwarves were stowed. Thorin had given a lot of trouble and turned, and twisted in his tub and grumbled like a large dog in a small kennel, while Balin who came last, made a great fuss about his air holes and said he was stifling. Even before his lid was on, Bilbo had done what he could to close holes in the sides of the barrels, and to fix on all the lids as safely as could be managed, and now he was left alone again, running around putting the finishing touches to the packing, and hoping against hope that his plan would come off. It had not been a bit too soon. Only a minute or two after Balin's lid had been fitted on there came the sound of voices and the flicker of lights. A number of elves came laughing and talking into the cellars and singing snatches of song. They had left a merry feast in one of the halls and were bent on returning as fast as they could. "'Where's old Galian, the butler?' said one. "'I haven't seen him at the tables tonight. He ought to be here now to show us what is to be done. Ha, <sighs> ha came a cry. Here's the old villain with his head on a jug. He's been having a little feast all to himself and his friend the captain. Shake him, wake him, shouted the others impatiently. Galian was not at all, pleased at being shaken or wakened, and still less at being laughed at. You're all late, he grumbled. Here am I waiting and waiting down here while you fellows drink and make merry and forget your tasks? Small wonder if I fall asleep from weariness. Save us, Galian, cried some. You began your feasting early and muddled your wits. You have stacked some full casks here instead of the empty ones, if there is anything in wait. Get on with the work, growled the butler. There is nothing in the feeling of weight in an idle tosspot's arms. These are the ones to go and no others. Very well. Very well, they answered, rolling the barrels to the opening. On your head be it, if the king's full butter tubs and his best wine is pushed into the river for the lake to feast on for nothing. One barrel, and another rumbled to the dark opening, and was pushed over into the cold water some feet below. Some were barrels really empty, some were tubs neatly packed with a dwarf each, but down they all went, one after another, with many a clash and a bump thudding on top of ones below, smacking into the water, jostling against the walls of the tunnel, knocking into one another, and bobbing away down the current. It was just at this moment that Bilbo suddenly discovered the weak point in his plan. Most likely you saw it some time ago and have been laughing at him, but I don't suppose you would have done half as well yourself in his place. Of course he was not in a barrel himself, nor was there anyone to pack him in even if there had been a chance. It looked as if he would certainly lose his friends. This time nearly all of them had already disappeared through the dark trapdoor, and get utterly left behind and have to stay lurking as a permanent burglar in the elf caves forever, for even if he could have escaped through the upper gates at once, he had precious small chance of ever finding the dwarves again. Now the very last barrel was being rolled to the doors. In despair and not knowing what else to do, Poor little Bilbo caught hold of it and was pushed over the edge with it. Down into the water he fell, splash, into the cold, dark water with the barrel on top of him. He came up again spluttering and clinging to the wood like a rat, but for all his efforts he could not scramble on top. Every time he tried, the barrel rolled round and ducked him under again. 
It was really empty and floated light as a cord. He was in the dark tunnel, floating in icy water all alone. For you cannot count friends that are all packed up in barrels. Very soon a gray patch came up in the darkness ahead. He heard the creak of the water gate being hauled up, and he found that he was in the midst of a bobbing and bumping mass of casks and tubs all pressing together to pass under the arch and get out into the open stream. He had as much as he could do to prevent himself from being hustled and battered to bits. But at last the jostling crowd began to break up and swing off, one by one, under the stone arch, and out. They went under the overhanging branches of the trees on either bank. Bilbo wondered what the dwarves were feeling and whether a lot of water was getting into their tubs. Some of those that bobbed along by him in the gloom seemed pretty low in the water, and he guessed that these had dwarves inside. I do hope I put the lids on tight enough, he thought, but before long he was worrying too much about himself to remember the dwarves. He managed to keep his head above the water, but he was shivering with the cold and wondered if he would die of it before the luck turned, and how much longer he would be able to hang on, and whether he should risk the chance of letting go and trying to swim to the bank. In this way at last Mr. Baggins came to a place where the trees on either hand grew thinner. He could see the paler sky between them. The dark river opened suddenly wide, and there it was joined to the main water of the forest river flowing down in haste from the king's great doors. There was a dim sheet of water no longer overshadowed, and on its sliding surface there were dancing and broken reflections of clouds and of stars. Then the hurrying water of the forest river swept all the company of casks and tubs away to the north bank, in which it had eaten out a wide bay. This had a shingly shore under hanging banks and was walled at the eastern end by a little jutting cape of hard rock. On the shallow shore most of the barrels ran aground, though a few went on to bump against the stony pier. There were people on the lookout on the banks. They quickly pulled and pushed all the barrels together into the shallows, and when they had counted them they roped them together and left them till the morning. Poor dwarves. Bilbo was not so badly off now. He slipped from his barrel and waded ashore, and he actually dozed a little on some dry leaves, even though the year was getting late and the air was chilly. He woke again with a loud sneeze. It was already gray morning, and there was a merry racket down by the river. They were making up a raft of barrels, and the raft elves would soon be steering it off down the stream to Lake Town. Bilbo sneezed again. He was no longer dripping, but he felt cold all over. He scrambled down as fast as his stiff legs would take him and managed just in time to get onto the mass of casks without being noticed in the general bustle. Luckily, there was no sun at the time to cast an awkward shadow, and for a mercy he did not sneeze again for a good while. There was a mighty pushing of poles. The elves that were standing in the shallow water heaved and shoved. The barrels now all lashed together creaking and off they went at last, slowly at first, until they had passed the point of rock where other elves stood to fend them off with poles, and then quicker and quicker as they caught the main stream and went sailing away down, down towards the lake. They had escaped the dungeons of the king and were through the wood, but whether alive or dead still remains to be seen. Chapter 9 A Warm Welcome the day grew lighter and warmer as they floated along. After a while, the river rounded a steep shoulder of land that came down upon their left. Under its rocky feet like an inland cliff, the deepest stream had flowed lapping and bubbling. Suddenly the cliff fell away. The shores sank. The trees ended. Then Bilbo saw a sight. The lands opened wide about him filled with the waters of the river which broke up and wandered in a hundred winding courses, or halted in marshes and pools dotted with isles on every side, but still a strong water flowed unsteadily through the midst, and far away, its dark head in a torn cloud, there loomed the mountain, its nearest neighbors to the northeast, and the tumbled land that joined it to them could not be seen. All alone it rose and looked across the marshes to the forest, the lonely mountain. Bilbo had come far and through many adventures to see it, and now he did not like the look of it in the least. 
The river seemed to go on and on and on forever, and he was hungry and had a nasty cold in the nose, and did not like the way the mountain seemed to frown at him and threaten him as it drew ever nearer. After a while, however, the river took a more southerly course, and the mountain receded again, and at last, late in the day, the shores grew rocky. The river gathered all its wandering waters together into a deep and rapid flood, and they swept along at great speed. The sun had set when turning with another sweep towards the east. The forest river rushed into the long lake. There it had a wide mouth with stony cliff-like gates, at either side whose feet were piled with shingles, the long lake. Bilbo had never imagined that any water that was not the sea could look so big. It was so wide that the opposite shores looked small and far, but it was so long that its northerly end, which pointed towards the mountain, could not be seen at all. Not far from the mouth of the forest river was the strange town he heard the elves speak of in the king's cellars. It was not built on the shore, though there were a few huts and buildings there, but right out on the surface of the lake, protected from the swirl of the entering river by a promontory of rock which formed a calm bay. A great bridge made of wood ran out to where on huge piles made of forest trees was built a busy wooden town, not a town of elves but of men, who still dared to dwell here under the shadow of the distant dragon mountain. They still throve on the trade that came up the great river from the south, and was carted past the falls to their town. But in the great days of old, when Dale in the north was rich and prosperous, they had been wealthy and powerful, and there had been fleets of boats on the waters, and some were filled with gold and some with warriors in armor, and there had been wars and deeds, which were now only a legend. The rotting piles of a greater town could still be seen along the shores when the water sank in a drought. But men remembered little of all that, though some still sang old songs of the dwarf kings of the mountain, Thror and Thrain of the race of Durin, and of the coming of the dragon, and the fall of the lords of Dale. Some sang, too, that Thror and Thrain would come back one day and gold would flow in rivers through the mountain gates and all that land would be filled with new song and new laughter. But this pleasant legend did not much affect their daily business. As soon as the raft of barrels came in sight, boats rowed out from piles of the town, and voices hailed the raft's steerers, then ropes were cast and oars were pulled, and soon the raft was drawn out of the current of the forest river and towed away round the high shoulder of the rock into the little bay of Lake Town. There it was moored not far from the shoreward head of the great bridge. Soon men would come up from the south and take some of the casks away, and others they would fill with goods they had brought to be taken back up the stream to the wood elves' home. In the meanwhile, the barrels were left afloat while the elves of the raft and the boatmen went to feast in Lake Town. They would have been surprised if they could have seen what happened down by the shore after they had gone and the shades of night had fallen. First of all, a barrel was cut loose by Bilbo and pushed to the shore and opened. Groans came from inside, and out crept a most unhappy dwarf. Wet straw was in his draggled beard. He was so sore and stiff, so bruised and buffeted he could hardly stand or stumble through the shallow water to lie groaning on the shore. He had a famished and a savage look like a dog that has been chained and forgotten in a kennel for a week. It was Thorin, but you could only have told it by his golden chain, and by the color of his now dirty and tattered sky-blue hood with its tarnished silver tassel. In the darkness floundering in the cold water, they had a difficult and very nasty job finding which were the right barrels. Knocking outside and calling only discovered about six dwarves that could answer. They were unpacked and helped ashore where they sat or lay muttering and moaning. They were soaked and bruised and cramped and they could hardly yet realize their release or be properly thankful for it. Dwalin and Balin were two of the most unhappy, and it was no good asking them to help. Before and Beaufort were less knocked about and drier, but they lay down and would do nothing. Philly and Keeley, however, who were young for dwarves, and had also been packed more neatly, with plenty of straw into smaller casks, came out more or less smiling, with only a bruise or two, and, 
stiffness that soon wore off. I hope I never smell the smell of apples again, said Feely. My tub was full of it. To smell apples everlastingly when you can scarcely move and are cold and sick with hunger is maddening. I could eat anything in the wide world now, for hours on end, but not an apple. With the willing help of Feely and Killy, Thorin and Bilbo at last discovered the remainder of the company and got them out. Poor Fat Bomber was asleep or senseless. Dory Nori, Ori, Owen and Gloin were waterlogged and seemed only half alive. They all had to be carried one by one and laid helpless on the shore. Well, here we are, said Thorin, and I suppose we ought to thank our stars and Mr. Baggins. I am sure he has a right to expect it, though I wish he could have arranged a more comfortable journey. Still, all very much at your service once more, Mr. Baggins. No doubt we shall feel properly grateful when we are fed and recovered. In the meanwhile, what next? I suggest Lake Town, said Bilbo. What else is there? Nothing else could, of course, be suggested. So leaving the others, Thorin and Feely and Killy and the Hobbit went along the shore to the Great Bridge. There were guards at the head of it but they were not keeping very careful watch, for it was so long since there had been any real need. Their astonishment was enormous when Thorin Oakenshield stepped in through the door. Who are you, and what do you want? They shouted, leaping to their feet and groping for weapons. Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thror, king under the mountain, said the dwarf in a loud voice, and he looked it, in spite of his torn clothes and draggled hood. The gold gleamed on his neck and waist. His eyes were dark and deep. I have come back. I wish to see the master of your town. Then there was tremendous excitement. Some of the more foolish ran out of the hut as if they expected the mountain to go golden in the night and all of the waters of the lake to turn yellow right away. The captain of the guard came forward. And who are these? he asked, pointing to Feely and Killy and Bilbo. The sons of my father's daughter, answered Thorin, Feely and Keely of the race of Durin, and Mr. Baggins who has traveled with us out of the west. If you come in peace, lay down your arms, said the captain. We have none, said Thorin, and it was true enough. Their knives had been taken from them by the wood elves, and the great sword or Christ too. Bilbo had his short sword, hidden as usual, but he said nothing about that. We have no need of weapons, who return at last to our own as spoken of old. Nor could we fight against so many. Take us to your master. Follow me then, said the captain, and with six men about them, he led them over the bridge through the gates and into the market place of the town. This was a wide circle of quiet water surrounded by the tall piles on which were built the greater houses and by long wooden quays with many steps and ladders going down to the surface of the lake. From one great hall shone many lights, and there came the sound of many voices. They passed its doors and stood blinking in the light, looking at long tables filled with folk. I am Thorin son of Thrain son of Thror king under the mountain, cried Thorin in a loud voice from the door. Before the captain could say anything, all leaped to their feet. The master of the town sprang from his great chair, but none rose in greater surprise than the raft men of the elves who were sitting at the lower end of the hall. Pressing forward before the master's table, they cried, These are prisoners of our king that have escaped, wandering vagabond dwarves that could not give any good account of themselves, sneaking through the woods and molesting our people. Is this true? asked the master. As a matter of fact, he thought it far more likely than the return of the king under the mountain, if any such person had ever existed. It is true that we were wrongfully waylaid by the elven king and imprisoned without cause, as we journeyed back to our own land, answered Thorin. But lock nor bar may hinder the homecoming spoken of old, nor is this town in the wood elves realm. I speak to the master of the town of the men of the lake not to the raftmen of the king. Then the master hesitated and looked from one to the other. The elven king was very powerful in those parts, and the master wished for no enmity with him, nor did he think much of old songs, giving his mind to trade and tolls, to cargoes and gold, 
to which habit he owed his position. Others were of different mind, however, and quickly the matter was settled without him. The news had spread from the doors of the hall like fire through all the town. People were shouting inside the hall and outside it. The quays were thronged with hurrying feet. Some began to sing snatches of old songs concerning the return of the king under the mountain, that it was Thror's grandson. Not Thror himself that had come back did not bother them at all. Others took up the song, and it rolled loud and high over the lake. The king beneath the mountains. The king of carven stone. The lord of silver fountains. Shall come into his own. The stream shall run in gladness. The lakes shall shine and burn. All sorrow, fail, and sadness. At the mountain king's return. So they sang, or very like that. Only there was a great deal more ee of it, and there was much shouting as well as the music of harps and of fiddles mixed up with it. Indeed, such excitement had not been known in the town in the memory of the oldest grandfather. As for the master he saw, there was nothing else for it but to obey the general clamor, for the moment at any rate, and to pretend to believe that Thorin was what he said. Soon afterwards the other dwarves were brought into the town amid scenes of astonishing enthusiasm. They were all doctored and fed and housed and pampered in the most delightful and satisfactory fashion. A large house was given up to Thorin and his company. Boats and rowers were put at their service, and crowds sat outside and sang songs all day, or cheered if any dwarf showed so much as his nose. Indeed, within a week they were quite recovered, fitted out in fine cloth of their proper colors, with beards combed and trimmed, and proud steps. Thoring looked and walked as if his kingdom was already regained, and smog chopped up into little pieces. At the end of a fortnight, Thorin began to think of departure. While the enthusiasm still lasted in the town was the time to get help. It would not do to let everything cool down with delay. So he spoke to the master and his counselors, and said that soon he and his company must go on towards the mountain. Then for the first time the master was surprised and a little frightened, and he wondered if Thorin was after all really a descendant of the old kings. He had never thought that the dwarves would actually dare to approach Smog, but believed they were frauds who would sooner or later be discovered and be turned out. He was wrong. Thorin, of course, was really the grandson of the king under the mountain, and there is no knowing what a dwarf will not dare and do for revenge or the recovery of his own. But the master was not sorry at all to let them go. They were expensive to keep, and their arrival had turned things into a long holiday in which business was at a standstill. Let them go and bother Smog, and see how he welcomes them, he thought. Certainly, O Thorin Thrain's son through his son, was what he said. You must claim your own. The hour is at hand, spoken of old. What help we can offer shall be yours, and we trust to your gratitude when your kingdom is regained. So one day, Although autumn was now getting far on, and winds were cold, and leaves were falling fast, three large boats left Lake Town, laden with rowers, dwarves, Mr. Baggins, and many provisions, horses and ponies had been sent round by circuitous paths to meet them at their appointed landing place. The master and his counselors bade them farewell from the great steps of the town hall that went down to the lake. People sang on the quays and out of windows. The white oars dipped and splashed, and off they went north up the lake on the last stage of their long journey. The only person thoroughly unhappy was Bilbo. Chapter 10 On the Doorstep In two days going, they rode right up the long lake and passed out into the river running, and now they could all see the lonely mountain towering grim and tall before them. The stream was strong, and their going slow. At the end of the third day, some miles up the river, they drew in to the left, a western bank, and disembarked. Here they were joined by the ponies for their own use that had been sent to meet them. They packed what they could on the ponies, and the rest was made into a store under a tent. But none of the men of the town would stay with them even for the night, so near the shadow of the mount. Not at any rate until the songs have come true said they. They spent a cold and lonely night, and their spirits fell. 
The next day they set out again. It was a weary journey and a quiet and stealthy one. There was no laughter or song or sound of harps, and the pride and hopes which had stirred in their hearts at the singing of old songs by the lake died away to a plodding gloom. They knew that they were drawing near to the end of their journey, and that it might be a very horrible end. The land about them grew bleak and barren, though once, as Thorin told them, it had been green and fair. There was little grass, and before long there was neither bush nor tree, and only broken and blackened stumps to speak of ones long vanished. They were come to the desolation of the dragon, and they were come at the waning of the year. They reached the skirts of the mountain all the same, without meeting any danger or any sign of the dragon other than the wilderness he had made about his lair. The mountain lay dark and silent before them, and ever higher above them, they made their first camp on the western side of the great southern spur, which ended in a height called Raven Hill. On this there had been an old watch post, but they dared not climb it yet. It was too exposed. Before setting out to search the western spurs of the mountain for the hidden door, on which all their hopes rested, Thorin sent out a scouting expedition to spy out the land, to the south, where the front gates stood. For this purpose he chose Balin and Feely and Kaylee, and with them went Bilbo. They marched under the grey and silent cliffs to the feet of Ravenhill. There the river, after winding a wide loop over the valley of Dale, turned from the mountain on its road to the lake, flowing swift and noisily. Its bank was bare and rocky, tall and steep above the stream, and they could see in the wide valley shadowed by the mountain's arms the grey ruins of ancient houses, towers, and walls. There lies all that is left of Dale, said Balin. The mountain sides were green with woods and all the sheltered valley rich and pleasant in the days when the bells rang in that town. He looked both sad and grim as he said this. He had been one of Thorin's companions on the day the dragon came. They did not dare to follow the river much further towards the gate, but they went on beyond the end of the southern spur, until lying hidden behind a rock, they could look out and see the dark cavernous opening in a great cliff wall between the arms of the mountain, out of it the running river sprang, and out of it too there came a steam and dark smoke. The dragon is still alive, and in the halls under the mountain then, or I imagine so from the smoke, said the hobbit, with gloomy thoughts, followed ever by croaking crows above them, they made their weary way back to the camp. Only in June they had been guests in the fair house of Elrond, and though autumn was now crawling towards winter that pleasant time now seemed years ago, they were alone in the perilous waste without hope of further help. They were at the end of their journey, but as far as ever it seemed, from the end of their quest, none of them had much spirit left. Now strange to say Mr. Baggins had more than the others. He would often borrow Thorin's map and gaze at it, pondering over the runes and the message of the moon letters Elrond had read. It was he that made the dwarves begin the dangerous search on the western slopes for the secret door. They moved their camp then to a long valley, narrower than the great dale in the south, where the gates of the river stood, and walled with lower spurs of the mountain. From this western camp, Shadowed all day by cliff and wall until the sun began to sink towards the forest. Day by day they toiled in parties searching for paths up the mountainside. If the map was true, somewhere high above the cliff at the valley's head must stand the secret door. Day by day they came back to their camp without success. But at last unexpectedly they found what they were seeking. Feely and Keely and the Hobbit went back one day down the valley and scrambled among the tumbled rocks at its southern corner. About midday, creeping behind a great stone that stood like a pillar, Bilbo came on what looked like rough steps going upwards. Following these excitedly, he and the dwarves found traces of a narrow track, often lost, often rediscovered, that wandered on to the top of the southern ridge and brought them at last to a still narrower ledge, which turned north across the Looking down, they saw that they were at the top of the cliff at the valley's head, and were gazing down onto their own camp below, silently, clinging to the rocky wall on their right. 
they went in single file along the ledge, till the wall opened, and they turned into a little steep-walled bay, grassy-floored, still, and cold. It was not a cave and was open to the sky above, but at its inner end a flat wall rose up that in the lower part, close to the ground, was as smooth and upright as Mason's work, but without a joint or crevice to be seen. No sign was there of post or lintel or threshold, nor any sign of bar or bolt or keyhole. Yet they did not doubt that they had found the door at last. They beat on it, they thrust and pushed at it, they implored it to move, they spoke fragments of broken spells of opening, and nothing stirred. At last tired out, they rested on the grass at its feet, and then at evening began their long climb day. There was excitement in the camp that night. In the morning they prepared to move once more. Only Bofur and Bomber were left behind to guard the ponies and such stores as they had brought with them from the river. The others went down the valley and up the newly found paths, and so to the narrower ledge. There they made their third camp, hauling up what they needed from below with rope. Down the same way they were able occasionally to lower one of the more active dwarves, such as Keeley, to exchange such news as there was, or to take a share in the guard below, while Beaufort was hauled up to the higher camp. Meanwhile the others who were busy with the secret of the door had no success. They were too eager to trouble about the runes or moon letters, but tried without resting to discover where exactly in the smooth face of the rock the door was hidden. They had brought picks and tools of many sorts from Lake Town, and at first they tried to use these. But when they struck the stone, the handles splintered and jarred their arms cruelly, and the steel heads broke or bent like lead. Mining work, they saw clearly, was no good against the magic that had shut this door, and they grew terrified, too, of the echoing noise. Bilbo found sitting on the doorstep lonesome and wearisome. There was not a doorstep, of course, really, but they used to call the little grassy space between the wall and the opening the doorstep in fun, remembering Bilbo's words long ago at the unexpected party in his hobbit hole, when he said they could sit on the doorstep till they thought of something, and sit and think they did, or wandered aimlessly about, and glummer and glummer they became. The hobbit was no longer much brighter than the dwarves. If the dwarves asked him what he was doing, he answered, You said sitting on the doorstep and thinking would be my job, not to mention getting inside, so I am sitting and thinking. But I am afraid he was not thinking much of the job, but of what lay beyond the blue distance, the quiet western land and the hill and his hobbit hole under it. A large grey stone lay in the centre of the grass, and he stared moodily at it or watched the great snails. They seemed to love the little shut-in bay with its walls of cool rock, and there were many of them of huge size crawling slowly and stickily along its sides. Tomorrow begins the last week of autumn, said Thorin one day. And winter comes after autumn, said Bifur. And next year after that, said Dwalin, and our beards will grow till they hang down the cliff to the valley before anything happens here. What is our burglar doing for us? Bilbo heard this, and without answering lifted his head to see a glimpse of the distant forest. As the sun turned west there was a gleam of yellow upon its far roof, as if the light caught the last pale leaves. Soon he saw the orange ball of the sun sinking towards the level of his eyes. He went to the opening, and there pale and faint was a thin new moon above the rim of earth. At that very moment he heard a sharp crack behind him. There on the grey stone in the grass was an enormous thrush, nearly coal-black, its pale yellow breast freckled with dark spots. Crack! It had caught a snail and was knocking it on the stone. Crack! Crack! Suddenly Bilbo understood. Forgetting all danger, he stood on the ledge and hailed the dwarves, shouting and waving. Those that were nearest came tumbling over the rocks, and as fast as they could along the ledge to him wondering what on earth was the matter. Quickly Bilbo explained. They all fell silent, the hobbit standing by the grey stone, and the dwarves with wagging beards watching impatiently. The sun sank into a belt of reddened cloud and disappeared. The dwarves groaned, but still Bilbo stood almost without moving. The little moon was dipping to the horizon. 
evening was coming on. Then suddenly, when their hope was lowest, a red ray of the sun escaped like a finger through a rent in the cloud. A gleam of light came straight through the opening into the bay and fell on the smooth rock face. The old thrush, who had been watching from a high perch with beady eyes and head cocked on one side, gave a sudden trill. There was a loud crack. A flake of rock split from the wall and fell. A hole appeared suddenly about three feet from the ground. Quickly, trembling lest the chance should fade, the dwarves rushed to the rock and pushed. The key, shouted Bilbo, the key that went with the map. Try it now while there is still time. Then Thorin stepped up and drew the key on its chain from round high neck. He put it to the hole. It fitted and it turned. Snap! The gleam went out. The sun sank. The moon was gone, and evening sprang into the sky. Now they pushed together, and slowly a part of the rock wall gave way. Long, straight cracks appeared and widened. A door five feet high and three broad was outlined, and slowly, without a sound, swung inwards. It seemed as if darkness flowed out, like a vapor from the hole in the mountainside, and deep darkness in which nothing could be seen lay before their eyes. A yawning mouth, Leading in and down. Chapter 11 Inside Information For a long time the dwarves stood in the dark before the door and debated, until at last, now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proved himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit full of courage and resource far exceeding his size and if I may say so possessed of good luck far exceeding the usual allowance, now is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn his reward. You are familiar with Thorin's style on important occasions, but Bilbo felt impatient. By now he was quite familiar with Thorin too, and he knew what he was driving at. If you mean you think it is my job to go into the secret passage first, O Thorin Thrain's son Oakenshield, may your beard grow ever longer, he said crossly, say so at once and have done. I might refuse. I've got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain, so that I am, I think, already owed some reward. But third time pays for alls, as my father used to say, and somehow I don't think I shall refuse. Perhaps I have begun to trust my luck more than I used to in the old days. Now, who is coming with me? He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he was not disappointed. Feely and Killy looked uncomfortable and stood on one leg, but the others made no pretense of offering, except old Balin, the lookout man who was rather fond of the hobbit. He said he would come inside at least, and perhaps a bit of the way too, ready to call for help if necessary. The stars were coming out behind him in a pale sky barred with black when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. This was no goblin entrance or rough wood elf's cave. It was a passage made by dwarves at the height of their wealth and skill. Straight as a ruler, smooth-floored and smooth-sided, going with a gentle, never-varying slope direct to some distant end in the blackness below. After a while Balin bade Bilbo good luck, and stopped where he could still see the faint outline of the door, and by a trick of the echoes of the tunnel hear the rustle of the whispering voices of the others just outside. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring, and warned by the echoes to take more than hobbits care to make no sound. He crept noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. He was trembling with fear. But his little face was set and grim already. He was a very different hobbit from the one that had run out without a pocket handkerchief from Bag End long ago. He had not had a pocket handkerchief for ages. He loosened his dagger in its sheath, tightened his belt, and went. soon he thought it was beginning to feel warm. Is that a kind of a glow I seem to see coming right ahead down there? He thought. It was. As he went forward it grew and grew, till there was no doubt about it. It was a red light steadily getting redder and redder. Also, it was now undoubtedly hot in the tunnel. Wisps of vapor floated up and passed him, and he be a sound, too, began to throb in his ears, 
a sort of bubbling like the noise of a large pot galloping on the fire, mixed with a rumble as of a gigantic tomcat purring. This grew to the unmistakable gurgling of some vast animal snoring in its sleep down there in the red glow in front of him. You can picture Bilbo coming to the end of the tunnel, an opening of much the same size and shape as the door above. Through it peeps the hobbit's little head. Before him lies the great bottommost cellar or dungeon hall of the ancient dwarves right at the mountain's root. It is almost dark so that its vastness can only be dimly guessed, but rising from the pear side of the rocky floor there is a great glow, the glow of smog. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. Thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red stained in the ruddy light. Smog lay, with wings folded like an immeasurable bat turned partly on one side, so that the hobbit could see his underparts and his long pale belly crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long lying on his costly bed. Behind him where the walls were nearest could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging and there in rows stood great jars and vessels filled with a wealth that could not be guessed. Bilbo gazed for what seemed an age, before drawn almost against his will, he stole from the shadow of the doorway across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace, even in his sleep. He grasped a great two-handled cup as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upwards. Smog stirred a wing, opened a claw, the rumble of his snoring changed its note. Then Bilbo fled, but the dragon did not wake, not yet but shifted into other dreams of greed and violence, lying there in his stolen hall, while the little hobbit toiled back up the long tunnel. His heart was beating, and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup, and his chief thought was, I've done it. Balin was overjoyed to see the hobbit again, and as delighted as he was surprised, he picked Bilbo up and carried him out into the open air. It was midnight and clouds had covered the stars, but Bilbo lay with his eyes shut, gasping and taking pleasure in the feel of the fresh air again, and hardly noticing the excitement of the dwarves, or how they praised him, and patted him on the back and put themselves and all their families for generations to come at his service. The dwarves were still passing the cup from hand to hand and talking delightedly of the recovery of their treasure, when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath, as if it was an old volcano that had made up its mind to start eruptions once again. The door behind them was pulled nearly to and blocked from closing with a stone, but up the long tunnel came the dreadful echoes from far down in the depths of a bellowing and a trampling that made the ground beneath them tremble. The dragon had passed from an uneasy dream to a doze, and from a doze to wide waking. He stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cup. Thieves. Fire. Murder. Such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passes description, the sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but have never before used or wanted. His fire belched forth, the hall smoked, he shook the mountain root, he thrust his head in vain at the little hole, and then coiling his length together, roaring like thunder underground, he sped from his deep lair through its great door, out into the huge passages of the mountain palace, and up towards the front gate, to hunt the whole mountain till he had caught the thief, and had torn and trampled him, was his one thought. He issued from the gate. The waters rose in fierce, whistling steam, and up he soared blazing into the air and settled on the mountain top in a spout of green and scarlet flame. The dwarves heard the awful rumor of his flight, and they crouched against the walls of the grassy terrace cringing under boulders, hoping somehow to escape the frightful eyes of the hunting dragon. There they would have all been killed, 
if it had not been for Bilbo once again. Quick, quick, he gasped. The door, the tunnel, it's announced by these words. They were just about to creep inside the tunnel when Bifur gave a cry. My cousins, Bomber and Beaufort, we have forgotten them. They are down in the valley. They will be slain, and all our ponies too, and all our stores lost, moaned the others. Nonsense, said Thorin, recovering his dignity. We cannot leave them. Get inside Mr. Baggins and Balin, and you two Feely and Keely. The dragon shan't have all of us. Now you others, where... Those were perhaps the worst moments they had been through yet. The horrible sounds of Smog's anger were echoing in the stony hollows far above. At any moment he might come blazing down a fly whirling round and find them there, near the perilous cliff's edge hauling madly on the ropes. Up came Beaufort, and still all was safe. Up came Bomber, puffing and blowing, while the ropes creaked and still all was safe. Up came some tools and bundles of stores, and then danger was upon them. A whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of standing rocks. The dragon came. They had barely time to fly back to the tunnel, pulling and dragging in their bundles, when smog came hurtling from the north, licking the mountain sides with flame, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before the door and drove in through the crack. They had left and scorched them as they lay head. Flickering fires leaped up and black rock shadows danced. Then darkness fell as he passed again. The ponies screamed with terror, burst their ropes, and galloped wildly off. The dragon swooped and turned to pursue them, and was gone. That'll be the end of our poor beasts, said Thorin. Nothing can escape Smog once he sees it. Here we are, and here we shall have to stay, unless anyone fancies tramping the long open miles back to the river with Smog on the wall. It was not a pleasant thought. They crept further down the tunnel, and there they lay and shivered, though it was warm and stuffy, until dawn came pale through the crack of the door. Every now and again through the night they could hear the roar of the flying dragon grow, and then pass and fade, as he hunted round and round the mountain sides. He guessed from the ponies, and from the traces of the camps he had discovered, that men had come up from the river and the lake and had scaled the mountainside from the valley where the ponies had been standing, but the door withstood his searching eye, and the little high-walled bay had kept out his fiercest flames. Long he had hunted in vain till the dawn chilled his wrath, and he went back to his golden couch to sleep, and to gather new strength he would not forget or forgive the theft, not if a thousand years turned him to smoldering stone, but he could afford to wait. Slow and silent, he crept back to his lair and half closed his eyes. When morning came the terror of the dwarves grew less. They realized that dangers of this kind were inevitable in dealing with such a guardian, and that it was no good giving up their quest yet. What then do you propose we should do, Mr. Baggins? asked Thorin politely. Well, if you really want my advice, I should say we can do nothing but stay where we are. By day we can no doubt creep out safely enough to take the air. Perhaps before long one or two could be chosen to go back to the store by the river and replenish our supplies. But in the meanwhile everyone ought to be well inside the tunnel. Night. Now I will make you an offer. I will creep down this very noon. Then if ever Smog ought to be napping, and see what he is up to. Perhaps something will turn up. Every worm has his weak point. As my father used to say, though I am sure it was not from personal experience, naturally the dwarves accepted the offer eagerly. Already they had come to respect little Bilbo. Now he had become the real leader in their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. The sun was shining when he started, but it was as dark as night in the tunnel. The light from the door, almost closed, soon faded as he went down. So silent was his going that smoke on a gentle wind could hardly have surpassed it, and he was inclined to feel a bit proud of himself as he drew near the lower door. There was only the very faintest glow to be seen. Old Smog is weary and asleep, he thought. He can't see me and he won't hear me. 
Cheer up, Bilbo. He had forgotten or had never heard about Dragon's sense of smell. It is also an awkward fact that they keep half an eye open watching while they sleep, if they are suspicious. Smog certainly looked fast asleep, almost dead and dark, with scarcely a snore more than a whiff of unseen steam. When Bilbo peeped once more from the entrance, he was just about to step out onto the floor when he caught a sudden thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smog's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. He was watching the tunnel entrance. Hurriedly, Bilbo stepped back and blessed the luck of his ring. Then Smog spoke. Well, thief, I smell you and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along. Help yourself again. There is plenty and to spare. But Bilbo was not quite so unlearned in dragon lore as all that, and if Smog hoped to get him to come nearer so easily, he was disappointed. No, thank you. Oh, Smog the Tremendous, I did not come for presents. I only wished to have a look at you and see if you were truly as great as tales say. I did not believe them. Do you now? said the dragon, somewhat flattered, even though he did not believe a word of it. Truly songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality. O oh, Smog, the chiefest and greatest of calamities, replied Bilbo. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar, said the dragon. You seem familiar with my name, but I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you, and where do you come from, may I ask? You may indeed. I come from under the hill, and under the hills, and over the hills my paths led. And through the air, I am he that walks unseen. So I can well believe, said Smog, but that is hardly your usual name. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them, and draws them alive again from the water. These don't sound so creditable, scoffed Smog. I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer, and I am barrel rider, went on Bilbo, beginning to be pleased with his riddling. That's better, said Smog, but don't let your imagination run away with you. This, of course, is the way to talk to dragons if you don't want to reveal your proper name, which is wise, and don't want to infuriate them by a flat refusal, which is also very wise. No dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. There was a lot here which Smog did not understand at all. I expect you do, since you know all about Bilbo's adventures to which he was referring. But he thought he understood enough, and he chuckled in his wicked inside. I thought so last night, he smiled to himself. Lake men? Some nasty scheme of those miserable tub-trading lake men? Or I'm a lizard? I haven't been down that way for an age and an age. But I will soon alter that. Very well, O oh, Beryl Rider, he said aloud. Maybe Beryl was your pony's name, and maybe not, though it was fat enough. You may walk unseen, but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night, and I shall catch, and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice for your goods. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Dwarves said Bilbo in pretended surprise. Don't talk to me, said Smog. I know the smell and taste of dwarf. No one better. Don't tell me that I can eat a dwarf-ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends, thief barrel rider. I don't mind if you go back and tell them so from me. But he did not tell Bilbo that there was one smell he could not make out at all, hobbit smell. It was quite outside his experience and puzzled him mightily. I suppose you got a fair price for that cup last night, he went on. Come now, did you? Nothing at all. Well, that's just like them. Bilbo was now beginning to feel really uncomfortable, but plucking up his courage, he spoke again. You don't know everything, O oh, Smaug the Mighty, said he. Not gold alone brought us hither. We came over hill and under hill by wave and wind for revenge. Surely, O oh Smog the unassessably wealthy, you must realize that your success has made you some bitter enemies? Revenge, snorted Smog. 
and the light of his eyes lit the hall from door to ceiling like scarlet lightning. Revenge. The king under the mountain is dead, and where are his kin that dare seek revenge? Girion, lord of Dale, is dead, and I have eaten his people like a wolf among sheep. And where are his son's sons that dare approach me? I kill where I wish, and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old, and their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I am old and strong, strong, strong thief in the shadows. He gloated. My armor is like tenfold shields. My teeth are swords, my claws spears, the shock of my tail a thunderbolt. My wings a hurricane, and my breath death. I have always understood, said Bilbo in a frightened squeak, that dragons were softer underneath, especially in the region of the E.R. chest, but doubtless one so fortified as thought of that. The dragon stopped short in his boasting. Your information is antiquated, he snapped. I am armored above and below with iron scales and hard gems. No blade can pierce me. The dragon rolled over, he said. What do you say to that? Dazzlingly marvelous. Perfect. Flawless. Staggering, exclaimed Bilbo aloud. But what he thought inside was old fool. Why, there is a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bare as a snail out of its shell. After he had seen that Mr. Baggins' one idea was to get away. Well, I really must not detain your magnificence any longer, he said, or keep you from much needed rest. Ponies take some catching, I believe, after a long start. And so do burglars, he added as a parting shot, as he darted back and fled up the tunnel. It was an unfortunate remark for the dragon spouted terrific flames after him, and fast, though he sped up the slope, he had not gone nearly far enough to be comfortable before the ghastly head of smog was thrust against the opening behind. Luckily, the whole head and jaws could not squeeze in, but the nostrils sent forth fire and vapor to pursue him, and he was nearly overcome, and stumbled blindly on in great pain and fear. He had been feeling rather pleased with the cleverness of his conversation with smog, but his mistake at the end shook him into better sense. Never laugh at live dragons, Bilbo, you fool, he said to himself, and it became a favorite saying of his later and passed into a proverb. You aren't nearly through this adventure yet, he added, and that was pretty true as well. The afternoon was turning into evening when he came out again and stumbled and fell in a faint on the door. The dwarves revived him and doctored his scorches as well as they could and did their best to cheer him up, and they were eager for his story, especially wanting to know why the dragon had made such an awful noise and how Bilbo had escaped. Why that has happened? cried the dwarves. Do get on with your tale? So Bilbo told them all he could remember, and he confessed that he had a nasty feeling that the dragon guessed too much from his riddles, added to the camps and the ponies. I am sure he knows we came from Lake Town and had help from there, and I have a horrible feeling that his next move may be in that direction. I wish to goodness I had never said that about Barrel Rider. It would make even a blind rabbit in these parts think of the lake men. Well, well, it cannot be helped, and it is difficult not to slip in talking to a dragon or so I have always heard said Balin, anxious to comfort him. I think you did very well, if you ask me. You found out one very useful thing at any rate, and got home alive, and that is more than most can say who have had words with the likes of smog. It may be a mercy and a blessing yet to know of the bare patch in the old worm's diamond waistcoat that turned the conversation, and they all began discussing dragon slayings historical, dubious, and the general opinion was that catching a dragon napping was not as easy as it sounded, and the attempt to stick one or prod, one asleep was more likely to end in disaster than a bold frontal attack. All the while they talked the thrush listened, till at last when the stars began to peep forth, it silently spread its wings and flew away, and all the while they talked, and the shadows lengthened Bilbo, became more and more unhappy, and his foreboding grew. At last, he interrupted them. I am sure we are very unsafe here, he said, and I don't see the point of sitting here. The dragon has withered all the pleasant green, and anyway the night has come, and it is cold. 
but I feel it in my bones that this place will be attacked again. Smile knows now how I came down to his hall, and you can trust him to guess where the other end of the tunnel is. He will break all this side of the mountain to bits, if necessary, to stop up our entrance, and if we are smashed with it, the better he will like it. Smog will be coming out at any minute now, and our only hope is to get well in the tunnel and shut the door. He seemed so much in earnest that the dwarves at last did as he said, though they delayed shutting the door. It seemed a desperate plan, for no one knew whether or how they could get it open again from the inside, and the thought of being shut in a place from which the only way out led through the dragon's lair was not one they liked. Also, everything seemed quite quiet, both outside and down the tunnel. So for a longish while they sat inside not far from the half-open door and went on talking. The talk turned to the great horde itself and to things that Thorin and Balin remembered. They wondered if they were still lying there unharmed in the hall below. Shields made for warriors long dead. The great golden cup of Thror, two-handed, hammered and carven with birds and flowers whose eyes and petals were of jewels. Coats of mail gilded and silvered and impenetrable, the necklace of Geryon, Lord of Dale, made of five hundred emeralds green as grass. But fairest of all was the great white gem which the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain, the heart of the mountain, the Arkenstone of Thrain, the Arkenstone, the Arkenstone, murmured Thorin in the dark, half dreaming with his chin upon his knees. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. But the enchanted desire of the horde had fallen from Bilbo. All through their talk he was only half listening to them. He sat nearest to the door with one ear cocked for any beginnings of a sound without. His other was alert for echoes, beyond the murmurs of the dwarves, for any whisper of a movement from far below. Darkness grew deeper and he grew ever more uneasy. Shut the door. He begged them. I fear that dragon in my marrow. I like this silence far less than the uproar of last night. Shut the door before it is too late. Something in his voice gave the dwarves an uncomfortable feeling. Slowly, Thorin shook off his dreams, and getting up, he kicked away the stone that wedged the door. Then they thrust upon it, and it closed with a snap and a clang. No trace of a keyhole? was there left on the inside. They were shut in the mountain, and not a moment too soon. They had hardly gone any distance down the tunnel when a blow smote, the side of the mountain like the crash of battering rams made of forest oaks and swung by giants. The rock boomed. The walls cracked and stones fell from the roof on their heads. What would have happened if the door had still been open, I don't like to think. They fled further down the tunnel, glad to be still alive while behind them outside they heard the roar and rumble of Smog's fury. Smog had left his lair in silent stealth, quietly soared into the air, and then floated heavy and slow in the dark like a monstrous crow, down the wind towards the west of the mountain, in the hopes of catching unaware something or somebody there, and of spying the outlet to the passage which the thief had used. This was the outburst of his wrath when he could find nobody and see nothing even where he guessed the outlet must actually be. After he had let off his rage in this way, he felt better, and he thought in his heart that he would not be troubled again from that direction. In the meanwhile, he had further vengeance to take. Barrel rider, he snorted. Your feet came from the waterside, and up the water you came without a doubt. I don't know your smell, but if you are not one of those men of the lake, you had their help. They shall see me and remember who is the real king under the mountain. He rose in fire and went away south towards the running river. Chapter 12 Not at home. In the meanwhile, the dwarves sat in darkness, and utter silence fell about them. Little they ate and little they spoke. They could not count the passing of time, and they scarcely dared to move for the whisper of their voices echoed and rustled in the tunnel. If they dozed, they woke still to darkness and to silence going on unbroken. At last, after days and days of waiting, as it seemed, when they were becoming choked and dazed for want of air, they could bear it no longer. Perrin spoke. Let us try the door, he said. 
I must feel the wind on my face soon or die. I think I would rather be smashed by smog in the open than suffocate in here. So several of the dwarves got up and groped back to where the door had but they found that the upper end of the tunnel had been shattered and blocked with broken rock. Neither key nor the magic it had once obeyed would ever open that door again. We are trapped, they groaned. This is the end. We shall die here. But somehow, just when the dwarves were most despairing, Bilbo felt a strange lightening of the heart, as if a heavy weight had gone from under his waist. Come, come he said. While there's life, there's hope. As my father used to say, and third time pays for all. I am going down the tunnel once again. I have been that way twice when I knew there was a dragon at the other end, so I will risk a third visit when I am no longer sure. Anyway, the only way out is down, and I think this time you had better come with me. In desperation, they agreed, and Thorin was the first to go forward by Bilbo's side. Now do be careful, whispered the hobbit, and as quiet as you can be. There may be no smog at the bottom, but then again there may be. Don't let us take any unnecessary risks. Down, down they went. The dwarves could not, of course, compare with the hobbit in real stealth, and they made a deal of puffing and shuffling which echoes magnified alarmingly, but though every now and again Bilbo and Fear stopped and listened, not a sound stirred below. Near the bottom, as well as he could judge, Bilbo slipped on his ring and went ahead, but he did not need it. The darkness was complete, and they were all invisible, ring or no ring. In fact, so black was it that the hobbit came to the opening unexpectedly, put his hand on air, stumbled forward, and rolled headlong into the hall. There he lay face downwards on the floor and did not dare to get up, or hardly even to breathe, but nothing moved. There was not a gleam of light, unless as it seemed to him, when at last he slowly raised his head. There was a pale white glint above him and far off in the gloom, but certainly it was not a spark of dragon fire, though the worm stench was heavy in the place and the taste of vapor was on his tongue. Bilbo got up and found that he did not know in what direction to turn. Now I wonder what on earth Smog is playing at, he said. He is not at home today or tonight, or whatever it is. I do believe. If Owen and Gloin have not lost their tinder boxes, perhaps we can make a little light and have a look round before the luck turns. Light, he cried. Can anybody make a light? The dwarves, of course, were very alarmed when Bilbo fell forward down the step with a bump into the hall, and they sat huddled just where he had left them at the end of the tunnel. Shh, shh they hissed when they heard his voice, and though that helped the hobbit to find out where they were, it was some time before he could get anything else out of it. But in the end, when Bilbo actually began to stamp on the floor and screamed out a light, at the top of his shrill voice, Thorin gave way, and Owen and Gloin were sent back to their bundles at the top of the tunnel. After a while, a twinkling gleam showed them returning, Owen with a small pine torch alight in his hand, and Gloin with a bundle of others under his arm. Quickly Bilbo trotted to the door and took the torch. The dwarves saw the little dark shape of the hobbit start across the floor, holding his tiny light aloft. Every now and again, while he was still near enough, they caught a glint and a tinkle as he stumbled on some golden thing. The light grew smaller as he wandered away into the vast hall. Then it began to rise, dancing into the air. Bilbo was climbing the great mound of treasure. Soon he stood upon the top, and still went on. Then they saw him halt and stoop for a moment. But they did not know the reason. It was the Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain. So Bilbo guessed from Thorin's description. But indeed there could not be two such gems, even in so marvelous a hoard, even in all the world. Ever as he climbed, the same white gleam had shone before him and drawn his feet towards it. Slowly it grew to a little globe of pallid light. Now as he came near, it was tinged with a flickering sparkle of many colors at the surface, reflected and splintered from the wavering light of his torch. At last he looked down upon it, and he caught his breath. The great jewel shone before his feet of its own inner light, and yet, cut and fashioned by the dwarves, 
who had dug it from the heart of the mountain long ago. It took all light that fell upon it, and changed it into ten thousand sparks of white radiance shot with glints of the rainbow. Suddenly Bilbo's arm went towards it drawn by its enchantment. His small hand would not close about it, for it was a large and heavy gem, but he lifted it, shut his eyes, and put it in his deepest pocket. Now I am a burglar indeed, thought he, but I suppose I must tell the dwarves about it some time. They did say I could pick and choose my own share and I think I would choose this, if they took all the rest. All the same, he had an uncomfortable feeling that the picking and choosing had not really been meant to include this marvelous gem, and that trouble would yet come of it. He went on, until he came to the great doors at the further side, and there a draft of air refreshed him, but it almost puffed out his light. He peeped timidly through, and caught a glimpse of great passages and of the dim beginnings of wide stairs going up into the gloom, and still there was no sight nor sound of smog. He was just going, to turn and go back, when a black shape swooped at him and brushed his face. He squeaked and started, stumbled backwards and fell. His torch dropped head downwards and went out. Only a bat, I suppose and hope, he said miserably, but now what am I to do? which is east, south, north, or west? Thorin, Balin, Oin, Gloin, Philly, Killy, he cried as loud as he could. It seemed a thin little noise in the wide blackness. The light's gone out. Someone come and find me and help me. For a moment, faintly the dwarves heard his small cries, though the only word they could catch was help. Gloin lit several more torches, and then they all crept out one by one, and went along the wall as hurriedly as they could. It was not long before they met Bilbo himself coming back towards them. His wits had quickly returned as soon as he saw the twinkle of their lights. Only a bat and a dropped torch, nothing worse, he said in answer to their questions. Though they were much relieved, they were inclined to be grumpy at being frightened for nothing. But what they would have said, if he had told them at that moment about the Arkenstone, I don't know. The dwarves no longer needed any urging. All were now eager to explore the hall while they had the chance, and willing to believe that, for the present, Smog was away from home. Each now gripped a lighted torch, and as they gazed, first on one side and then on another, they forgot fear and even caution. They spoke aloud and cried out to one another, as they lifted old treasures from the mound or from the wall and held them in the light, caressing and fingering them. They gathered gems and stuffed their pockets, and let what they could not carry fall back through their fingers with a sigh. Thurin was not least among these, but always he searched from side to side for something which he could not find. It was the Arkenstone, but he spoke of it yet to no one. Now the dwarves took down mail and weapons from the walls, and armed themselves. Royal indeed did Thorin look, clad in a coat of gold-plated rings, with a silver-hafted axe in a belt crusted with scarlet stones. Mr. Baggins kept his head more clear of the bewitchment of the horde than the dwarves did. Long before the dwarves were tired of examining the treasures, he became wary of it and sat down on the floor, and he began to wonder nervously what the end of it all would be. I would give a good many of these precious goblets, he thought, for a drink of something cheering out of one of Biren's wooden bowls. Thorin. He cried aloud, What next? We are armed, but what good has any armor ever been before against Smog? The dreadful? This treasure is not yet won back. We are not looking for gold yet, but for a way of escape. You speak the truth, answered Thorin, recovering his wits. Let us go. I will guide you. Not in a thousand years should I forget the ways of this palace. Then he hailed the others, and they gathered together, and holding their torches above their heads, they passed through the gaping doors, not without many at backward glance of longing. Their glittering mail they had covered again with their old cloaks, and their bright helms with their tattered hoods, and one by one they walked behind Thorin, a line of little lights in the darkness that halted often listening in fear once more for any rumor of the dragon's coming. They climbed long stairs, and turned and went down wide echoing ways, 
and turned again and climbed yet more stairs, and yet more stairs again. These were smooth, cut out of the living rock, broad and fair and up. Up the dwarves went, and they met no sign of any living thing, only furtive shadows that fled from the approach of their torches fluttering in the draught. The steps were not made, all of the same, for hobbit legs, and Bilbo was just feeling that he could go on no longer, when suddenly the roof sprang high and far beyond the reach of their torch light. A white glimmer could be seen coming through some opening far above, and the air smelt sweeter. Before them light came dimly through great doors that hung twisted on their hinges and half burned. This is the great chamber of Thror, said Thorin, the hall of feasting and of council. Not far off now is the front gate. They passed through the ruined chamber. Tables were rotting there. Chairs and benches were lying there overturned, charred and decaying. Skulls and bones were upon the floor among flagons and bowls and broken drinking horns and dust. As they came through yet more doors at the further end, a sound of water fell upon their ears, and the gray light grew suddenly more full. There is the birth of the running river, said Thorin. From here it hastens to the gate. Let us follow it. Out of a dark opening in a wall of rock there issued a boiling water, and it flowed swirling in a narrow channel, carved E-L and made straight and deep by the cunning of ancient hands. Beside it ran a stone-paved road, wide and swiftly along this they ran, and round a wide sweeping turn. And behold, before them stood the broad light of day. In front there rose a tall arch, still showing the fragments of old carven work within, worn and splintered and blackened though it was. A misty sun sent its pale light between the arms of the mountain, and beams of gold fell on the pavement at the threshold. They were come to the front gate, and were looking out upon Dale. Well, said Bilbo, I never expected to be looking out of this door, and I never expected to be so pleased to see the sun again, and to feel the wind on my face. But, ow, this wind is cold. Suddenly Bilbo realized that he was not only tired but also very hungry indeed, he said, and so I suppose it is more or less breakfast time, if there is any breakfast to have, but I don't feel that Smog's front doorstep is the safest place for a meal. Do let's go somewhere where we can sit quiet for a bit. Quite right, said Balin, and I think I know which way we should go. We ought to make for the old lookout post at the southwest corner of the mountain. How far is that? asked the hobbit. Five hours march, I should think. It will be rough going. The road from the gate along the left edge of the stream seems all broken up. A hard climb, too, even if the old steps are still there. Dear me, grumbled the hobbit. More walking and more climbing without breakfast. I wonder how many breakfasts and other meals... We have missed inside that nasty, clockless, timeless hole. Come, come, said Thorin, laughing, eh? His spirits had begun to rise again, and he rattled the precious stones in his pockets. Don't call my palace a nasty hole? You wait till it has been cleaned and redecorated? Under the rocky wall to the right there was no path. So on they trudged among the stones on the left side of the river, and the emptiness and desolation soon sobered even Thorin again. After going a short way they struck the old road, and before long came to a deep dell sheltered among the rocks. There they rested for a while, and had such breakfast as they could. After that they went on again. And now the road struck westwards and left of the river, and the great shoulder of the south pointing mountain spur drew ever nearer. At length they reached the hill path. It scrambled steeply up, and they plodded slowly one behind the other, till at last in the late afternoon they came to the top of the ridge and saw the wintry sun going downwards to the west. Here they found a flat place without a wall on three sides, but backed to the north by a rocky face in which there was an opening like a door. From that door there was a wide view east and south and west. Here said Balin. In the old days we used always to keep watchmen, and that door behind leads into a rock, hewn chamber that was made here as a guardroom. 
There were several places like it round the mountain, but there seemed small need for watching in the days of our prosperity, and the guards were made over comfortable, perhaps. Otherwise we might have had longer warning of the coming of the dragon, and things might have been different. Still, here we can now lie hid and sheltered for a while, and can see much without being seen. In the rock chamber there would have been room for a hundred, and there was a small chamber further in, more removed from the cold outside. It was quite des- There they laid their burdens, and some threw themselves down at once and slept, but the others sat near the outer door and discussed their plans. In all their talk they came perpetually back to once. They looked west and there was nothing, and east there was nothing and in the south there was no sign of the dragon, but there was a gathering of very many birds. At that they gazed and wondered, but they were no nearer understanding it when the first cold stars came out. Chapter 13 Fire and Water Now, if you wish, like the dwarves, to hear news of Smog, you must go back again to the evening when he smashed the door and flew off in rage, two days before. The men of the lake town Eskarath were mostly indoors, for the breeze was from the black east and chill, but a few were walking on the quays and watching, as they were fond of doing, the stars shine out from the smooth patches of the lake as they opened in the sky. From their town the lonely mountain was mostly screened by the low hills at the far end of the lake, through a gap in which the running river came down from the north. Only its high peak could they see in clear weather, and they looked seldom at it, for it was ominous and drear even in the light of morning. Now it was lost and gone, blotted in the dark. Suddenly a great light appeared in the low place in the hills, and the northern end of the lake turned golden. The king beneath the mountain, the people shouted, his wealth is like the sun, his silver like a fountain, his rivers golden run, the river is running gold from the mountain. They cried, and everywhere windows were opening and feet were hurrying. There was once more a tremendous excitement and enthusiasm, but a grim-voiced fellow ran hotfoot to the master. The dragon is coming, or I am a fool, he cried. Cut the bridges, to arms. Before long, so great was his speed, they could see the dragon as a spark of fire rushing towards them and growing over huger and more bright and not the most foolish doubted that the prophecies had gone rather wrong. Still, they had a little time. Every vessel in the town was filled with water. Every warrior was armed. Every arrow and dart was ready, and the bridge to the land was thrown down and destroyed. Before the roar of smog's terrible approach grew loud, and the lake rippled red as fire beneath the awful beating of his wings. Amid shrieks and wailing and the shouts of men he came over them, swept towards the bridges and was foiled. The bridge was gone, and his enemies were on an island in deep water, too deep and dark and cool for his liking. If he plunged into it, a vapor and steam would arise enough to cover all the land with a mist for days. But the lake was mightier than he. It would quench him before he could pass through. Murring, he swept back over the town. A hail of dark, arrows leaped up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels, and their shafts fell back kindled by his breath burning and hissing into the lake. No fireworks you ever imagined equaled the sights that night. At the twanging of the bows and the shrilling of the trumpets the dragon's wrath blazed to its height, till he was blind and mad with it. No one had dared to give battle to him for many an age, nor would they have dared now if it had not been for the grim-faced man-bard was his name, who ran to and fro cheering on the archers and urging the master to order them to fight to the last arrow. Fire leaped from the dragon's jaws. He circled for a while high in the air above them lighting all the lake. The trees by the shores shone like copper and like blood with leaping shadows of dense black at their feet. Then down he swooped straight through the arrow storm, reckless in his rage taking no heed to turn his scaly sides towards his foes, seeking only to set their town ablaze. Fire leaped from thatched roofs and wooden beam ends as he hurtled down and passed and round again, though all had been drenched with water before he came. Once more water was flung by a hundred hands, wherever a spark appeared. Back swirled the dragon, 
a sweep of his tail, and the roof of the great house crumbled and smashed down. Flames unquenchable sprang high into the night. Another swoop and another, and another house, and then another sprang a fire and fell. And still no arrow hindered smog or hurt him more than a fly from the marshes. Already men were jumping into the water on every side. Women and children were being huddled into laden boats in the market pool. Weapons were flung down. There was mourning and weeping, where but a little time ago the old songs of mirth to come had been sung about the dwarves. Now men cursed their names. The master himself was turning to his great gilded boat, hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself. Soon all the town would be deserted and burned down to the surface of the lake. That was the dragon's hope. They could all get into boats for all he cared. There he could have fine sport hunting them, or they could stop till they starved. Let them try to get to land, and he would be ready. But there was still a company of archers that held their ground among the burning houses. Their captain was barred, grim-voiced and grim-faced, whose friends had accused him of prophesying floods and poisoned fish, though they knew his worth and courage. He was a descendant in the long line of Jirion, Lord of Dale, whose wife and child had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. Now he shot with a great yew bow, till all his arrows but one were spent. The flames were near him. His companions were leaving him. He bent his bow for the last time. Suddenly out of the dark something fluttered to his shoulder. He started, but it was only an old thrush. Unafraid it perched by his ear, and it brought him news. Marveling he found he could understand its tongue, for he was of the race of Dale. Wait, wait, it said to him. The moon is rising. Look for the hollow of the left breast as he flies and turns above you. And while Bard paused in wonder it told him of tidings up in the mountain and of all that it had heard. Then Bard drew his bowstring to his ear. The dragon was circling back flying low, and as he came the moon rose above the eastern shore and silvered his great wings. Arrow, said the bowman, black arrow, I have saved you to the last. You have never failed me, and always I have recovered you. I had you from my father and he from of old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more lower than ever and as he returned and dived down his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon, but not in one place. The great bow twanged. The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast where the foreleg was flung wide. In it smote and vanished, barb, shaft, and feather. So fierce was its flight, with a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, Smog shot spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high and all on the town he fell. His last throws splintered it to sparks and gleeds. The lake roared in. A vast steam leaped up, white in the sudden dark under the moon. There was a hiss, a gushing whirl, and then silence. And that was the end of Smog and Eskeroth, but not of Bard. The waxing moon rose higher and higher, and the wind grew loud and cold. It twisted the white fog into bending pillars and hurrying clouds and drove it off to the west to scatter in tattered shreds over the marshes before Merc. Then the many boats could be seen dotted dark on the surface of the lake, and down the wind came the voices of the people of Esgaroth, lamenting their lost town and goods and ruined houses. But they had really much to be thankful for, had they thought of it, though it could hardly be expected that they should just then. Three quarters of the people of the town had at least escaped alive. Their woods and fields and pastures and cattle, and most of their boats remained undamaged. Yet the dragon was dead. What that meant they had not yet realized. They gathered in mournful crowds upon the western shores, shivering in the cold wind, and their first complaints and anger were against the master, who had left the town so soon, while some were still willing to defend it. He may have a good head for business, especially his own business, some murmured, but he is no good when anything serious happens, and they praised the courage of Bard in his last mighty shot. If only he had not been killed, they all said, we would make him a king, Bard, 
the dragon shooter of the line of Geryon, alas that he is lost. And in the very midst of their talk, a tall figure stepped from the shadows. He was drenched with watery his black hair hung wet over his face and shoulders, and a fierce light was in his eyes. Bard is not lost, he cried. He died from Eskaroth when the enemy was slain. I am Bard of the line of Geryon. I am the slayer of the dragon. King Bard, King Bard, they shouted, but the master ground his chattering teeth. Geryon was lord of Dale, not king of Eskaroth he said. In the lake town we have always elected masters from among the old and wise, and we have not endured the rule of mere fighting men. Let a king bards go back to his own kingdom. Dale is now freed by his valor, and nothing hinders his return. I am the last man to undervalue Bard the bowman. But why, O oh people? And here the master rose to his feet and spoke very loud and clear. Why do I get all your blame? For what fault am I to be deposed? Who aroused the dragon from his slumber, I might ask? Who obtained of us rich gifts and ample help, and led us to believe that old songs could come true? Who played on our soft hearts and our pleasant fancies? What sort of gold have they sent down the river to reward us? Dragon fire and ruin. From whom should we claim the recompense of our damage, and aid for our widows and orphans? As you see, the master had not got his position for nothing. The result of his words was that for the moment the people quite forgot their idea of a new king, and turned their angry thoughts towards Thorin and his company. Wild and bitter words were shouted from many sides, and some of those who had before sung the old songs loudest were now heard as loudly crying that the dwarves had stirred the dragon up against them deliberately. Fools, said Bard. Why waste words and wrath on those unhappy creatures? Doubtless they perished, first in that fire, before Smog came to Then even as he was speaking, the thought came into his heart of the fabled treasure of the mountain, lying without guard or owner, and he fell suddenly silent. He thought of the master's words, and of Dale rebuilt and filled with golden bells, if he could but find the men. At length he spoke again. This is no time for angry words, master, or for considering weighty plans of change. There is work to do. I will serve you still, though after a while I may think again of your words and go north with any that will follow me. Then he strode off to help in the ordering of the camps and in the care of the sick and the wounded. But the master scowled at his back as he went and remained sitting on the ground. He thought much but said little unless it was to call loudly for men to bring him fire and food. Now, everywhere Bard went he found talk running like fire among the people concerning the vast treasure that was now unguarded. Men spoke of the recompense for all their harm that they would soon get from it, and wealth over and to spare with which to buy rich things from the south, and it cheered them greatly in their plight. That was as well, for the night was bitter and miserable. Shelters could be contrived for few, the master had one, and there was little food even the master went short. Many took ill of wet and cold and sorrow that night, and afterwards died, who had escaped uninjured from the ruin of the town, and in the days that followed there was much sickness and great hunger. Meanwhile Barr took the lead, and ordered things as he wished, though always in the master's name and he had a hard task to govern the people and direct the preparations for their protection and housing. Probably most of them would have perished in the winter that now hurried after autumn, if help had not been to hand. But help came swiftly, for Bard at once had speedy messengers sent up the river to the forest to ask the aid of the king of the elves of the wood, and these messengers had found a host already on the move although it was then only the third day after the fall of Smog. The Elven King had received news from his own messengers and from the birds that loved his folk, and already knew much of what had happened. Very great indeed was the commotion among all things with wings that dwelt on the borders of the desolation of the dragon. The air was filled with circling flocks, and their swift-flying messengers flew here and there across the sky. Above the borders of the forest there was whistling, 
crying and piping far over murkwood tidings spread. Smog is leaves rustled and startled ears were lifted. Even before the Elven King rode forth the news had passed west right to the pine woods of the Misty Mountains. Bjorn had heard it in his wooden house, and the goblins were council in their caves. That will be the last we shall hear of Thorin Oaken. Shield? I fear, said the king. He would have done better to have remained my guest. It is an ill wind all the same, he added. That blows no one any good, for he too had not forgotten the legend of the wealth of Thor. So it was that Bard's messengers found him now marching with many spearmen and bowmen, and crows were gathered thick above him, for they thought that war was awakening again, such as had not been in those parts for a long age. But the king, when he received the prayers of Bard, had pity, for he was the lord of a good and kindly people. So turning his march, which had at first been directed towards the mountain, he hastened now down the river to the long lake. Only five days after the death of the dragon they came upon the shores and looked on the ruins of the town. Their welcome was good, as may be expected, and the men and their master were ready to make any bargain for the future in return for the elven king's aid. Their plans were soon made. With the women and the children, the old and the unfit, the master remained behind, and with him were some men of crafts and many skilled elves and they busied themselves felling trees, and collecting the timber sent down from the forest. Then they set about raising many huts by the shore against the oncoming winter, and also under the master's direction they began the planning of a new town, designed more fair and large even than before. But all the men of arms who were still able, and the most, of the elven king's array, got ready to march north to the mountain. It was thus that in eleven days from the ruin of the town, the head of their host passed the rock gates at the end of the lake and came into the desolate lands. Chapter 14 The Gathering of the Clouds Now we will return to Bilbo and the dwarves. All night one of them had watched, but when morning came they had not heard or seen any sign of danger but ever more thickly the birds were gathering. Their companies came flying from the south, and the crows that still lived about the mountain were wheeling and crying unceasingly above. Something strange is happening, said Thorin. The time has gone for the autumn wanderings, and these are birds that dwell always in the land. There are starlings and flocks of finches, and far off there are many carrion birds as if a battle were afoot. Suddenly Bilbo pointing, there's that old thrush again, he cried. He seems to have escaped when Smaug smashed the mountainside, but I don't suppose the snails have. Sure enough, the old thrush was there, and as Bilbo pointed, he flew towards them and perched on a stone nearby. Then he fluttered his wings and sang. Then he cocked his head on one side, as if to listen, and again he sang, and again he listened. I believe he is trying to tell us something, said Balin, but I cannot follow the speech of such birds. It is very quick and difficult. Can you make it out, Baggins? Not very well, said Bilbo. As a matter of fact, he could make nothing of it at all, but the old fellow seems very excited. I only wish he was a raven, said Balin. There used to be great friendship between them and the people of Thror, and they often brought us secret news and were rewarded with such bright things as they coveted to hide in their dwellings. They live many a year, and their memories are long, and they hand on their wisdom to their children. I knew many among the ravens of the rocks when I was a dwarf lad. This very height was once named Raven Hill, because there was a wise and famous pair, Old Kark and his wife, that lived here above the guard chamber. But I don't suppose that any of that ancient breed linger here no sooner had he finished speaking than the old thrush gave a loud call, and immediately flew away. Before long there was a fluttering of wings, and back came the thrush, and with him came a most decrepit old bird. He was getting blind. He could hardly fly, and the top of his head was bald. He was an aged raven of great size. He lighted stiffly on the ground before them, slowly flapped his wings, and bobbed towards Thorin. 
Thorin son of Thrain, and Balin son of Fundin, he croaked and Bilbo could understand what he said, for he used ordinary language and not bird speech. I am Roas son of Kark. Kark is dead, but he was well known to you once. It is a hundred years and three and fifty since I came out of the egg, but I do not forget what my father told me. Now I am the chief of the great ravens of the mountain. We are, but we remember still the king that was of old. Most of my people are abroad, for there are great tidings in the south. Some are tidings of joy to you, and some you will not think so good. Behold, the birds are gathering back again to the mountain, and to dale from south and east and west, for word has gone out that Smog is dead. Dead, dead, shouted the dwarves. Dead. Then we have been in needless fear, and the treasure is ours. They all sprang up and began to caper about for joy. It was some time before Thorin could bring the dwarves to be silent and listen to the raven's news. At length, when he had told all the tale of the battle he went on, So much for joy, Thorin Oakenshield. You may go back to your halls in safety. All the treasure is yours, yours, for the moment, but many are gathering hither beside the birds. The news of the death of the guardian has already gone far and wide and the legend of the wealth of Thor has not lost in the telling during many years. Many are eager for a share of the spoil. Already a host of the elves is on the way, and carrion birds are with them hoping for battle and slaughter. By the lake men murmur that their sorrows are due to the dwarves, for they are homeless and many have died, and Smog has destroyed their town. They too think to find amends from your treasure, whether you are alive or dead. Your own wisdom must decide your course, but thirteen is small remnant of the great folk of Durin that once dwelt here, and now are scattered far. If you will listen to my counsel, you will not trust the master of the lake men, but rather him that shot the dragon with his bow. Bard is he, which of the race of Dale, of the line of Girion. He is a grim man, but true. We would see peace once more among dwarves and men, and elves after the long desolation but it may cost you dear in gold. I have spoken. Our thanks, Roas Kark's son. You and your people shall not be forgotten, but none of our gold shall thieves take or the violent carry off while we are alive. If you would earn our thanks still more, bring us news of any that draw here. Also, I would beg you, if any of you are still young and strong of wing, that you would send messengers to our kin in the mountains of the north both west from here and east, and tell them of our plight. But go specially to my cousin Dane in the Iron Hills, for he has many people well and dwells nearest to this place. Bid him hasten. I will not say if this counsel be good or bad, croaked Ros, but I will do what can be done. Then off he slowly flew. Back to the mountain, cried Thorin. We have little time to lose. As you have heard some of the events already, you will see that the dwarves still had some days before they explored the carvings once more and found, as they expected, that only the front gate remained open. All the other gates except, of course, the small secret door had long ago been broken and blocked by smog, and no sign of them remained. So now they began to labor hard in fortifying the main entrance and in remaking the road that led from it. Tools were to be found in plenty that the miners and quarriers and builders of old had used, and at such work the dwarves were still very skilled. As they worked the ravens brought them constant tidings. In this way they learned that the elven king had turned aside to the lake, and they still had a breathing space. Better still, they heard that three of their ponies had escaped and were wandering wild far down the banks of the running river not far from where the rest of their stores had been left. So while the others went on with their work, Feely and Keely were sent, guided by a raven, to find the ponies and bring back all they could. They were four days gone, and by that time they knew that the joined armies of the lake men and the elves were hurrying toward the mountain. But now their hopes were higher, for they had food for some weeks with care, and already the gate was blocked with a wall of squared stones laid dry, but very hick and high, across the opening. There were holes in the wall through which they could see, would shoot, but no entrance. 
They climbed in or out with ladders and hauled stuff up with rope. For the issuing of the stream they had contrived a small low arch under the new wall, but near the entrance they had so altered the narrow bed that a wide pool stretched from the mountain wall to the head of the fall over which the stream went towards Dale. The approach to the gate was now only possible without swimming along a narrow ledge of the cliff to the right as one looked outwards from the wall. There came a night when suddenly there were many lights as of fires and torches away south in Dale. They have come, called Balin, and their camp is very great. They must have come into the valley under the cover of dusk along both banks of the river. The rocks echoed then with voices and with song, as they had not done for many a day. There was the sound, too, of elven harps and of sweet music, and as it echoed up towards them, it seemed that the chill of the air was warmed, and they caught faintly the fragrance of woodland flowers blossoming in spring. Then Bilbo longed to escape from the dark fortress and to go down and join in the mirth and feasting by the fires. Some of the younger dwarves were moved in their hearts, too, and they muttered that they wished things had fallen out otherwise and that they might welcome such folk as friends. But Thorin scowled. Then the dwarves themselves brought forth harps and instruments regained from the horde and made music to soften his mood. But their song was not as elvish song and was much like the song they had sung long before in Bilbo's little hobbit hole. Under the mountain dark and tall, the king has come unto his hall. His foe is dead, the worm of dread, and ever so his foes shall fall. The sword is sharp, the spear is long, the arrow swift, the gate is strong, the heart is bold that looks on gold. The dwarves no more shall suffer wrong. The next morning early a company of spearmen was seen crossing the river and marching up the valley. They bore with them the green banner of the elven king and the blue banner of the lake, and they advanced until they stood right before the wall at the gate. Who are you that come armed for war to the gates of Thorin, son of Thrain, king under the mountain? A tall man stood forward, dark of hair and grim of face, and he cried, Hail Thorin, why do you fence yourself like a robber in his hold? We are not yet foes, and we rejoice that you are alive beyond our hope. We came expecting to find none living here, yet now that we are met, there is a matter for a parley and a council. Who are you, and what would you parley? I am Bard, and by my hand was the dragon slain and your treasure delivered. Is that not a matter that concerns you? Moreover, I am by right descent the heir of Gurion of Dale, and in your hoard is mingled much of the wealth of his halls and town, which of old Smog stole. Is that not a matter of which we may speak? Further, in his last battle Smog destroyed the dwellings of the men of Esgaroth, and I am yet the servant of their master. I would speak for him, and ask whether you have no thought for the sorrow and misery of his people. They aided you in your distress? and in recompense you have thus far brought ruin only, though doubtless undesigned. Now these were fair words and true, if proudly and grimly spoken, and Bilbo thought that Thorin would at once admit what justice was in them, but he did not reckon with the power that gold has over dwarfish hearts. You put your worst cause last, and in the chief place, Thorin answered, to the treasure of my people no man has a claim because Smog, who stole it from us, also robbed us of life or home. The treasure was not his, that his evil deeds should be amended with a share of it. The price of the goods and the assistance that we received of the lake men we will fairly pay in due time. But nothing will we give, not even a loaf's worth, under threat of force. Be gone now where our arrows fly, and if you would speak with me again, First dismiss the elvish host to the woods where it belongs, and then return, laying down your arms before you approach the threshold. The elven king is my friend, and he has succored the people of the lake in their need, though they had no claim but friendship on him, answered Bard. We will give you time to repent your words. Gather your wisdom when we return. Then he departed and went back to the cam. Her many hours were past, the banner-bearers returned and trumpeters stood forth and blew up.
In the name of Esgaroth and the forest, one cried, we speak unto Thorin Thrain's son Oakenshield, calling himself the king under the mountain, and we bid him consider, well the claims that have been urged, or be declared our foe. At the least he shall deliver one twelfth portion of the treasure unto Bard, as the dragon slayer, and as the heir of Geryon. From that portion Bard will himself contribute to the aid of Eskaroth. But if Thorin would have the friendship and honor of the lands about, as his sires had of old, then he will give somewhat of his own for the comfort of the men of the lake. Then Thorin seized a bow of horn and shot an arrow at the speaker. It smote into a shield and stuck there quivering. Since such is your answer, he called in return, I declare the mountain besieged. You shall not depart from it until you call on your side for a truce and a parley. We will bear no weapons against you, but we leave you to your gold. You may eat that, if you will. Chapter 15 A Thief in the Night Now the days passed slowly and wearily. Many of the dwarves spent their time piling and ordering the treasure, and now Thorin spoke of the Arkenstone of Thrain, and bade them eagerly to look for it in every corner. For the Arkenstone of my father, he said, is worth more than a river of gold in itself, and to me it is beyond price. That stone of all the treasure I name unto myself, and I will be avenged on anyone who finds it and withholds it. Bilbo heard these words, and he grew afraid, wondering what would happen if the stone was found. Wrapped in an old bundle of tattered oddments that he used as a pillow, all the same he did not speak of it, for as the weariness of the days grew heavier, the beginnings of a plan had come into his little head. Things had gone on like this for some time, when the ravens brought news that Dane and more than five hundred dwarves, hurrying from the Iron Hills, were now within about two days' march of Dalit, coming from the northeast. But they cannot reach the mountain unmarked, said Rose, and I fear there be battle in the valley. I do not call this council good. Though they are a grim folk, they are not likely to overcome the host that besets you, and even if they did so, what will you gain? Winter and snow is hastening behind them. How shall you be fed without the friendship and goodwill of the lands about you? The treasure is likely to be your death, though the dragon is no more. But Thorin was not moved. Winter and snow will bite both men and elves, he said, and they may find their dwelling in the waste grievous to bear. With my friends behind them and winter upon them, they will perhaps be in softer mood to parley with. That night Bilbo made up his mind. The sky was black and moonless. As soon as it was full dark, he went to a corner of an inner chamber just within the gate and drew from his bundle a rope and also the arkenstone wrapped in a rope. Then he climbed to the top of the wall. Only Bomber was there, for it was his turn to watch, and the dwarves kept only one watchman at a time. It is mighty cold, said Bomber. I wish we could have a fire up here as they have in the camp. It is warm enough inside, said Bilbo. I dare say, but I am bound here till midnight, grumbled the fat dwarf. A sorry business altogether. Not that I venture to disagree with Thorin. May his beard grow ever longer, yet he was ever a dwarf with a stiff neck. Not as stiff as my legs, said Bilbo. I am tired of stairs and stone passages. I would give a good deal for the feel of grass at my toes. I would give a good deal for the feel of a strong drink in my throat, and for a soft bed after a good supper. I can't give you those while the siege is going on, but it is long since I watched, and I will take your turn for you if you like. There is no sleep in me tonight. You are a good fellow, Mr. Baggins, and I will take your offer kindly. If there should be anything to note, rouse me first, mind you. I will lie in the inner chamber to the left, not far away. Off you go, said Bilbo. I will wake you at midnight, and you can wake the next watchman. As soon as Bomber had gone, Bilbo put on his ring, fastened his rope, slipped down over the wall, and was gone. He had about five hours before him. Bomber would sleep he could sleep at any time, and ever since the adventure in the forest he was always trying to recapture the beautiful dreams he had then, and all the others were busy with Thorin. It was unlikely that any even Feely or Keely 
would come out on the wall until it was their turn. Some two hours after his escape from the gate, Bilbo was sitting beside a warm fire in front of a large tent, and there sat two, gazing curiously at him, both the Elven King and Bard. A hobbit in elvish armor, partly wrapped in an old blanket, was something new to them. Really, you know, Bilbo was saying in his best business manner, things are impossible. Personally, I am tired of the whole affair. I wish I was back in the West in my own home, where folk are more reasonable, but I have an interest in this matter, one fourteenth share, to be precise, according to a letter, which fortunately I believe I have kept. He drew from a pocket in his old jacket which he still wore over his mail, crumpled and much folded, Thorin's letter that had been under the clock on his mantelpiece in May. A share in the profits, mind you, he went on, I am aware of that. Personally, I am only too ready to consider all your claims carefully, and deduct what is right from the total before putting in pay own claim. However, you don't know Thorin Oakenshield as well as I do now. I assure you, he's quite ready to sit on a heap of gold and starve, as long as you sit here. Well, let him, said Bard. Such a fool reserves to starve. Quite so, said Bilbo. I see your point of view. At the same time winter is coming on fast. Before long you will be having snow and what not, and supplies will be difficult even for elves, I imagine. Also, there will be other difficulties. You have not heard of Dane and the dwarves of the Iron Hills. We have, a long time ago. But what has he got to do with us? asked the king. I thought as much. I see I have some information you have not got. Dane, I may tell you, is now less than two days' march off and has at least five hundred grim dwarves with him. When they arrive, there may be serious trouble. Why do you tell us this? Are you betraying your friends? Or are you threatening us? Asked Bard grimly. My dear Bard, squeaked Bilbo, don't be so hasty. I never met such suspicious folk. I am merely trying to avoid trouble for all concerned. Now I will make you an offer. Let us hear it, they said. You may see it, said he. It is this. And he drew forth the Arkenstone and threw away the wrapping. The elven king himself, whose eyes were used to things of wonder and beauty, stood up in amazement. Even Bard gazed marveling at it in silence. It was as if a globe had been filled with moonlight and hung before them in a net woven of the glint of frosty stars. This is the Arkenstone of Thrain, said Bilbo, the heart of the mountain and it is also the heart of Thorin. He values it above a river of gold. I give it to you. It will aid you in your bargaining. Then Bilbo, not without a shudder, not without a glance of longing, handed the marvelous stone to Bard, and he held it in his hand, as though the elven king looked at Bilbo with a new wonder. Bilbo Baggins he said, you are more worthy to wear the armor of elf princes than many that have looked more comely in it, but I wonder if Thorin Oakenshield will see it so. I have more knowledge of dwarves in general than you have, perhaps. I advise you to remain with us, and here you shall be honored and thrice welcome. Thank you very much, I am sure, said Bilbo with a bow, but I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this. After all we have gone through together, and I promise to wake old Bomber at midnight, too. Really, I must be going, and quickly. Nothing they could say would stop him. So an escort was provided for him, and as he went both the king and bard saluted him with honor. As they passed through the camp, an old man, wrapped in a dark cloak, rose from a tent door where he was sitting and came towards them. Well done, Mr. Baggins, he said, clapping Bilbo on the back. There is always more about you than anyone expects. It was Gandalf. For the first time for many a day Bilbo was really delighted, but there was no time for all the questions that he immediately wished to ask. All in good time, said Gandalf. Things are drawing towards the end now, unless I am mistaken. There is an unpleasant time just in front of you, but keep your heart up. You may come through all right. There is news brewing that even the ravens have not heard. Puzzled but cheered, Bilbo hurried on. He was guided to a safe ford, 
and then he said farewell to the elves and climbed carefully back towards the gate. Great weariness began to come over him, but it was well before midnight when he clambered up the rope again. It was still where he had left it. He untied it and hid it, and then he sat down on the wall and wondered anxiously what would happen next. At midnight he woke up Bomber, and then in turn rolled himself up in his corner, without listening to the old dwarf's thanks, which he felt he had hardly earned. He was soon fast asleep, forgetting all his worries till the morning. As a matter of fact, he was dreaming of eggs and bacon. Chapter 16 The Clouds Burst Next day the banners of the forest and of the lake were seen to be borne forth again. A company of twenty was approaching. At the beginning of the narrow way they laid aside sword and spear, and came on towards the gate, wondering. The dwarves saw that among them were both Bard and Avenking, before whom an old man wrapped in cloak, and hood bore a strong casket of iron-bound wood. Hail Thorin, said Bard, are you still of the same mind? My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns, answered Thorin. Did you come to ask me idle questions? Still the elf host has not departed as I bade, till then you come in vain to bargain with me. Is there, then, nothing for which you would yield any of your gold? Nothing that you or your friends have to offer? What of the Arkenstone of Thrain? said he, and at the same moment the old man opened the casket and held aloft the jewel. The light leapt from his hand, bright and white in the morning. Then Thorin was stricken dumb with amazement and confusion. No one spoke for a long while Thorin at length broke the silence and his voice was thick with wrath. That stone was my father's, and is mine, he said. Why should I purchase my own? But wonder overcame him, and he added, But how came you by the heirloom of my house, if there is need to ask such a question of thieves? We are not thieves, Bard answered. Your own we will give back in return for our own. How came you by it? shouted Thorin in gathering rage. I gave it them, squeaked Bilbo, who was peeping over the wall, by now in a dreadful fright. You, you, cried Thorin, turning upon him and grasping him with both hands. You miserable hobbit, you undersized burglar, he shouted, a loss for words, and he shook poor Bilbo like a rabbit. By the beard of Durin, I wish I had Gandalf here. Curse him for his choice of you. May his beard wither. As for you, I will throw you to the rocks, he cried and lifted Bilbo in his arms. Stay, your wish is granted, said a voice. The old man with the casket threw aside his hood and cloak. Here is Gandalf, and none too soon, it seems. If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. Put him down, and listen first to what he has to say. You seem in league, said Thorin, dropping Bilbo on the top of the wall. Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends. What have you to say, you descendant of rats? Dear me, dear me, said Bilbo, I am sure this is all very uncomfortable. You may remember saying that I might choose my own fourteenth share. Perhaps I took it too literally. I have been told that dwarves are sometimes politer in word than in deed. The time was all the same, when you seemed to think that I had been of some service. Descendant of rats, indeed. Is this all the service of you and your family that I was promised? Thorin, take it that I have disposed of my share as I wished, and let it go at that. I will, said Thorin grimly, and I will let you go at that, and may we never meet again. Then he turned and spoke over the wall. I am betrayed, he said. It was rightly guessed that I could not forbear to redeem the Arkenstone, the tr for it I will give one fourteenth share of the hoard in silver and gold, setting aside the gems. But that shall be accounted the promised share of this traitor, and with that reward he shall depart, and you can divide it as you will. He will get little enough, I doubt not. Take him, if you wish him to live. You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain, said Ganda, but things they may indeed, said Thorin, and already so strong was the bewilderment of the treasure upon him. 
he was pondering whether by the help of Dane he might not recapture the Arkenstone and withhold the share of the reward. And so Bilbo was swung down from the wall and departed with nothing for all his trouble except the armor which Thorin had given him already. More than one of the dwarves in their hearts felt shame and pity at his going. Farewell, he cried to them. We may meet again as friends. That day passed and the night. The next day the wind shifted west, and the air was dark and gloomy. The morning was still early when a cry was heard in the camp. Runners came in to report that a host of dwarves had appeared round the eastern spur of the mountain and was now hastening to Dale. Dane had come. He had hurried on through the night, and so had come upon them sooner than they had expected. Trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long the dwarves could be seen coming up the valley at a great pace. They halted between the river and the eastern spur, but a few held on their way and crossing the river drew near the camp, and there they laid down their weapons and held up their hands in sign of peace. Bard went out to meet them, and with him went Bilbo. We are sent from Dane son of Nain, they said when questioned. We are hastening to our kinsmen in the mountain since we learn that the kingdom of old is renewed. But who are you that sit in the plain as foes before defended walls? This, of course, in the polite and rather old-fashioned language of such occasions, meant simply, You have no business here. We are going on. So make way, or we shall fight you. They meant to push on between the mountain and the loop of the river, for the narrow land there did not seem to be strongly guarded. Bard, of course, refused to allow the dwarves to go straight on to the mountain. He was determined to wait until the gold and silver had been brought out in exchange for the Arkenstone, for he did not believe that this would be done if once the fortress was manned with so large and warlike a company. This was, in fact, precisely their plan for raven messengers had been busy between Thurin and Dane, but for the moment the way was barred. So after angry words, the dwarf messengers retired muttering in their beards. Bard then sent messengers at once to the gate, but they found no gold or payment. Arrows came forth as soon as they were within shot, and they hastened back in dismay. In the camp all was now austere, as if for battle, for the dwarves of Dane were advancing along the eastern bank. Fools, laughed Bard, to come thus beneath the mountain's arm. They do not understand war above ground, whatever they may know of battle in the mines. There are many of our archers and spearmen now hidden in the rocks upon their right flank. Dwarf mail may be good, but they will soon be hard put to it. Let us set on them now from both sides, before they are fully rested. But the elven king see, long will I tarry, ere I begin this war for gold. The dwarves cannot pass us unless we will, or do anything that we cannot mark. Let us hope still for something that will bring reconciliation. Our advantage in numbers will be enough if in the end it must come to unhappy blows. But he reckoned without the dwarves. The knowledge that the Arkenstone was in the hands of the besiegers burned in their thoughts. Also they guessed the hesitation of Bard and his friends, and resolved to strike while they debated. Suddenly, without a signal, they sprang silently for, ward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. Still more suddenly a darkness came on with dreadful swiftness. A black cloud hurried over the sky. Winter thunder on a wild wind rolled roaring up and rumbled. In the mountain and lightning lit its peak, and beneath the thunder another blackness could be seen whirling forward. But it did not come with the wind, it came from the north, like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. Halt, cried Gandalf, who appeared suddenly and stood alone, with arms uplifted, between the advancing dwarves and the ranks awaiting them. Halt, he called in a voice like thunder, and his staff blazed forth with a flash like the lightning. Dread has cops upon you all? Alas! It has come more swiftly than I guessed. The goblins are upon you. Behold, the bats are above their army like a sea of locusts. They ride upon wolves and wargs are in their train. Amazement and confusion fell upon them all. 
Even as Gandalf had been speaking, the darkness grew. The dwarves halted and gazed at the sky. The elves cried out with many voices. Come, called Gandalf. There is yet time for counsel. Let Dane, son of Nain, come swiftly to us. So began a battle that none had expected, and it was called the Battle of Five Armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and the wild wolves, and upon the other were elves and men and dwarves. This is how it fell out. Ever since the fall of the great goblin of the Misty Mountains, the hatred of their race for the dwarves had been rekindled to fury. Messengers had passed to and fro between all their cities, colonies, and strongholds, for they resolved now to win the dominion of the north. Tidings they had gathered in secret ways, and in all the mountains there was a forging and an arming. Then they marched and gathered by hill and valley going ever by tunnel or under dark, until they came at last on a sudden from the north hard on the hills of Dane. Not even the ravens knew of their coming until they came out in the broken lands which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How much Gandalf knew cannot be said, but it is plain that he had not expected this sudden assault. This is the plan that he made in council with the elven, king, and with Bard, and with Dane, for the dwarf lord now joined them. The goblins were the foes of all, and at their coming all other quarrels were forgotten. Their only hope was to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain, and themselves to man the great spurs that struck south and east. Yet this would be perilous, if the goblins were in sufficient numbers to overrun the mountain itself, and so attack them also from behind and above. But there was no time to make any other plan, or to summon any help. Soon the thunder passed, rolling away to the southeast. But the bad cloud came, flying lower, over the shoulder of the mountain, and whirled above them, shutting out the light and filling them with dread. To the mountain, called Bard. To the mountain, let us take our places while there is yet time. On the southern spur, in its lower slopes, and in the rocks at its feet, the elves were set. On the eastern spur were men and dwarves, but Bard and some of the nimblest of men and elves climbed to the height of the eastern shoulder to gain a view to the north. Soon they could see the lands before the mountains feet black with a hurrying multitude, or long the vanguard swirled round the spur's end and came rushing into dale. These were the swiftest wolf riders, and already their cries and howls rent the air afar. A few brave men were strung before them to make a feint of resistance, and many there fell before the rest drew back and fled to either side. As Gandalf had hoped, the goblin army had gathered behind the resisted vanguard, and poured now in rage into the valley, driving wildly up between the arms of the mountain, seeking for the foe. Their banners were countless, black and red, and they came on like a tide in fury and disorder. It was a terrible battle. The elves were the first to charge. Their hatred for the goblins is cold and bitter. Their spears and swords shone in the gloom with a gleam of chill flame. So deadly was the wrath of the hands that held. As soon as the host of their enemies was dense in the valley, they sent against it a shower of arrows, and each flickered as it fled as if with stinging fire. Behind the arrows a thousand of their spearmen leapt down and charged. The yells were deafening. The rocks were stained black with goblin blood. Just as the goblins were recovering from the onslaught and the elf charge was halted, there rose from across the valley a deep-throated roar, with cries of Moria. And Dane, the dwarves of the Iron Hills, plunged in, wielding their mattocks upon the other side, and beside them came the men of the lake with long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and even as they turned to meet this new attack, the elves charged again with renewed numbers. Already many of the goblins were flying back down the river to escape from the trap, and many of their own wolves were turning upon them and rending the dead and the wounded. Victory seemed at hand when a cry rang out on the heights above. Goblins had scaled the mountain from the other side, and already many were on the slopes above the gate and others were streaming down recklessly, heedless of those that fell screaming from cliff and precipice 
to attack the spurs from above. Each of these could be reached by paths that ran down from the main mass of the mountain in the center, and the defenders had too few to bar the way for long. Victory now vanished from hope. They had only stemmed the first onslaught of the black tide. Day drew on. The goblins gathered again in the valley. Soon actual darkness was coming into a stormy sky, while still the great bats swirled about the heads and ears of elves and men, or fastened vampire-like on the strict. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back, and the elf lords were at bay about their king upon the southern arm, near to the watch post on Raven Hill. Suddenly there was a great shout, and from the gate came a trumpet call. They had forgotten Thorin. Part of the wall, moved by levers, fell outward with a crash into the pool, out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. Hood and cloak were gone. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Rocks were hurled down from on, high by the goblins above. But they held on, leapt down to the false foot, and rushed forward to battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorine wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. To me, to me, elves and men, to me, O oh my kinsfolk he cried, and his voice shook like a horn in the valley. Down, heedless of order, rushed all the dwarves of Dane to his help. Down, too, came many of the lake men, for Bard could not restrain them, and out upon the other side came many of the spearmen of the elves. Once again the goblins were stricken in the valley, and they were piled in heaps till Dale was dark and hideous with their corpses. But Thorin's numbers were too few, his flanks were unguarded, Soon the attackers were attacked, and they were forced into a great ring, facing every way, hemmed all about with goblins and wolves returning to the assault. Their friends could not help them, for the assault from the mountain was renewed with redoubled force, and upon either side men and elves were being slowly beaten down. On all this Bilbo looked with misery. He had taken his stand on Ravenhill among the elves, partly because there was more chance of escape from that point and partly the more tookish part of his mind, because if he was going to be in a last desperate stand, he preferred on the whole to defend the Elvenking. Gandalf, too, I may say, was there, sitting on the ground as if in deep thought, preparing, I suppose, some last blast of magic before... That did not seem far off. It will not be long now, thought Bilbo, before the goblins win the gate, and we are all slaughtered or driven down and captured. Misery me! I have heard songs of many battles, and I have always understood that defeat may be glorious. It seems very uncomfortable, not to say distressing. I wish I was well out of it. The clouds were torn by the wind, and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom Bilbo looked round, he gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his heart leap, dark shapes small yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles, he shouted. The eagles are coming. Bilbo's eyes were seldom wrong. The eagles were coming down the wind, line after line, in such a host as must have gathered from all the areas of the north. The eagles, cried Bilbo once more, but at that moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on his helm, and he fell with a crash and knew Chapter 17 The Return Journey when Bilbo came to himself, he was literally by himself. He was lying on the flat stones of Ravenhill, and no one was near. A cloudless day, but cold, was broad above him. He was shaking, and as chilled as stone, but his head burned with fire. Now I wonder what has happened, he said to himself. At any rate, I am not yet one of the fallen heroes, but I suppose there is still time enough for that. He sat up painfully. Looking into the valley, he could see no living goblins. After a while, as his head cleared a little, he thought he could see elves moving in the rocks below. He rubbed his eyes. Surely there was a camp still in the plain, some distance off, and there was a coming and going about the gate. Dwarves seemed to be busy removing the wall, but all was deadly still. There was no call, 
and no echo of a song. Sorrow seemed to be in the air. Victory after all, I suppose, he said, feeling his aching head. When suddenly he was aware of a man climbing up and coming towards him. Hello there, he called with a shaky voice. Hello there, what news? It is well that I have found you, said the man striding forward. You are needed, and we have looked for you long. You would have been numbered among the dead, who are many, if Gandalf the wizard had not said that your voice was last heard in this place. I have been sent to look here for the last time. Are you much hurt? A nasty knock on the head, I think, said Bilbo. But I have a helm and a hard skull. All the same I feel sick and my legs are like straws. I will carry you down to the camp in the valley, said the man, and picked him lightly up. When Gandalf saw Bilbo, he was delighted. Baggins, he exclaimed. Well, I never. Alive after all. I am glad. I began to wonder if even your luck would see you through. A terrible business, and it nearly was disastrous. But other news can wait. Come, he said more gravely. You are called for and leading the hobbit he took him within the tent. Hail, Thorin, he said as he entered. I have brought him. There indeed lay Thorin Oakenshield, wounded with many wounds, and his rent armor and notched axe were cast upon the floor. He looked up as Bilbo came beside him. Farewell, good thief, he said. I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I leave now all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and deeds at the gate. Bilbo knelt on one knee filled with sorrow. Farewell, king under the mountain, he said. This is a bitter adventure, if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I am glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. No, said Thorin. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. Then Bilbo turned away, and he went by himself, and sat alone wrapped in a blanket, and, whether you believe it or not, he wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. He was a kindly little soul. Indeed, it was long before he had the heart to make a joke again. All that had happened after he was stunned, Bilbo learned later. But it gave him more sorrow than joy, and he was now weary of his adventure. He was aching in his bones for the homeward journey. That, however, was a little delayed. So, in the meantime, I will tell something of events. The eagles had long had suspicion of the goblins mustering. From their watchfulness the movements in the mountains could not be altogether hid. So they too had gathered in great numbers, under the great eagle of the misty mountains, and at length smelling battle from afar, they had come speeding down the gale in the nick of time. They it was who dislodged the goblins from the mountain slopes, casting them over precipices, or driving them down shrieking and bewildered among their foes. It was not long before they had freed the lonely mountain, and elves and men on either side of the valley could come, at last to the help of the battle below. But even with the eagles they were still outnumbered. In that last hour Bjorn himself had appeared. No one knew how or from where. He came alone, and in bear's shape, and he seemed to have grown almost to giant size in his wrath. The roar of his voice was like drums and guns, and he tossed wolves and goblins from his path like straw and feathers. He fell upon their rear and broke like a clap of thunder through the ring. The dwarves were making a stand still about their lords upon a low rounded hill. Then Bjorn stooped and lifted Thorin, who had fallen pierced with spears, and bore him out of the fray. Swiftly he returned, and his wrath was redoubled so that nothing could withstand him, and no weapon seemed to bite upon him. Victory had been assured before the fall of night, but the pursuit was still on foot, when Bilbo returned to the camp, and not many were in the valley save the more grievously wounded. Where are the eagles? he asked Gandalf that evening, as he lay wrapped in many warm blankets. 
Some are in the hunt, said the wizard, but most have gone to their eyries. They would not stay here, and departed with the first light of morning. Dane has crowned their chief with gold, and sworn friendship with them forever. I am sorry. I mean, I should have liked to see them again, said Bilbo sleepily. Perhaps I shall see them on the way home. I suppose I shall be going home soon. As soon as you like, said the wizard. Actually, it was some days before Bilbo really set out. They buried Thorn deep beneath the mountain, and Bard laid the Arkenstone upon his breast. There let it lie till the mountain falls, he said. May it bring good fortune to all his folk that dwell after. There now Dane son of Nain took up his abode, and he became king under the mountain, and in time many other dwarves gathered to his throne in the ancient halls. Of the twelve companions of Thorin, ten remained. Feely and Keely had fallen defending him with shield and body, for he was their mother's elder brother. The others remained with Dane, for Dane dealt his treasure well. There was, of course, no longer any question of dividing the hoard in such shares as had been planned, yet a fourteenth share of all of the silver and gold, wrought and unwrought, was given up to Bard, for Dane said, We will honor the agreement of the dead, and he has now the Arkenstone in his keeping. Even a fourteenth share was wealth exceedingly great, greater than that of mortal kings. From that treasure bard sent much gold to the master of Lake Town, and he rewarded his followers and friends freely. To the elven key he the emeralds of Geryon, such jewels as he most loved, which Dane had restored to him. To Bilbo, he says, Seizure is as much yours as it is mine, though old agreements cannot stand, since so many have a claim in its winning and defense. Yet even though you were willing to lay aside your claim, I should wish that the words of Thorin, of which he repented, should not prove true, that we should give you little. I would reward you most richly of all. Very kind of you, said Bilbo, but really it is a relief to me. How on earth should I have got all that treasure home without war and murder all along the way, I don't know, and I don't know what I should have done with it when I got home. I am sure it is better in your hands. In the end he would only take two small chests, one filled with silver and the other with gold, such as one strong pony could carry. That will be quite as much as I can manage, said he. At last the time came for him to say goodbye to his friends. Farewell, Balin, he said, and farewell, Dwalin, and farewell, Dori, Nori, Ori, Ori, Orin, Gloin, Defer, Bofur, and Bomber. May your beards never grow thin. Heroning towards the mountain, he addy. Farewell, well, Thorin, Oakenshield, and Feely and Kili. May your memory never f Then the dwarves bowed low before their gate, but words stuck in their throats. Goodbye and good luck, wherever you fare, said Balin at last. If ever you visit us again, when our halls are made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If ever you are passing my way, said Bilbo, don't wait to knock. Tea is at four, but any of you are welcome at any time. Then he turned away. He had many hardships and adventures before he got back. The wild was still the wild, and there were many other things in it in those days besides goblins. But he was well guided and well guarded. The wizard was with him, and Bjorn for much of the way, and he was never in great danger again. Anyway, by midwinter Gandalf and Bilbo had come all the way back, along both edges of the forest, to the doors of Bjorn's house, and there for a while they both stayed. It was spring, and a fair one with mild weathers and a bright sun, before Bilbo and Gandalf took their leave at last of Bjorn, and though he longed for home, Bilbo left with regret for the flowers of the gardens of Bjorn were in springtime no less marvellous than in high summer. At last they came up the long road, and reached the very pass where the goblins had captured them before. But they came to that high point at morning, and looking backward they saw a white sun shining over the outstretched lands. There behind lay Mirkwood, blue in the distance, and darkly green at the nearer edge, even in the spring. There far away was the lonely mountain on the edge of eyesight, 
On its highest peak snow, yet unmelted, was gleaming pale. So comes snow after fire, and even dragons have their ending, said Bilbo, and he turned his back on his adventure. The Turkish part was getting very tired, and the Baggins was daily getting stronger. I wish now only to be in my own armchair, he said. One autumn evening some years afterwards, Bilbo was sitting in his study writing his memoirs. He thought of calling them there and back again, a hobbit's holiday, when there was a ring at the door. It was Gandalf and a dwarf, and the dwarf was actually Balin. Come in, come in, said Bilbo, and soon they were settled in chairs by the fire. If Balin noticed that Mr. Baggins' waistcoat was more expensive and had real gold buttons, Bilbo also noticed that Balin's beard was several inches longer, and his jeweled belt was of great magnificence. They fell to talking of their times together, of course, and Bilbo asked how things were going in the lands of the mountain. It seemed they were going very well. Bard had rebuilt the town in Dale, and men had gathered to him from the lake and from south and west, and all the valley had become tilled again and rich, and the desolation was now filled with birds and blossoms and spring and fruit and feasting in autumn, and Lake Town was refounded and was more prosperous than ever, and much wealth went up and down the river running, and there was friendship in those parts between elves and dwarves and men. The old master had come to a bad end. Bard had given him much gold for the help of the lake people, but being of the kind that easily catches such disease, he fell under the dragon sickness, and took most of the gold and fled with it, and died of starvation in the waste, deserted by his companions. The new master is of wiser kind, said Balin, and very popular, for of course he gets most of the credit for the present prosperity. They are making songs which say that in his day the rivers run with gold. Then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true, after a fashion, said Bilbo. Of course, said Gandalf, and why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies, because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck? just for your sole benefit. You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I am very fond of you. But you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. Thank goodness, said Bilbo laughing, and handed him the tobacco jar.